Hello everybody and welcome to day number one of the Hearthstone Masters Tour Spring Championship of 2024. My name is TG and joining me to kick off the show is none other. Simon Saddlewald. How you doing, Saddle? I'm doing great. It uh, feels a little bit weird. We've made it all the way to April and I haven't really done any competitive Hearthstone yet this year. So I am champing at the bit to get started. But luckily, we've got a pretty awesome event to kick off with because some of the players that have qualified this time around, I spent most of last year talking about how stacked the field was that we kept getting because of the, you know, the level of dedication and skill that was required to even qualify for these events. And it looks like uh, 2024 is not going to disappoint on that front either. Yeah, I thought players might take a, a little bit of a step back over time. We'd, we'd see, you know, less overall competition at the top. <laughs> Has been the case at all. And uh, taking a look at the program overview, some slight changes to 2024 uh, compared to 2023. Uh, still going to have the Hearthstone World Championship at the end of the year, which will feature a prize pool of $350,000. Uh, and in order to get there, we have two seasonal championships, spring, that's us, right now, here, and then summer, <laughs> uh, which will happen in, you guessed it, the summer. The winner and runner-up of each of these seasonal championships will automatically qualify to, the, to compete at the World Championship. And I missed a bullet there, but one of the other big changes is the seasonal championships will feature 16 uh, competitors, and uh, also that means we have three days of competition, Soto, which means we have a proper Flamingo friday which just warms my my heart i know yeah that's that's the real reason why we switch back to three days right is that all of us casters just kicked up a fuss and said we we refuse to work this event unless there is a properly respected flamingo friday and here we are but conquest is of course the format that we're going to be playing out in i'm sure if you follow competitive hearthstone you know what conquest is by now but if you are just joining us for the first time firstly welcome i'm sure you'll have a great time and secondly conquest just means that you bring four decks your opponent gets to ban one of them you have to win with all of your decks to get out of the series if you win with a deck it's eliminated from the series and you have to win with all of them to win the tie overall it means that bringing a weak deck is devastating and it means a lot of the strategy comes from players trying to pick one deck that they expect lots of opponents to bring and try and target that deck by giving it lots of bad matchups so it can't win and get out the series good old conquest oh uh, yeah and of course uh you will be seeing the new expansion featured uh throughout the uh, lineups uh this weekend which is whiz bangs workshop um which has been uh thematically uh, one of my favorite expansions of all time um you have cards and you have widow baby cards <laughs> widow widow baby versions i was expecting some form of elaboration on like why that was a good thing but no we've just let you were supposed I to do agree though you were supposed to it follow is... up with actual I'm analysis doing that right now okay. god tj i've oh, can we can we wait until may actually i'm sick of tj already um <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I think the, the theme of it is very bright and colourful and fun-packed. I think it's been very impactful based on that. It's had a great chance to have a bit of Hearthstone nostalgia as well, which is kind of baked into the way the expansion works. I do think miniaturize is one of the better keywords that we have had so far. Yeah, that's what I was alluding to. Thank you, Saddle. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to take a look at the, the prize pool there. Uh, $50,000 prize pool. 10000 for first place, 8000 for second. And with that prize money comes also... Uh, that qualification to the world championship so that's what uh these players are playing for um throughout the weekend uh and uh speaking of the weekend Saddle, i mentioned we have three days of competition ahead of us so let's go ahead and take a look at our schedule uh today is friday april 12th also known as day one also known as flamingo friday tomorrow <laughs> is saturday april 13th which uh, aka day two throughout the next two days we are going to be playing uh, four dual elimination groups of four. So if you uh, remember back to, <laughs> what's the last time we ran this? Was it 2022? The last time we ran this type of form for seasonal championships? Um, that's what we've uh, kind of always done. Each group of these double elimination groups will spit out two players, which will then compete on Sunday in that top eight single elimination bracket. So we got a, we got a weekend full of Hearthstone. And like you said, Saul, it's been quite a while since we've had that, so... Looking forward to it. 
Yeah, and I think that's huge, right? Because not only, well, there's only two of these events that we're doing this year instead of three, so it's great to just have more Hearthstone packed into the individual events, kind of averages out in terms of the uh, the amount of days that we're doing with these Masters tours. But now, as we start to look at some beautiful faces, it's about these players, really, because last year there was a bit of a feeling where you put in this enormous grind and um, achieved this incredible achievement to make it to this point in the first place, and sometimes you just really did not get featured on stream very heavily, if not at all because the, the broadcast hours were so limited. So by squeezing in a third day this time around, it means that the people who have put in the effort to get to this point in the first place are going to have their moment in the sun um, more often than not. And looking at some of these names, you know, WeQ and Gyu, who put in a shift last year and really made a name for themselves, and you've got Yala, Rekvam, Gamer RBG, and that is only in the first two groups. You've also got names like Fury Hunter, Habu Gabu, Bunny Hopper to come later on as well. So I'm very, very pleased that we have got the hours required to uh, show as many many of these matches as possible and absolutely do not forget kimchi slap oh yeah in in, in group b uh who's who's going to come out swinging um group a uh just a, a caveat here the initial matches um have already been playing out across these groups um so we're going to be jumping into these groups mid mid midway mid progress mid progress seems a little bit too um redundant um, because progress assumes that you're in the, the middle of something. Um, whatever. Moving on. Wiku and Piatnitsa are the two players moving to the winner's match, whereas Yarla and Gyu uh, are going to be facing off in this elimination match for Group A. And I believe that's the uh, group we're going to be covering uh, first here on the broadcast model that we're going to be jumping into. Yes, indeed. As I mentioned, WeQ had a really, really strong showing uh, last year, which was uh, kind of a breakout for, for him. Um, a player that garnered a lot of respect with uh, just the, the grind, the consistent ladder finishes, and then also the showing when it came to the, the World Championship as well. Um, whereas Piatnica, someone that I certainly know a little bit less about, uh, not really a, uh, a a name that I've seen have particularly strong uh, competitive performances in the past. So two players who are representing the new breed, right? And we, we mentioned just as we were watching those initial results come in um, that uh, he's already defeated Yala in the opening round, right? Which is chalk on up for the new gen coming into this, which uh, I'm looking forward to seeing if uh, Yala can now scrap back from the lower bracket in the bottom of the group. Yeah, that seems to be Yarla's M.O. is uh, uh, scrapping back. Um, Wiku, it was a player that was uh, very interesting to me last year because Wiku didn't really... Um, <sighs> there was a lot of winning, but the winning always stopped abruptly in in every single event that Wiku participated in uh, in in 2023. Um, I'm <laughs> I, I hope I'm thinking of Wiku. Wiku was a player that always made it to to the top eight and then just felt like lost immediately. Wiki was one of the many victims of CJ Kaka shenanigans at the world championship. Um, those like what four close nail biter series uh, that, that went all the way that CJ Kaka just barely eked out of Wiki uh, was on that checklist um, for CJ Kaka. So uh, definitely a player that I want to uh, look out for um, and that's who we're going to get to see featured in this first first matchup favorite card. Guff stuff. Right off the bat. Oh, it's been it's been so long. I told you it was a nostalgia run. This is the thing, right? With so many like nostalgia cards and miniaturized, we also get to do like nostalgia casting calls of all the dumb stuff that we've spent the last eight years of our lives talking about, TJ. Mm -hmm. Yep. <clears throat> exactly. I mean, that's that's basically why I cast now is to <laughs> to talk about the good old days to bring back the memes of old um, is uh, my favorite part about casting Hearthstone because we have a storied history. Ah, here we go. Now, now we're looking at some 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 beefier cards here. Favorite deck, Face Shaman. Which one? <laughs> There's been quite a few throughout Hearthstone's history. There has been a few. I think the one that most people tend to have the most fondness for is like the Wind Fury, Rock Biter, Firebat, Turn 2, Lethal kind of deal. That that Phase Shaman. But mm -hmm. it, it could be a few different decks, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we... One thing I wanted to point out is we have um, quite a few differences uh, uh, moving in the lineups. Um, the 
shaman versus priest uh, in the shaman and Piet, or Wiku's lineup, and then priest and Pietnitz's lineup. Um, we have the uh, the warriors, which <laughs> I mean, they both play Reno. Hey. <laughs> what is it? What's that about? Because I know how much you love when you just jam a Reno into like a deck that's all two ofs. No, I'm actually I'm actually fine with that. I so th ah. this is a very specific problem. Like, there's actually very few decks in this tournament which do the thing that I don't think is smart with Reno. Like, I think having Reno in a deck where you draw your deck consistently and you just have it there as an end of game board clear for when you need it is fine. I know like philosophically some people don't like that because it's supposed to be a Highlander card and you're kind of bypassing that. The the build of Reno that I don't like, you can be pure Highlander or you can be like all two of turbo cycle and then have a Reno in there. The builds that I don't like are like, okay, I have eight two ofs, but my deck is still really inconsistent because I only have eight two ofs, so I don't draw my deck very consistently. And then I also have a Reno. Those decks are the ones that I think generally don't work. Just just commit. Just commit one way or the other. It's absolutely fine. Yeah. None of this Raven sitting on the fence business, TJ. That's, that's, <laughs> okay. We don't want any of that. And and unlike some Highlander cards that have been printed in the past, you you can play Reno uh, without. Yeah, yeah, no, of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. With uh, without waiting for no duplicates in your, in your deck, if you have no other play and you think it's correct, you know it's still a uh, uh, it changes your hero power, gain a slight bit of armor. You just don't get the the, the board reduction and the um and the board clear. So. I don't know if we'll be seeing much of that. I can't even think off the top of my head if I've ever even done that, but it's possible. It's not like uh, Dino Tamer Brand, where it's just a seven mana two four. <laughs> if you uh, if you don't have uh, uh, the requirement, the Highlander. Requirement. Sometimes, sometimes you just really want that face onto Hero Power, and you'll pay eight mana to set it up. You know, like that's that's a real thing. It happens rarely, but it happens. Yeah. Well, maybe you you you've identified that. You need a very specific spell to win the game, and there's no way to yeah, do yeah. it. Yeah. And you need it within three turns, and you have to play Reno, and you got to get the right hero power. Yada yada, whatever. Um, but Pianitza is playing the true, the glorious Highlander Warrior. Um, what do you prefer out of those two? Um, nope. I still like the I I think I like the Turbo Cycle more. It's just more of a subtle deck, right? To play, mm -hmm. you know, thirty cheap cards in your deck and just power through it really quickly and get to the end of your deck. It's just the kind of thing that I enjoy doing. Um, I don't know how I feel about it in the format so much with some of the concessions that have had to be made since the Aftershocks nerf. Um, so I, I, it's it pains me to fall on the side of a of a outright Highlander deck, but I do think the actual Highlander Warrior does have a spot in this tournament, although not necessarily uh, with the way all the lineups have gone. Because I think if you're facing, say, Custom Warlocks, for example, you really want to be doing like two copies of Bladestorm and two copies of Gift, so you can get brawls and all that kind of thing, right? You want to have yeah. consistent removal for the Giants and the Five Fives that are coming down, and there is an awful lot of that style of Warlock in this tournament. But hey, we don't have to talk about hypotheticals anymore, TJ. We've got an actual honest-to-God game of Hearthstone happening in front of us. That's right. We have the uh, Death Knight, the Rainbow Death Knight versus... We call we call this jive some jive shaman uh, from from WeQ with the the jazz bases and the the jive insect. Yeah, a few different builds of this shaman knocking around in the tournament. We have seen um, there was a version of this deck early on which kind of had critical mass of consistency and the amount of burn that you can get, which really didn't need any fat in it at all. All the fat was trimmed and you just played spell damage minions and killed people on turn six with immense consistency. Uh, that was toned down a little bit, so now people have had to scramble for ways to gain extra consistency where they've lost it from Lightning Bolt being in Gift uh, specifically or primarily. So there's a few different builds. One plays more spell damage minions and spirit claws. There's this one which plays drive, uh, Jive Insects. You can get copies of Ragnaros hanging around as well. There's a few different ways to go. Um, but get used to seeing various builds of this shum. I want to jive. The, so in the, the Death Knight, I, I feel like Death Knight's been pretty popular on ladder obviously decent win rate 
Um, but it's it's not as represented, I, I suppose, as I, I maybe would have expected. Demon Hunter it was quite obvious. You feel the same way? The Demon Hunter was an obvious choice for the tournament? No, no, the Death Knight. The Death Knight was, is not as represented as I expected it to be initially coming in. Yeah, I'd say it's around where I expected. Um, okay. Luckily, so obviously I was very adamant that anyone who'd brought Plague Death Knight to World Championships, which was the last major event we did, had made a catastrophic mistake. Um, I do think Death Knight is in a slightly better spot this time, but it's more of the, the rainbow-style builds which are being effective. Um, and I was thought, honestly thought it was going to come down to some people just like Rainbow Death Knight. Some people feel like they have a lot of skill expression and agency with that deck. Um, yeah. It's one of those decks where, like, you know, there's no real outright power outliners except maybe Reska. Um, in terms of, you know, hyper draw, find your combo, that kind of thing. You do get to sink your teeth into a game of Hearthstone when you're playing Rainbow Death Knight. So if you have one of those specialists who's played 500 games of it that wanted to bring it to the tournament, I was expecting that to happen. But I don't necessarily think it's like a, a real power outlier in terms of the, the decks, and particularly the matchups that you'd expect to face in the tournament. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a pretty popular deck. Uh, on ladder, but only it, it's only two players that brought it, I believe, out of the sixteen uh, in the field. And especially if you said like high skill expression deck, or maybe the facade of a high skill expression deck, uh, at the very least, uh, usually uh, pretty popular uh, tournament decks, um, and a lot of decisions uh, already to be made here, just on turn forty. Frogs incredibly annoying uh, to kick things off. And Weeku's moving, finds the uh, the Golganesh. Be able to keep going. Has a flash of lightning in hand. Uh, flow Rider choice. Uh, jive. Kind of expensive at this stage for, like, with no Jazz base, like, loaded mm -hmm. up. To try and get it discounted so just goes with the second crash and a ton of damage kind of lying in wait uh for weak you in the hand not a lot of proactivity though yeah and currently no spell damage at all to go with it which is yeah kind of crucial doesn't even have the novice zappers which can obviously add massive amounts of damage and like I was saying, with the older version of the deck, like this hand would be just Cobalt Geomancers and Blood Mage Thanoses and uh, the Shaman Gift and Lightning Bolts. And, you, you know, come this point, you just play Flash on five and then on six, you play every card in your hand and point them all at face. And more often than not, your opponent would be dead. You have to get a little bit more tricky with it these days. Those, those kills on six or seven can certainly happen. And now there is a Novice Zapper. It's starting to look a lot more appealing. pop-up book found as well that will be another zero mana burn spell under the flash goes with the overdraft though assuming that has been counted to be able to fit in next turn yeah it will do comfortably with the lightning reflexes and the lightning bolts taking the crashes down he's going to hold off on the flash as well so i'm imagining uh, Titan to clear next turn is the plan. Um, maybe Titan flash and then go for the kill on seven, depending on what's drawn. Yeah. Overdraft also has the added benefit of just if Wiki realizes that there's no kill potential, can try and find maybe the one card that would get it. I can't imagine there's going to be a card with this hand that's that could be uh, more damage. I guess another spell damage card, like another Zapper, but. Uh, still looking good for Week U, I think, does have the turns planned out, like he said. And so Pianita has to think uh, what's a way for me to put on uh, the most pressure here, maybe expecting Titan going into the next turn. And the Crusher, okay. Going to stay at full health. And I guess shut off Jazz Base <laughs> as well. Is yeah, that yeah, I guess so. But this for me is the matches where um, where Rainbow Death Knight can suffer. 
is matchups where your job is exclusively to build pressure against them, right? You're not a brilliant yeah. deck at doing that in a lot of scenarios. A lot of your early to mid game cards are built around tempo swings. So if your yeah. opponent doesn't give you any tempo to swing against, you're just a little bit ineffective at, at just building straight up pressure with most of the cards in your deck. There's a few draws that can do it. But you can see here, Weak U really has done very little this game and is still chilling at 24 health on turn 7, on uh, on Piednitz's turn 7 with the full clear as well. So this is this is where it can suffer just a bit. Yeah, you have a lot of reactive cards that just don't really fit when you're only trying to be proactive. Yeah. Uh, like the Grime Walker crop rotation combo. Um, there, I, I mean, this deck can put on can put on some damage and have a good amount of tempo. Uh, but a lot of that is when you're facing against like other board-based matchups where you can kind of exactly, go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, yeah. not things that are just, um, I'm going to chill here and just collect resources and then kill you in a single turn. I think it's encapsulated by the card Mining Casualties, right? Because if they play Mining Casualties on one or two, and you're a board-based deck, you kind of lose. You can't beat that. It's too much stuff. But in <laughs> yeah. terms of like pressure, it's nothing, right? You just leave two one ones up on the board, and you do yep. not care about it. Um, and that's just really the kind of deck that this is. <laughs> Look at all those overload cards. <laughs> So still does not pick up more damage. Did find the Jazz base, which would represent more damage, as you said, but that's been switched off by the Freeze. Luckily did have the second Flash to go for the rebuy next turn. I believe that is, what, Conductivity on the far left? Just a little bit cut off on the left-hand side of the hand that we can't see. Yep, yep. It's not enough, but it does have... Couple miracle salesmen, or maybe a yeah, slight bit of extra Flo damage Rider is pretty huge for next turn as well. Yep, and did start off this turn with a flash as well, so it still has a discount loaded up for the following turn as well. So sh should be able to find uh, what he needs to to get this one done. It it looks like a lot, but with only this single novice zapper. You need a lot of juice to get going. And it's not a particularly juiced explosion either. Yeah. Would there be enough mana to flow rider, find jive insect, and conductivity and fit in everything else? No. This jab would be full cost anyway. This won't, once again, won't be able to swing. Well, I guess the snake oils too had a tiny bit. Yeah, a couple of moon fires. Fire them off. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, it's got to go. I mean, at the very least, can clear board with crashes at the end of this. Um, yeah. This is smart, though. Okay, zero damage off the first uh, Lightning Reflexes card, which is bad news for Wiki. Um, but I do like what Pietnitsa did here with the full health minions in play. Obviously, you'd be expecting spell damage to come down here, but one of the weird quirks of playing against the Rag version of this Shaman is that the stuff that you have on your board, if it survives a Crash of Lightning, then they have to have some extra solution of clearing it, right? So to get the Rags to guarantee go face against you. So full yeah. health minions can be kind of effective because they don't always go the spell damage route to kill you. That's kind of the weird twist of the Rag version of the deck. Okay, uses the Altered Chord to get two extra damage out of the Miracle Salesman, which was the best usage out of any of those cards that were offered off the Reflexes. Gets to go face with it and then shoot it himself to get the Snake Oil. But actually misses damage on the second pull oh. as well. Is that enough? Finds Double a Zapper oil? and has committed. I don't know whether he has this counted in advance. I will concede I did not. 
I think if there's a need a rock totem being played, this is not going to be lethal. Yeah. No. Yeah, because the snake oils were just two extra. It's going to be an eight. It's going to be four. It would have been four damage off. Uh, I mean. Overdraft was the next card. Overdraft would have been enough at the end there instead of the Needle Rock Totem. Bummer. <laughs> Wait. Oh, no, but the Overdraft was drawn from the Totem, right? That's yeah, not like yeah. The I'm card saying the week it, you could have had. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. I at least I <clears> don't <throat> think so. Oh, if you had traded one of the snake oils? You can trade a snake oil, yeah. Instead of playing Needle Rock Totem? Actually, maybe that was, because then it would have been uh, six damage needed, and that would have been enough, yeah. So instead of the Needle Rock Totem, if one of the snake oils was traded, and... Uh, yeah, and it was two bolts, two zappers, and two spell damage on the overload, right? So that so, would have so been that, eight, I think? Yeah, well, would have only needed to trade one snake... Yes, yeah, so you still have the other oil. one for two damage on the second snake oil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very yeah, possible. yeah, yeah. But maybe just ran out of time, didn't have time to fully calculate. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, yeah, sure, you can unload six, six damage to phase here, but... Uh, I, I mean, there's a chance for lethal here. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> You can, uh -huh. So you could go lethal, or you could overdraft uh, very low, very low odds for lethal, or you could just overdraft um, one of these and then hope that the the second one hits. Oh, okay, or just clear the board in its entirety. Oh, can you hex attack and then re-equip swing with jazz base, re-equip jazz base? I don't think so. I'm not sure what the discount is uh, on. Well, because the jazz base has been equipped forever. The discount it has, high. yeah, because of the freezing. But yeah. you'd also, yeah, uh, you want to find extra mana to squeeze a third minion in there somewhere as well, right? Or else you're still not getting lethal. Yeah. You need to press the totem. I think it's just too much mana in the end. But Weak I think, sensing that this has not been an optimally played game of Hearthstone, which is uh, not where we would want it to be, I think, kicking off the uh, the broadcast portion at the very least of the World Championship. Reminder that these uh, these players have played an opener oh. before this, Weeku defeating Yala to get to this point. But now under the bright lights, uh, kicking things off with a bit of a struggle game against Piat Nidson. <laughs> but the hand, the hand isn't great for for a bit. needs to have some ways to gain some life here. Um, but uh, other than that, we're not, there's nothing, again, proactive. You can crush her face again. I guess start with a tradable. Um, and then could just go Threads of Despair. Oh, okay, or not. I was thinking Threads of Despair just to make sure the board was completely cleared. But I guess Shuffle. Yeah, I get that. Like, Rag is definitely the it. big fear now, right? Jive Insect is definitely the number one thing that you're scared of because all of the burn damage has been committed at this point, so you're really not going to lose to anything else. Yeah, I... I... I would be afraid of literally leaving anything on the board uh, mm -hmm. at this stage. So, all right, lightning reflexes. Um, especially a spell damage totem. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is maximum frustration, right? Because Wiki's looking at these cards going, yeah, if, if either of those cards had showed up in either pick from the lightning reflexes on the lethal turn, we'd be in game two by now. Then they both just pop up on the turn where it doesn't really matter as much. Yeah. I thought Feral Spirits was interesting there, too. Um, I guess it would have been full cost. That's the issue. Full cost Feral Spirits, and then you have to spend another three mana on the Jazz base to get the next discount. Yeah, it's a little sketch, I think. Yeah. 
Because the Jive Insect itself is free um, yeah, after you re-equip Jazz Base, but it, you basically have to say that it costs three mana because you have to re-equip the Jazz Base because you're just continuously getting frozen. Exactly, yeah. So <clears throat> just dealing a little bit of damage, and that's it. <laughs> a lightning bolt face, towed him up, and turn. <laughs> Awkward game of Hearthstone. It Honestly is extremely for both awkward. players. But I feel like Wiki has very much missed the window now because not only can Pjotnitsa now keep the board clear pretty easily, he can also start to build boards of his own. He doesn't have to allocate mana to clearing anymore. And like I was talking about earlier, every minion that you can put in play is then something that we Q has to allocate mana to clearing out for the, the rag shots as well. So, Yeah, bottom of the deck is um, is looking rough as well for we Q. Uh, I believe there's like one Needle Rock Totem, a Conductivity, Blood Mage Thalnos, maybe a pop-up book. And then the rest is Plagues, right, at this point? The plagues and a, a Snake Oil. Yeah. Well, it's, I think there's only... Okay, well now there's four plagues. Oh no, three three plagues because one, yeah. <clears throat> okay, two plagues. Okay, there was a reflexes. I uh, and this is uh, you can pop up book <laughs> some some rags, but the bomb paw is. Posing an issue here. Yeah, this is what I mean, right? Like, what even is the purpose of making the rag board if there's just going to be eight health minions hanging around on the other side? You have to get those things to go face. Yeah. Another pop up book. Yes, yeah, so you want to save that if you're going to have any chance. To go off with the rag, you probably want to save the pop-up book and use just the lightning storm here to clear instead. Yep. But Pianita is going to be slightly out of range with one more attack and to go up to 25. So three rags by itself with the face frozen. Even if er every uh, hit goes... Well, I guess you could pop up book face. <laughs> yeah, you can pop up book face, and if there's no minions in play, or if every rag shot wins the one in whatever yeah. to go face, then you have a tiny percent chance of winning this game. Yeah, but there, um, oh, I didn't see from the other ones, but at least uh, if the Helios played, there's going to be a, a blood plague in the deck too, which could swing the health even further. And we can, we can only see hands. <laughs> Just hands. <laughs> oh, there's head. <laughs> yeah, think about just Army of the Dead just to uh, present Lintho, because I'm pretty sure Wiki is just completely out of AoE and completely out of Discovers as well. All right. Only one plague, it looks like. Yeah, only one plague drawn, but it was a frost. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, here's the... <laughs> you want to try and calculate the odds here? Oh, okay, improving the odds. Yeah, yeah, the snake oil can come down. <laughs> so you have to hit a one in seven three times in a row. Well, we have seen luckier things happen, but only twice.
I think it's safe to say, TJ, this probably was not how Wii Q was hoping Game 1 of his Broadcast World Championships was going to go. Nope. Plenty of ways to clear, too. There it is. Concede from Wii Q. Game one goes to Piatnica. And uh, well-fought victory. In, you know, a lot, I feel like a lot of the pressure of that game was on Wii Q. Um, but Piatnica, I feel like, uh, put pressure on when pressure needed to be put on, right? Uh, building a board of four health minions, forcing uh, Wii Q to uh, answer it, and then holding on to the, the Threads of Fate he knew that at some point the rags were the last opportunity for Wii Q to actually win the game, knowing that it, especially if the uh, um, crop rotation was not picked up uh, for the Grime Walker in order to deal with the rags, that would need the Threads of Fate to actually clear the rag board once it came down. So, I thought that was a, a big deal as well. Didn't realize it until the end, right? But when I saw this at the end, I was like, okay, well, this, these rags could be difficult to deal with if the Threads of Fate had not been used. Or it had been used, right? Um, been difficult. And that was the, the last out, essentially. That was Wiki's entire entire game plan. You saw as soon as he realized that the rags were gone, there was no chance left. So, um, nice little game one. Intense game of Hearthstone. Ooh, <laughs> Yeah, it was. Uh, certainly some uh, some questions for Wii Q along the way. Definitely did get a little bit unlucky with the Lightning Reflexes picks. Um, no doubt about that. But I think then the reaction, like the recalibration of the turn of whiffing on the Lightning Reflexes took a little bit too long for Wii Q and then wasn't able to adjust further down the line. Um, and then I think maybe just got into too big of a hole for the next two or three turns after that. You could see just... The frustration, the, the the body movements, the hand motions, everything that was coming in. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, certainly, he's a very talented player. He's already beaten Yala to get to this point. There's still plenty of room to go in this series as well. Uh, so hopefully, Wiki can uh, pick it back up for the rest of the series. Yeah. <clears throat> that was only game one. Whew. Maybe it's just because it's been so long since uh, I've cast some competitive Hearthstone, but that felt like a whole series right there. Oh. oh, I need a nap. Particularly for a for a nature shaman game, right? Which tend to end fairly quickly one way or the other. I do think that build with the, the jive insects can go a little bit longer for the reasons that you saw. You can actually like make that final board when the rest of your deck has been uh, has been busted. Yeah. So uh, it, it's a little surprising to see that deck go a lot longer. You know, it does have this reputation of like a win on turn six or turn seven or bust kind of deck, but. That is something that people have put time into working on recently as to how to make the deck a little bit more resilient without losing that early punching power. Yeah, I suppose like the uh, nature shaman does it a little bit more consistently, but you don't lose like that many tools uh, by adding in um, like the conductivity and, and, and drive insect. Um, like looking at the other shaman builds in the field that are playing just like the pure nature shaman. You have things like Spirit Claws, um, additional spell damage in like the form of Cobalt Geomancer. Um, we see a, bun uh, a bunch of players playing, um, well, at least a couple players playing like Fizzle to be able to just go again um, at a certain point. So you do have more consistent, more consistency, but I I do like the the, the drive insect variation. Very frustrating game of having to play it though when your <laughs> face is frozen for eight turns. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, here we go. First demon hunter game and first warrior game of the tournament, at least that we're seeing on broadcast. Uh, so a couple of the big big hitter uh, classes in the field. I think demon hunter being uh, the biggest of hitters, uh, one of the most successful. Um, X in the metagame right now. A lot of different variations that we're seeing, at least in terms of 
you know, five cards in the list, but uh, Window Shopper is uh, at the, the, the heart of, of each and every one, it feels. Yeah, certainly, I think a lot of um, casual, semi-casual players who are looking on might be expecting Demon Hunter to be the terror of this tournament, because it is at most fields of ladder um, for the last uh, week to two weeks or so since the, the most recent adjustments. I will say at a very, very high level, uh, Demon Hunter falls off a bit. And I think, you know, there have been some predictions that Demon Hunter might come into this tournament, be a very, like, heavily brought deck and just wildly underperformed by a lot of people. We've seen that happen historically quite often with decks that, you know, report very, very well in ladder stats that to specifically the top 50 players in the world just don't really have the skill expression or the edge that you'd want. And there have been accusations of that towards Demon Hunter. But what I will say is when you get to go coin weapon, uh, it's some of the most powerful things that you can do in Hearthstone right now. Yeah, you can certainly whiff on demons uh, for this discover, but you got two chances because you have a widow baby shopper. You got a widow baby shopper. So you got two goes. Bye-bye. But I think the other issue as well is if you're playing against a resilient deck, some sort of control deck with a skilled pilot behind it, if they're really good at like partitioning out their resources to be able to deal with your waves, the waves are very obvious, right? Like You know what you have to beat against Demon Hunter. They play all their threats and then they're kind of out of stuff. It's not like they can continue to generate endless threats over time. Um, so yes, the waves are very fast and very powerful, but if you are able to keep up with it with something like uh, Control Warrior, then you uh, you can still get over the line. First one down. We we you choosing to spend some mana there, which I respect, but you do have to have that conversation with yourself, right? By nature of Window Shopper there is another minion in hand that is the same size as that minion that was in play, which is, of course, what Bladestorm is particularly good at dealing with. Um, but otherwise, you are just kind of wasting two mana on that turn by uh, by hero powering, you know, gaining two, taking six from the minion that was in play. And there's no guarantee that it wouldn't come down, you know, three mana, six, five of some variety, and then, like, the one mana, one, one window shopper, for example, and you'd have to clear up that one mana, one, one before the Bladestorm would be effective anyway. Having the shield slam as a follow-up. I think Weak U has found pretty good answers to this stuff so far. Yep, just deal with it one at a time. Alright. And this is what I mean, right? With a lot of control decks, this is how Oof. you know a lot of beginner players play control decks. There's a minion in play, you have a thing that kill it, kills it, so you kill it, right? And at a higher level, better players will run you out of removal if you keep doing that, right? You have to use your health as a resource as much as anything else to be able to stack up two or three minions in play and then clear them with one card, right? That's classically the way that control gains advantages. I think because Demon Hunter is limited in the number of threats that it can play, I think we, you can just say, you know what, if there's one big minion in play, I'm going to kill that one big minion, and I feel like I can keep doing that for the rest of the game. Yeah. Unfortunately, it doesn't work against Magtheridon. <laughs> <laughs> It does if it's specifically Reno. Specifically Reno. Which would mean you have to have specifically at least eight mana and specifically no duplicates in your deck. Correct, yeah. <laughs> which, uh, hold on, let me do some math here. Weak U has neither. Guessing that shield block. Yes, it is. You see here priority from WeQ with this low impact board. Um, you know, the only thing that's particularly threatening on this board is the Magtheridon. There's nothing that you can do about that currently anyway. So just valuing the cycle there over even Trial by Fire, for example. Like Trial by Fire could clear up this board and actually be dominant and stay in play, but you'd be playing it into a Magtheridon anyway, which kind of sucks. 
Um, and I think Weeku understands right now. Number one priority. If he gets a free turn where there's not too much pressure, draw some cards because he kind of has to get rolling on some of that card draw. He may very well have to play an active Reno this game if he's going to get out unscathed. Weeku, <laughs> like you said, there's. But it's not that threatening. We could just look stressed. Like every single decision is agonizing. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe after that game one, that's kind of the, the mindset um, he's been put in. Uh, I'm. And this is just trying. What, what's the best way to supplement this board? And I guess it's push a, a damage efficiently. Um, that's the 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 mo here. So. Just gonna kind of get the ball rolling. Another three damage at the end end of this turn for the uh, the Max Theradon. Armor total's gone, but gonna need a board to kind of stick here because the damage from hand is gonna be pretty limited. Probably shield block again, right? Yeah, I respect this. I think weak U is. At least trying to approach this properly, understanding that the card draw is valuable, does can then curve that into the trial by fire and still clear all of this up. <laughs> He's and it's the right turn to use it as well, because now the mag emerges, and actually these are real minions in play that need to be dealt with. Oh, he's so widow. <laughs> Look how widow he is. And now what is the question for Pianita? Okay. Four mana, 10-7. Old... Seems like a pretty good start. <laughs> nice. And the old red card Mag on trick. Oh, he's like, no! That's against the rules! <laughs> it's so big. I know there was a period around the start of the expansion where people were uh, trying to figure out whether... Was it Frequency Oscillator? The the 2-1 mech that discounts your next mech by one? Whether you're just supposed to play that and 4-mana 10-7 Zilliax in every single deck because sometimes you just got to play a 10-7 on turn 2 and that yeah. just kind of won the game immediately. Yep. I mean, <laughs> Oscillator is... I feel like it's in every deck. It's in a that lot in the, of decks. That in yeah. the drone, it's like... Uh, in Miracle Salesman. Just the zombie chows of old. Just the efficient one-drops in the game. Bladestorm picked up, but the frog is blocking. No active forge. For the Ignis, can't even go for like one mana poisonous weapon here because the forge hasn't been made. It's kind of an ugly looking hand right now for Weeku. Yep. And it looks like he's going to take 10. Yep. Yeah, might as well dump a, a safety goggles while you have the mana because you won't be able to double them up in the same turn without spending mana. He's so mortified by every turn. <laughs> well, I mean, currently... Uh, there's no way to deal with the Zillet. Well, I guess there is. If the armor gets chipped off, you can always Odin safety goggles. Um. <laughs> yep, yeah, that's an answer. That feels good. Odin's like, oh yeah, brother. But I mean, you are right. If you don't deal with it, you're taking 20 from it next turn, and then you are dead, so... I have, I, it may be the only answer. Yep. And think about whether or not it's a, a desperado kind of angle. Just to plop it in. Plip-plop. 
Yeah, I think the only... I think the best reason to go Spirit there would be to play around Bladestorm again, right? Because you'd then have another Stealth minion with less health, but both Bladestorms have been used, one early and one on the previous turn, so I think it's better to just have the uh, the extra 3-2 minion that can attack. Yeah. <clears throat> Still gotta find an answer. Okay, looks like that's an answer. And there's a Shield Slam... Have a hammer too, so uh, that was close. <laughs> Very close to not having an answer at all to the Zeliax. Um, so how much damage are we looking at this turn? It's three, eight, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Pian Nitsa, right? Where'd you get thirteen from? There's a, me a metamorphosis in play. Oh, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. You are absolutely right. Yeah. Three from Magtheridon, four from Metamorphosis, one from Hero Power, mm -hmm. three from Desperado, two from Spirit. It's wake up this turn, right? So it has to you have to have mana for the red card as well, depending on what else we draw, which I, is now relevant because I, I think there is a second weapon left in the deck, right, for that instrument tech. There is, but that's not enough to fit in everything. Nope. You can play everything but the spirit, I guess. Which is one more damage. And you wouldn't hero power. Oh, yeah, you don't get the refreshed hero power for the one extra attack anyway, so it's just kind yeah. of the same thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Right. I'm sure he wasn't like this at Worlds. <laughs> should, we, should we get a, a, a little duplicate check on Wiki right now? That does seem important, yeah. Um... Did you hear that? No. What happened? Oh, I had my phone next to me. And when I said, can we get another duplicate check on Wiki right now? Siri started answering. Oh. She's like, oh, that was weird. I was like, geez, all your voices changed. All right, let's go ahead and turn that off and throw it away. That was creepy. All right, we're back. Um, I th The only duplicate, I think, is... Needle Rock Totem. So all he can really do is armor up, remove, swing with the weapon. Yeah, play the Verse Riff as well, I guess. Two extra armor, sure. Takes him to 10. So we're one off? Or perhaps not? Perhaps not, yeah. We have a couple of pulls. Pianisa has done very well here to be able to get two weapons, one of them drawn... Uh, with the instrument tech, and both of those weapons have drawn the window shoppers. That does not always happen. Piatnitsa finds oh, the second mag, and that is going to be the extra damage required. That's going to be 2 0 now for Piatnitsa just getting over the line, and Weeku's frustrations will continue for at least one more game, but he will hope if he gets to be frustrated for three more games of Hearthstone, weirdly, he's doing pretty well from this point. Very nicely done. And was was on the only out for Window Shopper? Not that it really matters. Uh, how much damage do you need? One. One in the end, right? Yeah. And it had already attacked. It already attacked, yeah, exactly. So I think it does have to be Magtheridon, yeah. 
yeah. Uh, but I guess there's a small enough pool of demons to wear. <clears throat> mm-hmm. You could also get, uh, I think there was enough spare mana to be able to tough crowd and go again, right, on your one mana miniaturized window shopper? Yeah, because um, just started out with hero power plus uh, spirit, so it's three plus six from the shopper, then seven from the second ones. Yeah, and then you could have, would you have enough mana to go again then play the additional one, one call shopper again? Now that I'm not sure. Yeah, you um, do. It's happening right now, right? There's two mana left at this point, so you can, you oh, can yeah, so you go. play the one mana shop and play one more thing. You'd have been fine. Actually, no, no, did hit Tough Crowd as an additional option for that Mytheridon as well. So. You'd bounce it back and then play the shopper and then have zero mana. Oh, no, because he played Mytheridon. Yeah, you're right, you're right, mm -hmm. you're right, you're right. Yeah. Cool, 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 cool. Solid. It's good at cool, 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 cool. No doubt, no doubt, no doubt. Shelf, for shelf, for shelf. It is. It is 2-0 for Piadnica, and I think less impactful from um, WeQ's actual decision points that game. I think that mm. was just kind of a very, very strong draw from the Demon Hunter, where it was a one-drop coin weapon. Uh, both of the shoppers stayed in the deck to be cooperative and get drawn by the weapon, which, as I was saying, does not always happen, which allows you to cheat just enormous amounts of mana. Um, and if your count on the deck was correct there at the end, he was still probably a, a Needle Rock Totem away from winning the game because he then could have just slammed Reno that turn, right, and cleared up the, the Dormant Mag as well as the rest of the board, gained five armor, swung with the weapon, gained even more armor. Um, and it's possible that um, Piadnica would have been struggling to develop pressure the next game and we could have, uh, sorry, the next turn, and we could have even seen like Counter Swing with Odin coming down soon, depending on what cards were left over. So, still perhaps a little bit closer game than it might have looked, but WeQ just continuing to be frustrated in these these first two games. Yeah, narrow, narrow margins as mm -hmm. well on these games, uh, which are, are the most frustrating to lose, uh, to be quite honest. Uh, but moving now into game three, potential match point uh, for Piatnica. It's uh, Zamiri Priest versus the Odin Warrior once again. <clears throat> this could tend to be a pretty tough matchup for the Priest, I'd say. It can, yeah. Um, just generally, the easiest way to win games as Priest is you play a few minions and they stick, right? And then the world is your oyster because... Minion sticking means funnel cake options, minion sticking means dreamboat options, and minion sticking means lethal if you have an active Zarimi most of the time, if you can get that and play it. Also improves your Ziliax because um, it plays ticking module most of the time uh, in this build of the deck, and that is what Piatnica is playing. But Warrior is, of course, one of the best classes in the game, and making sure that if it doesn't want minions to stick, it does not have to let minions stick. So it is one of the tougher matchups to build a board against, but... You can sometimes get those games instead where you start generating like infinite value engines with uh, with Amonthals and synchronizes and the discover options that you get off Amonthal, stuff like that. Like you discover a Ra Den off an Amonthal or something and then you can just make infinite boards for the rest of the game, like that kind of deal. Things can happen, um, which I think is why, why people who like this priest deck like this priest deck, right? And it's been the case and I've been one of those people since like Naga Priest is there are, it's very flexible. It may feel like all it does is, you know, play five dragons and then play Zarimi, and if it doesn't do that quickly enough, it dies. But when you really start to get to grips with the deck, there are lots of cheeky little things that you can do here and there. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> it, it, it almost feels like a casino priest in a way. Um, yeah. Just because... Yo! What? We just straight up two mana executed that thing. Yeah, I mean, I don't want it sticking around. I feel like when when once you have like a number of games in your belt with the Zoom Priest, you come to realize that like um activating Zarimi itself tends to be uh like an afterthought. You're kind of playing T for TJ, tempo. I have come so close to cutting Zarimi from this deck so many times. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, it, I how dare one? How dare you? Um, <laughs> two, no, really, how dare you? And three, there's so many games that you wouldn't win without it. And what are you even going to put? <laughs> like, I know, yeah, you, that's the what thing. Would you I, essentially, it with? Uh, there, so there are situations where you play scale replica, and it would be better to 
guarantee you're drawing 2-1 Mana Dragons, right? First and foremost. Oh, absolutely. Secondly, secondly, sometimes you just have this irritating 5-mana card in your hand, and you're not playing Dragons. You're doing, like, yeah. Cleric Funnel Cake, Thrifty drift, uh, Drifter stuff instead, right? And this card in, in your hand is just, like, a 5-mana Yeti that's never going to do anything. Essentially, what I mean when I say that is I really wish this deck was still Naga Priest, because Naga Priest was way <laughs> cooler than this deck. But obviously, with the tools that have been lost by Naga Priest, you have to play this kind of uh, Dragon Scan yeah. package instead, which does get you so many free wins that you absolutely cannot cut it from the deck at all. Yeah. Well, letting the Whelp Wrangler live lets the Priest allows Zarimi to be an afterthought, right? Because you're just yeah. naturally going to get it activated. Whereas, if you don't get that Whelp Wrangler sticking around for multiple turns, then you act actively have to think about, okay, well, if my game plan is, is a Zarimi win in the next couple of turns, I need to try and play Dragons, even if that means my tempo is slightly less because of it. <laughs> um, if you get a Whelp Wrangler for three turns... <laughs> Start slamming happy whelps every every turn. Just space them out if you want. Play them all in one turn if you want. You do whatever. I mean, they are particularly happy. Uh, I don't. I think a more accurate name for it would be deranged whelp. <laughs> um, <laughs> but sure. We'll, See, I we'll feel go like with, we'll go with happy. Some Someone went to the art department and went, I need you to draw a card that's called Happy Whelp. And the person in the art department went, yep, you got it, boss, I understand the assignment, and they drew a Happy Whelp. I'm entirely okay with this chain of events ending up where we are. But only for you to come along and call that poor hard person's work deranged. Uh, <laughs> okay, here's how I envision it. <laughs> Someone said, we're making a card that's called Happy Whelp. Can you go and draw a, a card that's a whelp that's happy? And yeah. the artist was like, <laughs> oh, I'll draw a happy whelp, all right. How's this for you? Is he happy enough? And, and that's the result. So same, same story, slight deviation, and this is the result. Mm-hmm. See? Imagine if there was one more on... Yeah. Nope. Never mind. It wouldn't have worked out. It's going to work out perfectly regardless. I was going to say that Whelp Wrangler had lived for one more turn. But you can just play this Whelp Wrangler and then still have Zerimi on 6, which would have been the pace in the previous time. Not that it matters, because I don't think Zerimi on 6 is really going to do much, given the current board state. Ah, maybe. Need a Drifter. Yeah, Drifter would be huge. Then Drifter we'll usually is pretty huge in these scenarios. But this is what I was talking about earlier, right? Like, it's a pretty decent board, but straight up one card from Warrior just blows it out of the water with the Forge. And now it's going to be very, very difficult for uh, Pianinsa to actually build a board that sticks with the uh, Zarimi turn. It does have Leroy in hand, though, which, you know, can help you scam a little bit harder for those, uh, those times where you can't actually have a big Ziliax board rocking. Starlight Whelp being uh, Piatnitsa's kind of 30th card in this deck. Um, there's a few different things floating around. Uh, sometimes it is a Starlight Whelp, sometimes it's two Starlight Whelps. Sometimes there's a Posix snuck in there. Um, I know you were playing with Gaia Worm earlier, or, uh, or Euro Worm as you were referring it to. There's a few different things you can put in there, depending on the consistency with which you would like to draw uh, one mana whelps when you already have Zarimi in your hand is one of the bigger impacts, but sometimes yeah. you actually draw too many dragons and then your um, your scale replica just gets dead in hand or is only going to draw one dragon a lot of the time. Yeah, I think out of all the variations that I tested across the field, my favorites was this one from Pietnitsa. Um because it's like from the quote-unquote standard list, I guess, um, mm -hmm. I don't know if Leroy itself is standard, but it's like most players. I think modern. Leroy is pretty standard at this point. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of people that cut it. Um, is but yeah, Nietzsche's version is basically minus one Starlight Well plus one Hearthstone Brew. <laughs> yeah, which makes like I don't know. It's, it, it just 
beautiful. <laughs> it's just one <laughs> extra card of like, all right, I I lost, right? Uh, my board's gone. I got nothing left. <laughs> Hearthstone brew. GG! <laughs> This is one of those situations. <laughs> All right, nothing left. Got to play a tempo. Uh, a Zerimi. Yeah, I think this is something that you do have to get to grips with pretty fast with the deck. Is I've certainly seen people attempt to play this deck where they're like, okay, well, I don't... Like, I'm not setting up a, a two-turn, like, time walk lethal if I play Zarimi here, so I'm gonna hold on to it until I do, but, like, no, most of the time, if you can play Zarimi, it's your best play. Your best play is usually taking two Hearthstone turns instead of one. That's usually better than anything else you can do. Yep. <clears throat> Especially against Warrior. There are some, like, fringe case scenarios if you're playing against, like, a super greedy combo deck or control deck or if, like, you know, fatigue decks ever made their way to the metagame where there is some you know, weird OTKs that you could do where you wait till 10 mana, um, you Leroy, Zarimi, and dump Thirsty Drifters, and then the next turn you copy the Leroy. So you're essentially getting... Mm -hmm. 18 damage, but I haven't been or able just, to pull that. Uh, you can do it with um, Leroy Funnel Cake, Celestial Projector, and Leroy as well. Yeah, like you get yeah. the three mana back from uh, from Funnel Cake anyway. Yeah, um, but you need a, even with Funnel Cakes, you need a load of mana. You need to be able to hold on to resources for very many turns without taking too much, like without like taking pressure. Um, and Warrior will literally just armor out of range of co any combo that you can do if given that time. Yep. So, and that's the only real deck that I feel goes that long in the current metagame, so it's not possible now. Um, but maybe maybe one day <laughs> this deck sticks around for a while and, like, Control Priest comes around. Wow, okay. I don't like this holding cards business. This worries me. I'm not well, a card holder, TJ. I don't know if you know the, this about me. The, the Drifter? Well, this is Piaditsa saying, all right, this board's gone. Um, hopefully that's the last removal. Then next turn I could, you know... Yeah, but what if it isn't? You know, like, it's not that hard. It's not that easy to clear that board, right? Like, Well, you're, you're, uh, would you have set up lethal? I think that's the only chance that I would have gone, gone in further, is if this board's not dealt with. Okay. It's a lethal setup. N no, you wouldn't have sailed lethal, but you would have been pushing four extra damage this turn, right? Counter yep. question. If you play it, and they have the gift into brawl, right, or whatever their instant board clear is anyway, are you winning the game from that point? Because I don't think you are. Uh, I, feel uh, like I feel like I'm you play the biggest board you can and hope they don't have removal and start pushing damage. If I'm on duel and Hearthstone Bro are in my, are in my deck still, I'm... Um, there, I'm That's count true. Out. Okay, I ain't count myself out, Saddle. Okay, so to be fair, yeah, context of this particular game, we've still got a couple of synchronizers, we've still got an Armenthal, and there is the Hearthstone Brew that I'm not accounting for because that's not a card that I've ever. I haven't played a single game of this deck with Hearthstone Brew in it. Um, which you know, it, it's it's low quality cards, but you know, it is an extra nine cards that you can just have that do something over the course of the game, and there's a couple of decent outs that you can get from it. So sure. Well, this board's going to say bye-bye via Sanitize this turn, I would imagine. Um. Well, they're actually like a, what, like a Bladestorm Trial by Fire actually does a pretty good job against this board as well. Is just Trial by Fire enough on its own? Just Trial by Fire? Uh, you clear off enough... I mean, I guess you could trial by fire. No, you couldn't trial by fire in Bladestorm because the Bladestorm would stop short at the 
the totem. Yeah, it's not even like you can trade off the the happy whelp first, right? You're still only doing two. If you could get Bladestorm to deal three before playing the Troll by Fire, that'd be pretty huge, but I just don't think it's good enough. Yeah, I think you're... See, so yeah, it does of... look like both players are just uh, settling in for a longer game, right? Weak you not wanting to blow the premium removal. Understanding that he does have health to play with as a resource, kind of thing I was talking about earlier. And there is the Amonthal with the power called Synchronize. Yeah. It, <laughs> every time I play Sanitize, unless I win the game immediately, I kick myself later for playing Sanitize. And even when I think to myself, oh, if I play it now, I'm going to kick myself for playing Sanitize. I'm going to save this. And then I save it and then play it later in the game. Later, later in that game, I still kick myself for playing it the second time that I said I, I, was, I was going to kick myself for playing it the first time. Mm -hmm. So now I just play Warrior and just never play Sanitize. Yeah, I agree with this. Jam it, remove two. You want to keep Copy Minion active just in case the Armenthal sticks because Copy Minion is the nuts when you have Leroy in your hand, of course. Tia right? uh, is additional Armenthals sometimes. I have, I've, I've played this game before. Okay, it's gonna go. Oh, Luna. yeah, I gotta, gotta cycle to that Hearthstone brew for sure. But I have played that game of uh, of Dragon Priest before. Where you play an Armenthal, take the tier, they kill the Armenthal, and then you just play the tier and you have another Armenthal, and then you're away. And then you discover a Raden, and then all sorts of magical things happen. Well, isn't this problematic? Yeah, this is the this is the quiz that you've got to pass when you're choosing not to use sanitize, though, right? Because the reverse can be true sometimes as well. Sometimes you you keep you keep sanitize, and because you've kept sanitize, you kind of undercommit on removal, and then because you've undercommitted on removal, they chip away your armor all game, and you just never have that stack of armor to be able to do the massive clear. This is the full circle moment from my explanation of how I play Sanitize earlier. Mm -hmm. Well, then you realize at the very end of it all that you should have just played Sanitize the first time. Yeah. Okay. Illuminate it's like is. deciding whether to eat an entire family size share box of chocolates on your own. Like, you know it's a bad decision and you know you're going to hate yourself afterwards for doing it. But then at the end of the day, you're an adult and it made you happy. So live your life, you know? Amen. <laughs> what, Wasn't sure what, if you were going with me on that analogy at all. Just, ooh, what a sermon. It's a grom. That's just lethal. <laughs> it is just lethal, yeah. It's I, thought, I thought it was going to be off, but literally just didn't gain armor last turn. Just slammed a nine-man Odin. <laughs> all right, and that series right there, Piatnitsia is going to move out of the group uh, from this matchup with a 3-0 score over a week you not what i expected uh in terms of score felt like the underdog through and through even if you just looked at the specific deck matchups across the way every match felt like a, a, a slight uphill battle and was just able to get the job done time after time after time and i feel like it was slim margins on each and every game but that's <laughs> that's hearthstone that is indeed Hearth Stonebrew. Um, yeah, we can go back and examine some of the decisions there. Like, I still feel like I would have all in that last uh, Thirsty Drifter, but certainly... You c the other fact that I necessarily didn't pay as much attention to as I should have done is that he had the other projectionist in his hand as well. So it's, it is it is one, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush kind of thing, right? Like, he could have played one extra 4-6 that turn, but by holding on to it, it's not one 4-6 later with your next wave. It was two 4-6s later, because otherwise you're, you're stranding that projectionist in your hand, which you couldn't play on that yeah. turn, which I think puts an extra tick in, in the column for his way of thinking. But I think largely what it comes down to as well is just he's more familiar with that style of the deck than I am and knows with the addition 
of hearth and uh, starlight whelps giving you a bit of extra value as well and um, that you can just grind the match up a little bit longer like i certainly have ground out warriors before but it just didn't look like that hand which at the time didn't have an armenthal did not have a hearthstone brew in it was going to go the grindy route but uh, in the end, you can see, like, even if that wasn't lethal, he still had several waves left to go if the, the big clear had come down there. So very well played in the end from uh, from Piatnica. From Weekyu, I have to say, uncharacteristically shaky based on what we saw uh, last year in the World Championships as well. Um, so Piatnica, I think, has done very, very well to beat two of the breakout performers from last year back-to-back -back and just waltz his way out of Group A. Uh, Gyu was was arguably the second best player in the tournament uh, or in the in the format last year outside of Pocket Train, and Weekyu man uh, won a lot of supporters as well. So great, great performance uh, from Piatnica in that that upper bracket. Absolutely, and we may even get to see the, that uh, a rematch later on uh, between Weekyu and Yarla to basically catch up on the uh, the match that we missed uh, in the initial match since we joined this group um, in progress. So that could be good. Uh, but yeah, that was a solid series. Solid series overall. It felt a lot longer than just a regular 3-0. It um, was a long 3-0, like yeah, for sure. Yeah, Very, yeah. very long 3-0. Long may it continue. Well, no, Saddle. I, I mean, great job. Just take my point and reiterate it. That's what I that's what I want to see throughout this whole day. It's just repeating what I said in a cooler accent, you know? Whatever. All right, Saddle, with that it's time for a break. Uh, when we come back, we're going to have some more group A action. Uh, so don't go anywhere. More Hearthstone Master Tour Spring Championship right after this.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the 2024 Hearthstone Masters Tour Spring Championship. And we are getting ready to get through our lower uh, match here for Group A. So to take you through that game is myself, Dragon Rider, and joined by Lorinda. How you doing, Lorinda? Yeah, I'm doing great. Um, really excited, obviously, to be doing another Masters Tour. Uh, we're going to be kicking it off as far as you and I are concerned with an amazing matchup between Yala and Gyu, like worthy of a final going into this. But then we're going to say that's about most of the matches because this lineup <laughs> is stacked. Uh, Yala, obviously, a player who I think a lot of people thought was going to win the World Championships a couple of years ago, let alone deserve to. Um, still missing major wins from his resume. And Gyu. I think Sotl summed it up, second best performer of last year in a lot of ways behind Pocket Train. Uh, do you see it the same way? Yeah, absolutely. I, I do think that Gyu is a very high performer and definitely somebody that we need to be uh, keeping an eye on because the performances have been wonderful. Uh, Yarla, definitely not a stranger to these tournaments either, uh, but we will talk a little bit about that. I want to switch over again to Gyu here and talk about uh, some of these lineups and this information. I also am really interested. Uh, favorite card, Deep Miner Bran, but uh, is he even running Deep Miner Bran here? I was just checking. I didn't think he was. But uh, I feel no. Like I've gone crazy overnight or something. No, he's not playing Bran. So, boo! You, you've got to play your favorite card. Otherwise, how do you expect right. to win anything? Come yeah, the, these lineups are really interesting. Uh, and, and once the th one thing we're seeing with these warriors specifically is this kind of uh, decision between this Odin warrior that we're seeing a lot of these players bringing or that pure Highlander type version uh, that Sadl was talking about a little bit before and then kind of a um, hybrid version that kind of goes halfway. Uh, but these Odin warriors are just focused on kind of going in on the Odin potential there. So they aren't running brand. Uh, but Yarla also not running Bran with his Odin Warrior either. No, absolutely. But he's not saying it's his favorite card, so it's a little bit more forgivable. <laughs> True. <laughs> um, Yarla, there we saw the stats, um, still at the top of the list, that um, Global Games result 100 years ago. Uh, world Champion runner-up, obviously a massive achievement, two times Grandmaster Champion. And he made four semi-finals, uh, five semi-finals in a row in Grandmasters, by the way. He reached the top four of the best 16 in Europe, which was basically the best 16 in the world. Five seasons in a row. But still never really did... How do you word it? He never won a big Masters Tour with 300 players. He made top eights, top fours, constant, constant performer. Uh, but I think he is better suited to these 16-player and 8-player events where he has always done a lot better in these. Obviously, you start off with only 16 players. I don't mean that. He is just so solid percentage-wise in these. So, surprised to see him at 0-1. See if he gets to turn it around. But not an easy matchup when you're 0-1 to play Guillaume. Yeah, and unfortunately uh, for these players, this is kind of a... This is a last chance here because, as you said, they already did lose one and they do need two wins to make it through the group. So if uh, if this is gonna be potentially it for one of our players here, and we are getting into game number one, it is going to be both of these warriors that we were talking about, these Odin warriors. Uh, so they both are a little bit focused on kind of going in on that Odin, but they do have a little bit of difference in their uh, deck lists here. Yeah, just looking through, you say a little bit different, I'm, I'm skimming through. Yeah. There, there definitely is because they're different <laughs> sized lists. But, yeah, <laughs> yes. Uh, Yarla is, is running twos, uh, right? Fizzle. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. It's mostly duplicates, I would say, but uh, some of those kind of important cards, right, that are doing a lot of the armor gain are duplicated. Uh, they are both running Acolyte of Pain as well. So there is a little bit additional uh, draw. I think there was some some talk about the kind of speed that warrior is able to draw these cards at uh, but we don't see either of those in the hands yet here uh you has a little bit more of uh being able to kind of search and find things with a little bit of this uh tradable but uh, shield i should get guess shield block could draw as well yeah this <laughs> This whole meta is really weird. Sorry, just just gonna go off at a slight tangent on the card draw there, but like 
verse riff. Okay, no chorus riff, no other riff, just verse riff in this deck. We've got um, Death Knights with only Hellier in it. It's um, the meta's really strange right now. It's get the cards that work the best, not as necessarily synergy, and just dump them in a deck. Just take the best cards in a class and lob them in a deck and see what happens. Seems to be a thing that has defined the current meta. And it turns out that that's pretty good. We've got a lot of powerful cards. Obviously, there's synergy in Warrior. We're cycling through decks incredibly quickly. Um, but it is interesting to me how synergetic cards such as the Rifts are just being played on their own. Yeah, it is really interesting. And also, I think there was a lot of talk about Reno in that first match as well. Uh, both of these players are playing Reno, Lone Ranger, even though there are a high number of duplicates. But and as that was stated, there there's so much draw for these Warriors that depending on how long the game goes, if they're able to kind of really draw through their entire deck, they can get to that Reno pretty easily. And in this mirror match, we might see it go that long where they do potentially get to uh, draw their duplicates and get to play Reno actively. Uh, but I think uh, for Yarla being able to have a little bit more kind of staying power with that fizzle, that could be really interesting if it goes uh, into the kind of far fatigue yeah, do you think it will go that far? Maybe it will. Um, I mean, I'm just to see that if either of them go anywhere near playing one of the rock stars on the board. Uh, as Odin is taken off the top for Gyu, so he's in prime position, of course. Um, or if when you start hitting your opponent, you just hit them for a 30 with the rock, double rock star combo, and it's kind of over at that point. But that's all well and good if you've got Odin going, if your opponent hasn't. If they both have Odin going, you're gaining 30 and hitting them for 30, then yes, suddenly neither of them is killing the other one in time. Yeah, it, I was going to say, it might go that long if these warrior decks play out very much like uh, the Sif Mage ends up being for a lot of players where Sif just hides in the bottom. Mm. But uh, the Odin, not hiding. And Gyu also still has coins, so at this point might be wanting to just hold this coin uh, to play out that Odin earlier uh, and get that out as quickly as possible. And we'll see if, uh, on the other side, Yarla can find Odin because, yeah, as you mentioned, if one player finds it and one player doesn't, uh, it might kind of feel like it's a little bit of a lopsided matchup. Yep, still plenty of turns. Like, there's five more turns for Yarla to find it, which is yeah, a lot of cards, as you have highlighted a couple of times there. Um, something I always think these top players do so much better than even sort of good players is hand size management. I just look at a hand like Gyo's or Yala's right now. And I don't want to draw any cards because I like all the cards I've got. <laughs> um, and they, they find a way to consistently make space, um, get another card, uh, not overdraw, make sure you're keeping the good cards and somehow it always looks fine. If I do this, it looks so simple when you're playing against it or when you're watching it. Trust me, in a minute I'm going to have 10 cards in my hand, I'm going to like them all, I'm going to forget to discard, I'm going to overdraw something important, I'm going to lose the game. Yeah, and I think especially with uh, something like the Acolytes of Pain can really stack on top of that as well, right? If they have Acolytes out, there is the potential of things like the Blade Storms to add to the potential of overdrawing. So they will have to be a little bit careful of how they... Uh, kind of sequence their cards or when they might want to go in on actually playing something like Acolyte if they're going to also play removal at the same time. But we might also see in a mirror match things like what we just saw there, which was a Blade Storm, uh, purely just to remove the Needle Rock Totem off of the board. So Yarla just clearing that up and then following up uh, with his own minion there with the uh, Stone Skin Armor. Yeah, and actually getting something for your Blade Storm's kind of a result. Sometimes you just want to throw it away completely to make yeah. space. Again, what I said, cycling your cards through, making space, make more cards. Um, and keep yourself on nine the whole time. Obviously, Gyu in a decent spot here with Coin Odin in hand. But he doesn't know that Yala hasn't got his Odin yet. And also, we don't know that Yala's not going to get that next turn. Of course, Yala will be looking for even more cycle. <laughs> So, Gear will be planning ahead to try and start doing damage with that Odin when he gets the chance. And both players just have been stacking up their armor at these points as well. So, 
Because that's all they really can do. It's just uh, gain some armor and draw some cards for <laughs> a good part yeah. of the first, you know, the first half of the game. And if you're Yala, now it's sort of an emergency, in my opinion. Um, you're, you're both over halfway through your deck. You're the one who hasn't got Odin. You have to assume your opponent does. Of course, they're over halfway through, so they're more than fifty-fifty to have it. If you look at it that way, and Yala realizes this turn is a turn where he needs to find Odin or things can start getting nasty for him. Yeah, and being on seven mana this turn, as you said, means that Yarla really wants to be able to find that Odin uh, very quickly, only two more turns. There are, is some more card draw, but again, you, you start to add in that hand size potential. And if Yarla were to go in on something like just playing the Fizzle, that uh, shuffles that snapshot into the deck, which then means... Uh, less likelihood of drawing the Odin. So does he want to wait until after the Odin is in hand to play the Fizzle? Uh, when does he want to go in on this yeah. Acolyte? The hand is pretty full. So there's just a lot of very awkward things for Yarla here, just not really finding those cards that he really would like to find. Whereas on the other side, it's looking a little bit, uh, looking a little bit better for Gyu here. Now just drawing on turn seven, this active Ignis and uh, Ignis is an interesting card as well, I think, with this Odin Warrior, where, yeah, you're getting uh, this great weapon that you're able to put together. You're not getting two like you would in some of the other lists because of that Deep Miner brand, but also just being able to get this powerful weapon, start pushing that damage, and set up for this big weapon in preparation for the Odin that he's likely to coin out next turn is just fantastic timing. What absolute garbage first choice there for him, though. All minions related, yeah. and there won't be many minions to relate to. So, did take the 10, obviously, in planning for, you know, getting Odin down next turn, then doing a load of damage the turn after, and then just playing the weapon on 10 whilst you've, you've done a whole chunk. Uh, this is an important game for Yala, by the way. We haven't discussed the lineups much, particularly. Um, but Gears' other two non-banned decks are the, the Warlock, which does a lot of damage very quickly against the warrior and also the demon hunter which it's a bit hard to get a gauge on exactly what the win rate is there but you don't really want to be stuck with warrior versus demon hunter you can definitely lose that as we've seen um so this this 50 50 for yala might be his best shot in this match to get the warrior out of here and it looks like he's behind in it Yeah. For those wondering as well, he, Yala did ban the priest. If you're wondering why this warrior is in a bad spot, well, that the priest is good against the warrior too. So, yeah, you're kind of soft targeting this warrior here. A little bit. I, I almost wonder if uh, he was also a bit targeting the mage. But it's kind of interesting with Gyu's lineup having this Odin warrior and that uh, shopper demon hunter that both kind of want to swing with weapons that want to attack. Uh, the mage potentially has a little bit more you know, freedom, I guess, in, in that lineup of being able to free freeze things and kind of keep those weapons at bay a little bit. But yeah, this matchup, and especially just these draws for uh, Yarla. Yarla was able to find Ignis, but now is going to get that news that, that uh, Odin just got coined out there. And now it feels like Yarla is on a clock a little bit here. On a clock a little bit and no way currently of fighting back. Obviously, if he starts armoring up himself before the Odin, that is long-term damage that has been missed. Um, on the other side, he has got that fizzle down. Yeah, there, there should be plenty going on there at some point if he needs it. But yeah, Gyu has the, the license to start doing chunky, chunky damage. Although he hasn't got lots of armor gain in hand at the moment. But I mean, I say that. There's safety goggles, there's double sanitizer that do three. Uh, at least one of those has been forged. There's a verse with that's ready to go. There's the rock star. There's a lot of damage there. Yeah. And Yarla with 10 cards in the deck was able to play the active Reno, which does mean that Gyu is only going to have one board space here. So might not be able to go for a ton of uh, different plays but also there's not a lot of options at the moment for being able to go white on board anyways so i don't feel like the the board space uh issue here is as relevant uh for this reno coming out but being able to play the acolyte of pain 
Uh, use that aftershock. So Q has now drawn a couple more cards here, picking up his own Reno. It is annoying though, right? He wants to get that weapon down on 10. This turn he wants to play a couple of rock yeah. stars and do, do you know, a lump of damage. Or maybe he didn't want to do that. But that's how I would be looking at it. Uh, now he's going to have to go all kind of backwards, miss this turn, weapon on 10, lumpy damage on 11. Um, which is okay. It's not a bad position to be in. Uh, yeah. Also, now he might have to waste um, one of his damage spells without a rock star on the board. Yeah, he's just going to play the goggles just to, to do something. Yeah, and I, and I do wonder if only having one of those Razor Fen rock stars kind of impacted that decision as well, because the second Razor Fen rock star was drawn from uh, the acolyte damage, uh, drawing some cards. So there definitely could be potential for you to just want to go for that massive damage of playing both rock stars in the same turn, as you mentioned. Uh, but oh, shaking his head as the weapon from Ignis comes down for Yarla uh, with Wind Fury and extra armor gain so just that much more damage that you will have to push through but with the double rock uh razor fun rock stars maybe that's still possible oh burns <gasps> the plate as well well <sighs> fighting back for now yeah the swings will be so huge if yala does find odin like absolutely yeah. ridiculous swings like you gain 30 and deal 30 and all that sort of stuff it's absolutely ridiculous which i guess brings up the next point eight cards left in the deck we know one of those is that fizzle snapshot uh but at this point it, can yarla even uh, attack or does he really kind of need to hold those weapon swings for when he does pick up the odin yeah, I'm not it's... sure. I'm not sure how it works with the fizzle mechanic here. So looks like he's just going to say, okay, I've got so much stuff in the fizzle that I might as well stay alive, get my Odin, get my fizzle, and do it all again when I get there and just you know, do some stuff for now. Make a lot of space ready for that snapshot and ready for that Odin. And just, yeah. I'm not going to die because I'm on 9 trillion health. <laughs> yeah, definitely uh makes a lot of sense i think in the context of just what yarla has drawn what's still left in the deck and going all the way up to <laughs> massive amounts of armor this is just okay it ended on 90 armor and 30 health uh but you getting to play his reno here which is now active gonna be able to push a little bit of damage but without uh the additional swings of that wind fury it's, it's going to take a little bit longer for those weapons to uh, to push as much damage with only one attack that oh. you can do every turn. Yeah, Gear, Gear couldn't help but laugh. Like, he, obviously, he's not finding it funny, but that was kind <laughs> of amusing. Like, just as that health total was just, well, the armor total was rocketing up there. Meanwhile, Yala, yeah, not today. I don't, I don't want, I don't want to not have my Odin today in this mirror. This is such a huge game <sighs> of Hearthstone in this match. Yeah. I would say he definitely uh, got the better weapon from Ignis, but missing out on the Odin just feels so awful here. Uh, using the temporary shield block from Garrosh's gift and still six cards left in deck, still not picking up either Odin or the uh, that fizzle snapshot. Yeah. I'm not sure he's in a hurry for the snapshot. He needs that after the Odin now, but he, he's used the first lot to, yeah. to buy time. He's on such a massive health total. Maybe it's enough. I, I'm not sure, but when, when he finds the Odin, he's still going to be in front. He's managed to carve this out very nicely, as yeah. you'd expect for Yala on a control deck. Yeah. And I'm actually wondering at this point, with Yarla sitting at 99 armor, 30 health still, uh, Gyu... 10 armor and 30 health how much more armor i i feel like this uh double razor fen rock star still sitting in hand for you really wants to be able to i guess push a, a massive turn here but how how easy is it going to be for you to actually kind of uh reverse the roles here and chip away through all of yarla's armor while tough, building up his own yeah it's gonna be tough i think um he is getting rid of the expensive cards in his hand, so we've seen the sanitize there, five mana, get rid of that. 
Uh, he's building up cards like Bash. He's got the Rockstar, so he is he is building up to have a, a ludicrous turn. Remember, he did burn um, the heavy plate yeah. earlier in the game, so he only has one of those at most. Uh, at some point, Yala is going to play his own Odin, and <laughs> at, he's going to be six. At ahead some of this point, race. maybe we'll be well. Maybe we'll be in Group B by b the point that Yala actually gets to draw this Odin. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and both players here, we're, we're seeing them just dump these blade storms on empty mm -hmm. boards just to get them out of hand, as you were mentioning earlier, uh, where just the hand space becomes an issue. <laughs> but, oh, this has to feel so bad for Yarla, just watching these these cards come into hand and not be Odin. Yeah, especially for Yarla, the, the hand space thing. Obviously, he is going to want to play that fizzle to, to win the game when mm -hmm. he finally gets Odin going, so he's going to have to have space to put that there. He doesn't want to play the Acolyte of Pain because that is going to make his problem worse, not better, because Gyu is dumping things like Blade Storms of his own. Um, so... All a little awkward here, but going okay. Whereas Gyu, just without, without yeah. that fizzle, is able to just keep a maximum hand of nine at all times. This is about as much as he's going to get. He will know what the most he can do in one turn is. But we're, we're getting to that yeah. point now. Well, there's a couple interesting things here. Q does have the Reno Hero power that will give him additional armor. Uh, just through this other shield block. Still has those double rock stars in hand. So yeah, there is quite a bit of uh, armor gain that because that one was played now translates to damage. Uh, but I'm kind of curious, on the other side for Yarla, uh, that slight difference in the uh, the deck list that we were talking about where Yarla is playing that Fizzle, mm -hmm. Gyu does not have Fizzle. Uh, so I think Fatigue is going to be a much bigger factor for Gyu than it is for Yarla. So for Yarla, maybe at this point, it's just kind of a matter of build up as much armor as you can, kind of keep stalling out the game. Uh, and then finally, by the time you do find Odin, be able to play that, push a little bit of damage, and hopefully let the fatigue kind of uh, finish things off a little bit between the I mean, inevitable Odin and a little bit of fatigue. I mean, if Yala keeps the, the Wind Fury available to him, he can do infinite damage in one turn, really. Um, yeah, he might but... not be able to, because, yeah, look at this. But because Gyo didn't get the Wind Fury, he wasn't able to swing for that, that 50 damage or whatever that would have been. Yeah. Yala gets to get rid of these, and, you know, it's going to be very tough for Gear to do the damage after this. Yeah, Yarla getting to uh, discover a spell kind of insta-picks a safety goggles just for additional uh, armor that, again, after the Odin comes in, still four cards left in the deck, no Odin anywhere to be seen, uh, but additional uh, armor there. I... This is such an interesting back and forth. Gyu had the huge pop off last turn with armor, but now a little bit uh, looks like running out of resources. Yeah, I don't know how Gyu gets this done. It's definitely possible. Oh, uh, Yala had used up the Wind Fury weapon. I missed that earlier uh, to make hand space. But yeah, it's hard to say. There it is, finally. I'll see how Gyu gets this done with that 15 advantage, but there's so little damage left in the deck. How much armor was in that uh, snapshot for Yarla? Is it a decent amount? Yeah, plenty. Absolutely plenty. I didn't snapshot it. I can't tell you exactly what was in there, but um, yeah, rock stars and, and damage was in there for sure. Yeah... I don't think you've got enough of a lead here. I yeah, I, I don't uh, think so either. I mean, even going with the the garage's gift to be able to uh, try to discover shield block, gain some extra armor, but then at the same time, sure you're getting some armor for attack, but you also draw a card, which just hits into that fatigue. I don't know. Yala just has so much time. Like, even if Gyu, yeah. let's, let's say Gyu could do 20 a turn, which I don't think he can, but let's say he could. Yala still has six or seven turns. That's plenty of time to empty the hand, get the snapshot played. Um, he, with only being 10 or 11 health behind, 
and with being two cards ahead in fatigue as well, like you just, in my eyes, isn't going to get this done. But I've been wrong before on simple calculations, so I might as well watch it out. Yeah. And discover some great spells, like you pointed out. Ugh, those were not the choices I think you was hoping for there. <laughs> Taking a bellowing flames. Uh, again, ideally would have liked to find more armor just to try to push more damage here. Uh, Yarla finally getting the snapshot. Um, but this is one thing, I, I think that uh, Subtle and TJ were talking about this a little bit in terms of the kind of how, in general, you might want to play control style decks uh, versus how they have to go. And I think this game is a perfect example of, typically you might say, oh, whoever finds the Odin first clearly will be the winner. Yeah. But Yarla kind of took this game in a little bit different direction after not finding the Odin for so long. And now it's just kind of going for that, okay, I'm just going to stall things out as long as possible. And also, who needs uh, Deep Miner Bran for a second Ignis weapon when you have Fizzle and you just get a right. second Ignis anyways? Fantastic. I th this is also another, uh, I think, reason why the slight difference in... Uh, the deck list is just really kind of showing through in this game right now as well in this mirror match. Yeah, absolutely. Yala realizing that the, the fizzle was the way to get the extra value. Uh, didn't panic when faced with um, early Odin and reaping the rewards now. Yeah. Eskia trying to get the maximum out of his cards, but yeah. He's actually behind on health total now. Um, all he has to show for it is he is going first, and he has a weapon equipped. <laughs> but behind yeah. him, every other aspect of the game. And it's about to get much worse, because Yala's going to um, play his 10-drop weapon. I didn't see exactly what he pulled from it. There was Wind Fury and Life still available in the first part. It's Wind Fury and additional armor. Yeah. Just capitalizing on that game plan of just continuing to stall. And yeah, we're going to see Q just uh, throw it up there and say, this, this is it. I have no chance whatsoever of winning this game. So that does mean the first game going over to Yarla here, which, as you mentioned earlier as well, that there could be potential for the warrior to maybe struggle a little bit. So uh, getting that win on the warrior there has to feel absolutely amazing for Yarla. Yeah, I think, I think if he loses that game, he's in an absolutely dire spot in the match and in his tournament with him being 0-1 already. Uh, getting that out there yeah. changes everything around rather substantially. Um, Yala still has the Priest and the Mage. His Mage... Mage is really hard to judge, right? Um, the top 30 or 40 yeah. players in the world play Mage so much better than anybody else. Uh, the drop-off is so huge when you look at results for top players versus yeah. even 200, 500 ranked players. Don't play anywhere near as well as the top few. Um, but the mage looks okay, let's say, for Yala. And then his priest... His priest has got it to do, but his priest can take down the warrior. I'd say that Yala looks pretty powerful from here. Interesting to see um, how it actually goes though, when they play the games. Yeah. I just, I can't get over that turn we just saw in the replay of uh, Yarla just gaining about 50 million armor in that single turn. Absolutely. Oh, fantastic. Those turns are, are ludicrous. It's also a bit weird because Yarla was playing really quickly. And that's not the Yarla we've become accustomed to over the years, but he obviously knows those turns so well. He just rattled out the maximum armor and it's just ticking up and ticking up. It's like, stop it. Yeah, I, I am just very interested in these lineups as well that you were talking about. Uh, they kind of took slightly different approaches, I think, to uh, the way that they brought the lineup, even though we did just see them both playing that Odin warrior. Uh, but, and they, I guess, both also have the Zarimi priest, but the other two decks uh, kind of went a different direction than that. Um, as one player brought the just shopper focused Demon Hunter yeah. and uh, with Gyu and Yarla brought the um, Naga Shopper Demon Hunter that really kind of focuses on the shopper aspect, but also adds in that blind eye sharpshooter, uh, which that did get banned. Uh, so I think Gyu's lineup kind of focused on, okay, I'm just going to ban the Demon Hunter, uh, potentially try to do a little bit better versus some of these slower decks. But 
uh, for Yarla on the other side, uh, banning that priest and then being able to potentially just freeze things, keep things at bay a little bit with this mage. Only two of the 16 players brought mage uh, for this tournament. So too we too are many. getting to see Yarla. What was that? Too, too many. <laughs> Potentially. <laughs> we'll see if it pays off here because uh, this game number two is Yarla uh, coming in with the mage. And it looks like yeah. you uh, sticking with that warrior. I remember in Grandmasters, I think Yala was one of the players doing incredibly well with Mage back then. Uh, I think it's a, an archetype and a style that he really resonates with. Um, I've got a bit more of a read on Giyu's lineup than on Yala's, because he, he sort of did what I did only, would have done or only better. Where you say, okay, what's defining this meta? Not necessarily what are the best decks, but what's defining the meta? And that's Demon Hunter and Warrior. And then you say, okay, I'm going to ban one of those and target the other. So I feel I feel like he made his lineup so he bans Demon Hunter, makes sure he's strong against Warrior, and that's the lineup that Gyu ended up with. That's my read on that. I don't know how Yala thinks. I never have known how Yala thinks. Um, but I get the feeling he just brought the decks he thought were the best decks, honestly, which is also a perfectly decent way to play Hearthstone. Yeah, and I think right now this meta is really interesting as well in terms of bringing a four deck lineup because it does feel like there are uh, quite a few matchups that feel a little bit polarized. Uh, so there's not going to be, or it's going to be a little bit more difficult uh, to try to come up with a lineup that really fully targets something because, yeah, maybe you can get a deck that kind of targets or has a, a very favorable into one deck. And then maybe you have some like 55 <laughs> percent. You're like, OK, that feels pretty good. Uh, but outside of that, it's there. There are a few matchups that feel pretty polarizing. Uh, so is this one of them, do you think, this warrior and mage? <laughs> um, again, I, I, don't, I think this is a very uh, level ish matchup. But again, my mage ability has always been rather lacking, um, mainly course i'm bad at it that's why it's lacking in ability um no i, I think that the mage is is slightly favored here personally um just because they can just end the game and they you know occupy time they draw better they don't die the warrior can't pressure them you're both kind of doing the same thing if the mage manages to pop off they win but it, it's a close one obviously the warrior can just get out of range the mage does have limited amount of damage it could do even though it's a high number on the limit it, it, is, it does have a limit yeah, and I think is... one thing that's really interesting with the mage is losing some of the cards from rotation, uh, I think has kind of stifled a little bit of the kind of uh, tempo type of pressure that we mm -hmm. saw from it uh, in the previous meta. So instead, there is this kind of more stall tactic that we see a lot uh, with these mages right now, which is things like this uh, cryo freeze that we just saw. Right, so freezing. There is the Sleet Skater plus the Mini that can come from that to be able to uh, keep things frozen and then just kind of stall while playing some of those uh, additional spells yeah. to be able to then finish off some boards uh, with that Inquisitive creation. But, okay, the top deck reverb here on uh, the Miracle Salesman for Yarla. So interesting. Nobody does that. <laughs> I love it. It's superb. When you see it, it's like, yeah, that's obvious. I'd have done that. No, I wouldn't. There's no way I'd have done that play. That is so good. And and this is where we see those differences between even players who might be good versus these top players. Uh, I think in, in this matchup, especially, the Warrior isn't really going to be playing a ton of minions. Maybe if uh, the Ignis weapon gets discovered and it's like Wind Fury and summoning uh, multiple bodies out on the board at that point, maybe you could, you know, make a, a reason for wanting to uh, make a copy of one of those. But that's a lot of maybes. That's a lot of ifs. That's a lot of holding out for that. Whereas the way that Yarla used this instead was a little bit more aggressive and plus the... Uh, the snake oils yeah. here now can just get traded into the deck to find the cards that Yarla actually wants to find. Yeah, he really didn't like the look of his turn six. Like, look at that hand, the the three mana wisdom. Yeah. 
Um, a couple of minions you don't really want to play. Um, so I think he went for, like, all the things you described. The extra snake oils are nice. The extra minion means the warrior has to at least sort of take it seriously. Uh, whereas with one minion, you're not even putting up a board that they can't hit with their face. So you might slow them down a little bit. And the combination of Yala's pretty tragic hand, I think. Just was a really nice time to do it. But it was still, it looks so horrible. Oh my, all my half and instincts are crying at that play. It's like, oh my goodness. But what else are you going to reverb? Other than Sif, what yeah. else are you reverbing? Like, yeah. Well, and that was only one reverb, right? There still is a second reverb in the deck. So again, kind of, uh, as was mentioned before, in terms of using your health as a resource, which we'll definitely talk about when we get to the uh, Warlock deck. Uh, but here, using using some of those cards as a resource to get to your other things, because you're going to have a second copy, but if that reverb is just sitting in your hand waiting for you to draw Sif, it's sitting in your hand doing nothing. Yep, absolutely. The Warlock deck, you don't use your health as a resource. You use closing your <laughs> eyes and hoping for the best <laughs> as a resource. It's fantastic. It's so much fun. It is a really fun deck. Uh, but you now here waiting to get to this odin does have the odin in hand again it's only turn six but uh has an active ignis that can be used might not want to go for that quite yet there still is a weapon with a couple attacks on on it still available for you to use um, but how <laughs> this hand feels a little bit awkward in terms of what to do in this kind of mid game how much of the armor like this shield block uh do you want to end up using before you get to that Odin, especially when it's sitting in hand? Now, I know we just talked about that for the mage. Like, you don't want that card just sitting in your hand doing nothing. But for these decks like the Odin Warrior, there is a very specific reason you do want to hold some of those cards because you are building up that kind of combo and those big swing turns uh, that you're already piecing together. Yeah, choosing not to swing with the weapon there tells us quite a lot, I think, as well. Um... Just not in any hurry to use this Ignis, not in any hurry to potentially give up six damage mm. with the Odin turn as well. Um, maybe there's some, a couple of things he wants to pick off off the board. So, very interesting there. A lot of damage in hand from Gyu if he does get the Odin down, but that's some way away. Feels like he's safe, like on 31. He didn't, he didn't value the, the extra three. So... Kind of couple discover options for Yarla. Um, just kind of, I, I think at this point, trying to discover some damage, discover cheap spells, and a little bit still trying to squeeze in uh, a variety of spell types to buffer the the Sif later. But I think at this point as well, this uh, we're we're still kind of talking about hand size for this mage here now so yarla just being able to discover a couple of these cheap things a two mana crossed uh cross stitch frost lich amazing being able to uh remove something now gets another freeze potential on the board that you as you mentioned earlier he's gonna have to take this seriously because he does not want this uh elemental being able to freeze his face when he needs to be swinging with these weapons yeah Taken care of in short shrift there, just straight up shield slam, nice little target for it. Um, his one-on-one -on -one removal doesn't have many targets in this matchup, so can afford to just be pretty frivolous with it. Like you said, it's a very, very high priority target. All right, now you getting to pick a weapon here. Immune, poisonous, or life steal. Unfortunately, no wind fury. Again. <laughs> so annoying 60 percent is a horrible number <laughs> and everybody who goes for 60 percent is entitled to feel incredibly bad whenever they don't hit but they're not going to hit 40 percent of the time that's kind of how it works it's really nasty hearthstone number 50 50 you just go yeah okay i never win those because it's 50 50 and it's me so i'm never going to win one but when it's 60 40 which isn't that much different suddenly you feel like you're entitled to win them all it's true that's how statistics work, I'm pretty sure. It is. Pretty sure Isn't we it? decided this. <laughs> but, uh, well, I used to use stats and I don't anymore. I think. <laughs> I think there you go. 
<laughs> well, Yarla does find the Sif now, uh, but I think needs to still potentially play a couple of different spell schools. Uh, discovering here, going for a Molten Rune, though, just extra damage. And it gets to cast, so it goes right to face. Love to see that extra damage. Yeah, getting to crunch time. <laughs> Remember the uh, the reverb earlier? Got the snake <laughs> yeah. still in hand. Yeah, those are still in hand. I, I guess uh, at this point now, instead of trading them off into the deck, just saving them for mm. uh, the damage that they will be able to do for zero, which honestly, there is quite a bit of damage already starting to build yeah. up in hand here. Now the Sif, double snake oil, uh, there is that uh, molten rune. Might just depend a little bit on how much uh, armor he was able to build up. Um. I think I think you know it might be time to to do that. He yeah. doesn't want to waste too much armor stuff because Odin's in hand. But yeah, he he saw the reverb. He knows those snake oils are still there. Obviously, he'll know exactly how many schools have been played. We don't know that, but it's it's some. Uh, the magnitude in hand as well for for more cheap stuff. He knows he's got to be kind of close. And yeah, he's he's not messing around too hard here. He's making sure to gain gain a bit of armor now. And and this is another interesting thing I think we're seeing kind of from both sides is sometimes uh, you have to decide if you are going to do something towards your own game plan or if you are going to do something to prevent your opponent from doing something towards their game plan. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think for Yarla right now, kind of having to decide, how do I want to maneuver this turn in preparation for likely going in on the Sif uh, potential next turn and kind of maximizing the damage uh, is he's only on nine mana this turn, um, but also freezing the opponent for next turn, spending the mana to actually freeze and stall out Yu's game plan because uh, he's going to be on nine next turn, and there has been cards that have been held for quite a while. So definitely seems very likely only 13 cards left in deck uh, from Yarla's point of view that Gyu does have that Odin ready to go. And he is happy firing his pop-up, but so uh, he's happy to look for even more damage. Just trying to get some damage from minions because he hasn't got enough to just yeah. get there in the air right now, I don't think. And again, now for Gyu, does he just play the Odin for his own game plan? Or does he have to worry about just being dead? I. I... I just don't know how, how long you want to hold off on playing the Odin, because if you always play to not lose, how do you ever win? <laughs> like, there uh, depends, are some right? games yeah. that can happen. Yeah, but I feel like if you just end up using all of the resources here as Warrior uh, to just build up your armor before you've played Odin and while you're getting repetitively frozen, uh, okay, maybe you can live a little bit longer, but you're also giving the mage uh, more time to build up those resources, yeah. play those additional uh, spell schools. So it, there really is a big give and take here. And um, you hovering this blade storm. Yeah, gonna go ahead and just remove those, uh, a couple of the minions off board and try to build up a little bit more armor here. Just forego yeah, but, but applying with, the Odin. It was the nature obviously last turn, I think. Shadows already been played. All the obvious ones already been played. This is Sif must be on about plus six, I think. Oh, picking up the flame geyser as well. Just going for the repeated freeze. Got another one of those where that came from as well. Next mm -hmm. turn. And I, I almost would imagine we see Yarla want to forge this molten rune at some point as well.
Does he yeah. want to play a sleet skater just to keep getting uh, minions on the board to try to push uh, more minion based damage? Yeah, it seems like he's been valuing getting some minions down very highly and trying to get a little tiny bit of chip um, yeah. to push it over the edge. And he's, he's seriously considering it. Plus, it empties his hand for another slot. If he plays it, does he coin Infinitize? Uh, Probably. Well, I mean, it, it's just replaced by the mini, so the hand size won't change. No, but he'll get the finale on the Infinitize, but, right? Yeah. Any potential damage, but that discovers a Reaper. reverb. Yeah. <laughs> And it's discounted. Plus, yep. there is now an additional coin sitting in hand. So, yeah, it definitely looks like Yarla is setting himself up for closing out the game very, very soon here. And again, Gyu is kind of in this position of face being frozen, not being able to go in on the Odin game plan. Uh, but how much removal does he want to use? How much armor does he feel like he needs to gain here? Uh, I, I guess if Gi really tries to go for the long, long, long game, uh, could continue to just try to stall at this point and inevitably will be able to play Odin and another weapon and there won't be any more freeze potential. But that seems like a, a far cry from uh, what's actually happening in this game. Yala has a lot of damage next turn. I don't know exactly how many spell schools, but if, it, if, if the Sifts are plus six, that's 12. Uh, would need five spells, well, four spells, because this goes faces go down to 48 with a ping. I did play that Amplifier earlier as well. So there is 11 mana plus that additional coin in hand. So it does leave a little bit more room to play some extra stuff here. Um, and that Reaver being discounted helps too is this at i think he can six? afford to He's trying to look out if he can forge i think right or is the other stuff just there reverb sif yeah it is Remember six he reverbed to get those snake yeah. oils earlier he doesn't need the forge he's got everything else there with yeah. the coin and the um flame so he's fine and they are on seven not six as well On six. Good. I got that part right. Good. Yala, nicely done there. Um, making sure that Gyu just yeah. couldn't get anything done with the attacks to the face. And just kept messing around like, here's a little minion wall. Here's here's a 3 4 hidden behind some naught ones. Just kept making it so that the warrior had to take care of those things, use mana to take care of them, which meant the warrior wasn't developing quite as much armor as he would like. And yeah, Yala getting over the line with the mage again. Good players with mage do so much better than the stats seem to say. And one game away from another shot at going to a final day for Yala. Yeah, very, very close. One more game just has to get a win with that uh, priest at this point now. But there is that final uh, blowout of the reverb and all of the spell damage, all of these uh, direct damage spells coming out. Uh, Yarla definitely has, has just shown that these are very comfortable matchups for him. Just really showcasing uh, fantastic play, knowledge of both, I would say, how to go for your own game plan, but also when things don't go well, like not drawing that Odin. Uh, just how you want to maneuver uh, the different games. So uh, definitely looking very good for Yarla and being set up. But uh, on the other side for Gyu, this is just not really working out uh, for for Gyu's lineup so far. Again, it's just down to that Warrior Mirror, um, which he was probably unfavored. I don't I want, don't want to say too much based on one game of Hearthstone, but with the Fizzle versus not the Fizzle, that seemed to be the difference in the game, especially given Yarla didn't draw the Odin. Um, I think you would be favoured if that warrior was still there, but it's not. It's through. Um, seemed like it was slightly favoured to be through. And Gyu's now got it to do. This priest can definitely lose three times in a row to this lineup. Um, it should beat the warrior. It really should. Um, 
it'll probably lose the Warlock and isn't favoring against the Demon Hunter, so it's not all over by any means. But, I mean, you always want to be 2-0 up. Simple as that, especially when one of your remaining matchups <laughs> or one of your main yeah. matchups is a favorable. Yeah. Uh, I am very curious to see if uh, you ends up shifting off of this warrior uh, and looks like he does. You know, we're n we don't need to go in depth into if he decided to switch or if it was random, uh, as is with Conquest, but going to be the Warlock, this custom Warlock, as we are calling it. A lot of the pros are calling it that. When you initially look at this Warlock deck, you just kind of go, what? is this like it's just it looks like a pile of cards and you're like how does this even win how does this do anything and then you see it in action and it just it becomes a pile of cards to a pile of stats that hit your opponent in the face mm -hmm. very quickly for very high amounts of damage you just have to have faith. You just have to believe in Hearthstone. Like, but believe in the heart of the card. Geode it's and okay. a horror. It's going to be okay. Geode horror. We don't mind. It's, it's all going to be okay. That's going to cost zero somehow. I'm not sure how. It'll find a way to cost zero. Then we'll find a way to copy it. Or we'll get a Molten Giant. It'll be fine. We'll hit our opponent for 400 damage on turn five or something. And we'll look like geniuses. It's just the way of this deck. It's the best deck. I love it. Big That's right. Uh, also of note, again, I know we mentioned kind of in one of those early games uh, for this match, the difference in the deck lists, uh, but uh, this Warlock from Gyu also running one copy of Speaker Stomper, which we do see in hand here, uh, that I think is a little bit different than some of the other uh, custom Warlock lists that we see across the, the rest of the field. So uh, a little bit interesting there to see that and... The Forge of Wills coming in hand. Oh, we're going to get to trade the Geode on our own turn, which means we're going to get 5-5 <laughs> five, five for zero this turn, and we're going to play another 5-5, five, five, right? Am I going crazy? Maybe I'm oh. going crazy. Can I not add? Oh, we'd have been one off, one mana off. we do it all next turn. It's okay, it's fine. Yeah, I was thinking trading Geode and then Spirit Bomb was going to take it down to zero, but we're, we're one off. And then play the Celestial. But next turn is going to be ridiculous. Yeah, I think there's actually a couple options for you. Uh, this kind of this route as well. Um, this feels kind of like a, a a halfway of building towards his own game plan, but also wanting to remove that Whelp Wrangler from Yarla's side of the board uh, and not allow Yarla to build up quite as many dragons as quickly as well. Um, because I feel like if Yarla can assemble, especially a lot of those cheap whelps uh, very quickly, first of all, that is a lot more uh, taunt bodies that you will have to spend time trading into before he's able to send damage face. Uh, but also that's working towards Yarla's game plan of playing that Zarimi, pushing extra damage. And there's, there's no removal in this Warlock deck. Uh, other than actually trading on board. So I, I guess the, the spirit bombs, um, or if you draw Popgar, you, you get a couple of, of spells there. Um, but really outside of actually using your minions to trade, uh, there there's no like wide board removal. There's no clears like you do see with um, like wheel warlock or like the warriors. So that to me, that felt like kind of a, a halfway of not fully committing to trade in and uh, saving being able to play things a little bit later. Yeah, he's starting to get a massive turn with um, with Pip, Funnel Cakes, and Whelps, I think, there. Um, obviously, it means you do have to wait a little bit with a Pip, uh, but plenty mm -hmm. to come there. But now, Gears hit, like, the accelerator is down <laughs> to the floor now. Um, everything's going to cost, all the, all the big stuff's going to cost zero. And with Forge in hand, if he gets time to play the Forge, that's his removal spell in a way, just giving everything rush. Uh, the Priest similarly has no removal other than the Titan. Yeah. So having bigger things than your opponent in this matchup match is why the Warlock is so favoured. Uh, my fives hit your threes. and you know, Very basic Hearthstone <laughs> is my things are going to live longer than yours. And 
obviously you've got to be a bit scared of Zoremi just doing the thing. But that's often much harder than it sounds. You've got to make five dragons happen. you then also got to have the Zoremi. You've also got to not be dead. Uh, but yeah. like you say, this Wall of Taunt will slow things down to some degree. Yeah, and I, I guess there is the Popgar now for Gyu. Uh, there is the Forge of Wills as well, but the Popgar, at least to be able to play one of those uh, Sludge Barrels immediately, it will need to be turn five. Gyu's only going to be going into four mana here, so I don't know if that's an option, but top deck's uh, Spirit Bomb. That's a good <laughs> a good oh. draw here. It could go for Forge of Wills and the Spirit Bomb potentially to kind of clear up a lot of this board. Um, I think one thing worth mentioning as well for Yarla is even though he was able to get these uh, Whelp Wranglers, get some of these little Whelps on the board to kind of slow things down with, with them having Taunt, uh, this is not a game where you kind of get that ideal Zarimi board and larger minions to the start anyways. Uh, because there's been no dream boat. There's been no, even the uh, crimson clergy and, and funnel cakes to kind of draw and build and put more things on board with those dream boats and then just have a board of potential damage anyways. It's been kind of a, a slow game for the priest. So I'm laughing. Come on, Gear, you know what to do. You've got to do the spirit bomb. <laughs> All your three drops are too good here. Or your two and your one, if you come, two and your zero if you have to. Just do it. It's fine. No one ever died to Zerimi in this position, ever. Okay. Yeah, there you go. You know you have to do that. <laughs> Next time you've got Pop Guy, it'll all be okay. It'll be fine. What could possibly go wrong? I, w I wonder if the decision was actually between uh, committing the uh, Forge of Wills or playing the second Malefic Rook just to get another thing on board. But also, there there is a point for this Warlock where you do kind of have to stop playing stuff that damages yourself, uh, especially against another deck that kind of wants to get on board like this, because then you do have to worry about, okay, if they do have Zerimi and I leave two things on board, that actually might be enough to kill me. They don't need yeah. a huge board uh, when you're dealing all that damage to yourself first. I do suspect he was trying to calculate lethal on turn six as well. Um the the eight in hand plus the fifteen on board is twenty three, but he knows about the taunts. So I mm -hmm. think his plan here is to get enough stuff on the board this turn and not die, to make sure that next turn is lethal. And he just wants to work out how high he can get with Popgar, um, or whether he could wait for turn six for the Popgar. Uh, there, there was quite a lot going on there, but I think I, in the end, you know, me joking aside, I think um, he realised that. None of it mattered. He's either going to win by miles on turn six, or he's not. So just make the best board you can right now and hope you don't die immediately. Yeah. Oh, the Zerimi coming into hand for Yarla here. Not able to play it this turn, but I, I really like how Yarla is playing this too. Just kind of really trying to capitalize on those small taunts. Just kind of committing this uh, bigger board now. And then forcing you to answer this after seeing that second... Uh, the second spirit bomb being used already and knowing that, okay, well, yeah, five mana, but uh, there has been no flame imps, which uh, I guess just to damage those, there's been no uh, giants yet either. So that is working in Yarlo's favor. And I guess maybe if Yarlo wanted to even try to think about uh, the pop guard potential or symphony of sins, that is something, but also, at the same time, you can kind of say, I'm just going to put these things out on the board. Yep. And if you don't have the pop gar, which can kind of only answer one thing on turn five, or you don't have a symphony of sins that's going to clear my board, which also clears Gyu's board at the same time, then I feel like Yarla is sitting in a pretty good position. Yeah, I'm not even sure you play the pop gar here. I think you trust they haven't got Zuimi. And then Yarla wins. Like, oh, good, good work, you. Nice. Nope. That must hurt, but well played. So I guess it, it does. <sighs> it, is, it is now. That's lethal. <laughs> the top deck of the Thirsty Drifter. Being able to, yeah, just put up this damage. You kind of see Q just shaking his head. 
This has yeah. felt like such an interesting game of like both players not really kind of drawing the the cards that when you hear players talk about these decks, like where 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 are the molten giants? Where are the big things for Warlock? And also, where were the dr uh, thirsty drifters? Where was Zarimi up until now? But at the same time, this is still turn five and six, so it's still very early, but just beautifully done by Yarla. Yep, he had a million ways to win that at the end. Couldn't decide which one he wanted to use, I don't think. I think I think he was terrified he was going to play the Funnel Cakes and not have enough mana left or something. Yeah, so just do something really yeah. silly and end up not being able to play with Zerimi. I think that's what all the um, the slight weirdness was there at the end, because he knows there's enough damage. Uh, this, this deck, when you play Zerimi and anything else, is right. so much damage. And getting it done 3-0, and Gyu... We'll likely see him again in the Summer Champs. He seems to be making every Champs that he needs to. He didn't make the Fall Champs because he'd already qualified for Worlds, so he put his feet up for three months. But we'll see him again. Uh, still one of the strongest players around. Uh, but Yala in with another chance. One more match to get to that top eight for yet another time. Yeah. There it is, that final turn. I, I do think it's, uh, it's just really good to see Yala take that a little bit slowly, just... Again, these it's only five turn five and six at the end there, but they both played a little bit slower. Really, were thinking through those to make sure, and I think especially that position that Yarlow was in, uh, of being up two zero in this game, just kind of making sure that every decision he was making uh, kind of made sense to set himself up, and it paid off in spades for him there. Yeah, absolutely. A very solid series. Um, didn't get the first Odin down in the first match in the first game. <laughs> Then, you know, managed his sifts and reverbs really, really nicely in the second game, especially the early reverb on the Salesman to make sure he had the extra damage later on, trusted his deck, and then there didn't panic with the Priest, did take that extra turn to make sure he got the big pip. And there you see the group standings. He gets a rematch with Wikyu, who beat him earlier today, and the winner of that will go on to the finals on Sunday. Yeah, so we will be getting to see that decider match uh, coming up next after this, which is going to be definitely an exciting one to watch. I'm so curious to see after Yarla's uh, what looked like a really strong performance there in this 3-0. Uh, Yarla definitely seemed like he found the different potentials for the decks uh, versus uh, Wikyu, who did seem a bit shaky and unsure in the match uh, that we did see from him on stream so far already. Uh, so I'm so curious to see how it's gonna pan out for that match coming up next. Uh, and then after that, we still have group B to go through today. So plenty more Hearthstone action today. You're not gonna wanna miss it. So don't go anywhere. We're gonna take a quick break and we'll be right back with more Hearthstone action.
Hello everyone and welcome back to the Hearthstone Masters Tour Spring Championship. We've got plenty more Hearthstone coming up. Uh, just to get this out of the way, I know you'll all be disappointed that you cannot see me in motion, but I am still here. Um, Sotl, how's it going? You've already got ahead of me a little bit in terms of the casting, but how's the day been going for you so far? Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. I'll just do extra motion all the time. P perfect. Just to for you. Like, this yeah, is entertaining me, so what I can only think of it is for the viewers. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's been good. I more than anything, Raven, I'm just glad that we get to settle into a nice Yala series. <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> that that to me is like peak comfy Hearthstone, right? Like that takes me back to those those 16 hour days casting <laughs> European Grandmasters. <sighs> I wish memories. I was exaggerating. Yeah, um, <laughs> but I'm really looking forward to this one because obviously I think Yala would have been pegged as perhaps a favourite for this group, at least on on Legacy. Right, but WeQ already defeated him once to progress through to the winners' match. WeQ then had a very tough time of it in that winners' match, whereas Yala defeated by WeQ, but then had a pretty easy time of it, honestly, in his uh, lower bracket match. So um, it looks like the redemption arc is on. I'm, I'm sure there's lots of supporters rooting for Yala in, in Czech Republic and various other places across the world. The Yala is a very popular player, built up a large, large fan base during that era of dominance in uh, in European Grandmasters. So I'm ready to settle in for a good one. Yeah, there's definitely two sides of it. On, on one hand, of course, Jarl is trying to uh, uh, have another rematch versus someone he's just lost to. Uh, but Jarl has been in the game a long time, right? He's had to deal with tough situations in tournaments. Uh, so yeah, a lot on the line here as the winner does get to move on and the loser is done. Uh, and take a look at this Priest list. And me and you have talked a lot about Priest in the last few days. And it's a deck I personally um, do not enjoy, but the reason I don't enjoy it is I'm seemingly just bad at it and I lose all the time and I can't draw funnel cake. Uh, but outside of that, um, after seeing some of these matches play out so far today, uh, how are you feeling about this priest and like the bring for the tournament itself? First off, total aside comment, but um, we split up the duties on doing the highlight cards for this event and people were asking, oh, is there any particular way we have to do them? Like, no, do whatever you want, it doesn't matter if they're different. I did forget to mention the one golden rule, which is in ascending sequential order, obviously, not one, five, two. <laughs> what kind gonna... of deranged individual does that? Come Just on. Just wait till the group I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of this deck. Like I was talking about it before in the previous series with TJ. I'm kind of a big fan of this, but you know, you know when you hear like a cover of a song by your favorite band in a different style, right? Like you hear like metal covers of video game music, or like it's a country version of some like death metal song that you like or whatever. Yeah. You're like, yeah, yeah, this is cool, but you only really like it because it's sort of similar to a thing that you really like, right? Like that's that's the deal. That's Dragon Priest, Zerimi Priest for me, because it's very very similar to Naga Priest, which is a deck that I enjoyed enormously. Um, it just kind of has different endgame payoffs. But the part that both of those decks share in common is that sometimes you just make these insane blowout boards that win the game on turn four just by throwing too many stats in play for your opponent to deal with. Right. Then they have this other alternate win condition. In the Zarimi Priest case, it's just playing Zarimi and taking the extra turn. But if you get into a long game, and this is where I think some you know average players are missing like 5-10% on their win rate, if you know what you're doing with... Um, power cord synchronize on opposing minions or on your own Armenthal or various other things you can actually settle in for an incredibly long grindy game if you get the right thing going if you look at the deck list you would not expect that to be the case yeah it reminds me of other sort of slightly more aggro based priests we've seen in the past but as we take a look at Wiku uh, as and one of the lists uh, he's going to be bringing to this tournament of course uh, is going to be the shame and just another deck that's gone through a few evolutions over time uh, it's gained some tools especially in this expansion slash rotation uh, but also uh, lost a couple of things and a little bit of a, a recent nerf as well uh, what yeah. do you make of this build specifically and uh, are you a, a jive enjoyer i am a jive enjoyer it's certainly fun to do do you respect it as a card <laughs> lethals via conductivity and jive insect whether it's the optimal build of the deck over like the the more spell damage based version with spirit claws cobalt geomancer blood mage thalnos um, that deck's a little more, more all-in, I would say, but it's closer in spirit to the original version, which was very all-in on just trying to kill your opponent on like turn 6 or turn 7, sometimes earlier. And if you didn't get that, you're kind of busted. Um, but I think for this tournament, um, with a lot of people coming in not really planning on banning Warrior from what we've seen, mm. um, 
you do have to have some degree of resiliency in your, in right. your shaman build. And we've seen people do that. I don't know if you've ever seen, like, there was a build that was flirted with for a while that had, like, shudder block and fizzle in it. Right. So it, against warrior specifically, you can take three pictures of any given hand, and then, you, you know, you have hundreds of damage over yeah. the course of the game. And there is a build now with plays one fizzle, which you can use against warrior, which tends to go in that build with the extra spell damage. But obviously, this build against warrior is trying to do conductivity and jive insect using the jazz base uh, to be able to push 24 extra damage. On top, usually, you can then squeeze in your zero mana lightning flex that reflexes your zero right, mana lightning right. bolts, your crash of thunder in that same turn as well to be able to do monstrous amounts of damage. So. I do think Warrior is like the big the big evil right in the eyes of this Shaman deck when you're planning for this tournament. If you're bringing Shaman, you have to have your answer for Warrior, whether it be banning it or whether it be teching the deck in a way that you feel mm -hmm. that's not just an 80% matchup in the Warrior's favor when you queue. Yeah, it's one of those things I'm looking forward to seeing over the course of especially the next two days, because that's when we're going to be working through all the groups, of course, uh, is just how Warrior performs versus its band rate, because we've already seen it a fair few times on stream, and it's a pretty scary deck. We know it from Ladder, we know it from Tournament, uh, and it is pretty scary, and I'm surprised we've already seen it as often as we even have on stream. I thought it was going to receive a lot more of the bands, and you could say, you know, players have more of a plan versus the Demon Hunters, if that's going to be a problem. Than the warriors because i feel like there are certain decks that can jump on warrior a little bit but in general it feels like it's been built so well at the moment that it's hard to just say oh yeah i'll just beat warrior it'll be fine yeah i feel like that's the story of the meta like i found it difficult um normally we we have this discussion a lot coming into this and normally when i'm thinking about what the lineups are going to be I can say, well, basically, you're either going to ban X or you're going to ban Y, right? You're either going to ban Paladin or you're going to ban Demon Hunter. You know, like, it's pretty clear what the bans are going into the tournament in terms of most obvious strategies. Coming into this tournament, I feel like there's four or five different ban strategies that were somewhat viable coming in because... I talked about this earlier. I think at most levels, people might think that Demon Hunter is a bit of an outlier right now. But as you right. get closer to the very, very top in terms of MMR and, and High Legend ranks that Demon Hunter normalizes back into the pack very quickly, in my experience. So there's kind of four or five decks all vying with a with a viable argument of being the best deck in the game right at the top of the ranking. So suddenly, all of those become viable ban targets, and you really then have to dig quite deeply into, okay, so if there's no clear deck that I absolutely have to ban, what does my lineup look like if I ban Warrior? What does my lineup look like if I ban Demon Hunter? What does my lineup look like if I'm banning Warlock? You know, all of these options that you have available to you and actually look at it more holistically as to how your lineup turns mm -hmm. out in each of those options, which is uh, kind of cool. I feel like we haven't necessarily had a tournament like this in quite some time. And I can tell we've not had a chance to sit in a talk on broadcast about Hearthstone for a long time because we've just talked straight past turn one, which is often what we do. Uh, we are in, of course, into game one here, week on the top on that warrior yala on the mage and yala off to a pretty good start getting that hand size increase uh, just for a beginning and having access to some of these freeze options that can definitely help for example in this warrior matchup yeah and i don't know how much of this you caught because of course you did pick up your entire house and <laughs> yeah. move it down the street and connect it to a different internet cable i'm, I'm pretty sure that's right exactly um, what happened fairly fair, fairly accurate yeah yeah, um, but Yala did play this matchup in his previous series as well um, and actually ended up clutching it very, very early on. He just reverbed his own salesman, so he had two uh, snake oils in his hand and then mm -hmm. literally just waited the entire game until he had uh, critical mass with Sif damage, which did take a very long time, <laughs> by the way. Yeah. The temptation to start trading away those snake oils to try and you know get through the deck quicker must have been enormous. But Yala, of course, refusing of course. <laughs> to do anything that he didn't have to and just patiently waiting until we, the game falls into his lap. You said it earlier, right? It's like, you know, the, the, the whole conversation is, yeah, but do you need to do this? And Yala is yep. the master of control at this point. So see how this one starts to progress. Both players having a pretty decent hand. So it's uh, Wiku having access to some card draw with the armor. Um, and Yala, of course, uh, what feels like in Mage a lot of the time, always having access uh, to it, almost an excess of cards, actually. Not the best picks here, though, honestly. No, honestly, terrible. Deeply, I... deeply terrible. 
It's tricky as well, because I naturally want to say star power because it's just the best card, but in yeah, but this matchup, yeah, that's what I yeah. mean, in this exact matchup, it's like, ugh. it's going to be the pick, though, from Yala. Again, the, there are some minions that you can just say, oh, I'll just clear away with one card without even really having to think about it. So it's something, and I do think they are going to, that is going to get a bit more use than the other options that are available, because it was a pretty dire discovery. Yeah, I think Azerite, you could try there and try and get away with it. Um, but I think one of the better cards um, is the Hammer that has already just been played that you would be getting right. away with. While you actually have a little bit of armor, uh, a stone skin armor might be nice to pick up as well. You could just ping yourself in the face or do something stupid just to get a little <laughs> bit of extra card draw. But yeah, sure, I think a cheap enough star power is probably just a higher quality card, mm. as you were saying. Even if worst case it's used in this scenario, right? Just kill, the, remove four damage off the board, whatever. Like, it, it's done. Might not be what happens, because Yala might decide he can actually just take this damage. It's not a big deal. Uh, but it's just available. Yeah, he ends up going for it, just saying, you know what? Sure, why not? It's gone. Here, the Wiku has a lot of value in the air. The card draw train just keeps on uh, chugging along, doesn't it? Is we keep gonna verse riff this? Yeah, it does verse riff it at the end, gains a ton of armor from the Razor Fen, gets the bonus armor from the attack, mm -hmm. and will now get bonus armor from the totem as well, already at the lofty heights of 48. And Sif, not really the card you want to see right now. No, it's a tough it's it, well not tough, it's an interesting line to walk, because normally you want to be greedy as possible when you're the warrior, right? Because you want just the, the giga burst once Odin's gone down to just close out the game. Uh, but you also don't want to be burst in return in this mage matchup. Yeah, and I think if it comes down to it, if you stay out of range of the mage, uh you will kill the mage accidentally at some point. Right? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah, likely yeah. if it resolves like, down to that, you'll be okay. Wiku wants to do what Yala did earlier today and just hit that like hundred ish armor, right? And just be like, okay, go for it. Oof, it's... <laughs> oh. <laughs> I love Hearthstone, you know. It's it's great. <laughs> like it's just... oh. So Yala is going to have to find some way to get some serious discounts rolling here. The only way this game is even remotely winnable is with multiple discounted discovers from Infinitize. Right. right you're looking for several one-mana burn cards. You're looking for maybe a discounted reverb as well mm -hmm. so that you can squeeze it in there with the Sif for like plus 12 spell damage or something absurd. Even just hitting uh, glyphs and stuff like that, right, yeah. is, is a possibility yeah, yeah, to right. just help in some in some respect. The Sif definitely right a little now, bit early to the party, though. Can't even really commit anything to deal with the board. It's not like Wisdom Ball is going to come up with anything magical most of the time here. Let's find Glyph, though. Okay. Jeez, still no answer. Zero mana Frostbolt. I think, right? Because this is Glyph casting twice yeah. off the Stargazing, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's tricky because there's also, even, even though the hand size has been increased, there's hand size concerns because the reverb's probably going to stick around for a bit. The Infinitize obviously is going like, to pro well, probably stick around. Uh, Sif as well isn't going anywhere. So, oh my God. Even though you could say, well, why would you, you know, get rid of a cheap Frostbolt? Well, <laughs> it's going to run out of hand space soon, especially with that second reverb. Well, also, right, like, you know, if you get plus seven spell damage on Sif, that Frostbolt's going to do ten to your opponent. If you leave up that second Razor Fen yeah. for another turn, it's <laughs> very possible that Razor Fen just gains your opponent ten on this turn, so. Wind Fury. Did not see what the second option was. In this position... Would you say that Wii Q is just too far ahead at this point? Just from obviously yeah. we can see Yala's hand because, like, what are the odds on Yala actually being able to piece something together? It seems so let's say you low. get let's say you get Sif to plus six spell damage, right? 
Um, and then you're able to reverb it cheaply. So let's say you have plus 12 spell damage, right? Let's take three damage as an average spell cost. You're then doing 15 damage per spell, right? So you would then still have to cast six spells currently at that level. So we've got played Sif, Reverb, and six spells. So basically your entire hand has to be that perfect and cost less than 10. And you would get there this turn based on the amount of armor they currently have and they're going to keep gaining more. Hey, easy, right? Sounds okay. Yeah. <laughs> so there was a lot of ifs in there. But So essentially, what, if this was a ladder game, I would already be playing an entirely different game of Hearthstone right now. Let's put it that way. Well, Yala is piecing together a plan. Reverb on the salesman. Some of those oils in hand. Yeah, it's incredible how much of a threat those pigs are, isn't it? Like another Frostbolt going in there just to get them out of the way. As you said, all those questions were raised on this current health total for week yes. Never mind anything else. <laughs> yes. And this Wisdom Ball is not playing ball at all. It has cast nothing but secrets so far. Counterspell, Ice Barrier, Counterspell, I think, have been the three charges of the weapon. Almost entirely useless. Helpful in the most inverted of commas you have ever seen. <laughs> And it's because Weeku's so far ahead, like, they can afford to just play into these secrets, right? It's not a disaster by any means. As you can see, they're just throwing away the, the bellowing there. Yep, throwing away the bellowing flames just so he can guarantee cast yep. the gift, guarantee get another five armor. I think Weeku so far today is 100% ratio of uh, shield blocks from gifts. Oh, now that's a good stat to keep track of. <laughs> <laughs> Lorinda, what do we pay you for? <laughs> Lorinda's like, wait, you guys are getting paid? <laughs> <sighs> Creation is a way to deal with the board, even though the board is, again, one of those boards that warriors may, uh, Warrior makes at the moment, which is threatening but not threatening at the same time. So yeah, this is the play that we saw from Yala in the previous series, where he just reverbed a salesman to get the double snake oil in hand. Uh, the the moving goalpost was not 90 last time around. So <laughs> we'll see whether it comes together. Hey! It's another secret! <laughs> so what are, you, what are you wanting from the ball at this I point? I mean, fireball to face, really, is yeah. about the best thing that you're getting, isn't it? Did Weeku's this have armor like... gain on it as well as the Wind Fury? Mm... Oh, no. No, minions. summon. Okay, it's, it's time to actually apply some pressure. Fair mm. enough. Sleet is something to do, but is it something to actually progress? Stopping the weapon obviously is important, especially with all these minions, because Mage can deal with boards, but not when they, they're endless 8 drops. So right now, what would we have? We'd go Sif, Reverb, Snake Oil, Snake Oil, and then you could try and rewind a Snake Oil? It's not very much damage, is it? <laughs> Checks armor total. Um, hmm. yeah. We count in the uh, Pyroblast from Wisdom Ball, right? <laughs> the... Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> sure, 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 sure. So be honest, when this card was revealed, the first time you looked at this card, did you think it was Zephyrus six times? Because a lot of people did. Yes. I yeah. thought it was going to just win me games just <laughs> right, all right, right. the time. And then I <laughs> yeah. played it and just looked at it and said, why? <laughs> <laughs> Not that it's a particularly bad card. I was just expecting more. Yeah. I was talking about this. I've had this conversation with a couple of people, but I feel like we're in a um, Prison of Yogg-Saron debate with uh, Wisdom Ball right now. Okay. Oh, sure. Yeah. Fine. Fine. Yeah. Plus one damage to the board. Nice. Great job. <laughs> um, 
where, you know, Prisoner of the Oxaron, people will play it in situations where they're miles behind on board and the first charge doesn't save them and they go, well, this card's trash, why would I ever put it in my deck, kind of mm. thing. Um, whereas it's an investment card, right? Where you the, the value in it comes with just the accrued value of what you pay for it initially, where you get to use the multiple charges over... Uh, alternate turns. Yeah, yeah. Which I think is the same thing with Wisdom Ball. A lot of people like assess it of like they play the Cadgar and then they want the first Wisdom Ball to just do something incredible and blow the game out of the water and it just doesn't work like that, well, right? It's a six mana investment to get a lot more than six mana's worth of stuff over the course of the game. Yeah, and also if you take this current game situation out of it and say you play Cadgar and then for the next X turns, depending if it survives the whole way, sure. You are gaining Ice Barrier into Counterspell into Ice Barrier into Counterspell. That's yeah. quite a good card, right? It's if you just said that to yeah. someone, that is pretty yeah. powerful. It's just yeah. in a lot of these situations, you don't, you neither need nor want these Ice Barriers and Counterspells. Uh, so that's the only tricky thing is it doesn't necessarily play the exact way you want it to. But I agree, as a raw value card, it is good. It's very strong. So I suspect, obviously you can never quite get in tune with the Yala, but I suspect that uh, rewind sequencing there, he was maybe looking for another cryo, so mm. he could try and go down the excavate line, keep freezing out the opponent, because uh, these freezes are very effective. Ooh, Worth remembering, power. by the way, mm. that uh, Weeku does have access to Reno to unfreeze, if that will become relevant on uh, any of these upcoming turns. Oh yeah, this is what I like to see, get that fireball thrown in. Coin ping. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, coin. Coin inf infinitized does seem more sensible. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> that is going to be overdraw, right? For the next turn? I can count. Uh, for Yala, yeah, 10 cards yeah. in hand right now. And here comes the reset, as you mentioned. New hero means a uh, new unfrozen swing coming in. Oh, oh, oh is, is Yala amplified, actually? Yala's probably amplified by this point, so he's, he's probably okay. He's got 11 hand space. Oh, yeah, sorry. He, he, turned, he started with that, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've been seeing so many secrets and everything, I uh, completely forgot about the first play from Yala <laughs> way back when at the start of this game. Yes, as Lorinda is so gleefully, like, Lorinda noticing is exactly the worst thing in the world. Um, there, It does say 11 mana at the bottom of the screen, which is kind of a dead mm. giveaway. Oh, there's all the armor Ooh! gone from Yala. Oh. <laughs> it's Jive Warrior! <laughs> It's reverb, though. <laughs> <laughs> Could play so, the board. Uh, we reverb the rag, and then we find some way to generate a copy of uh, Criminal Lineup. Is that what that card's called? We point it at a minion, and it makes a bunch of copies of it. Yeah, uh, and then you still can't do that because you're under a Reno this turn, so you yes. can't actually make a bunch of copies. Reverb ping, and then hit the 4-8. Easy. <laughs> I think it might be next game time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Yala's uh, that, that, that's it's what's... down to 80, though. It's pretty good going. <laughs> it's a good effort. They only had, what, 50 more health than they started with. It's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I think Mage is one of those decks, though, where you sit there and think, but I've still got a chance. Because it can generate so many cards, as we can see now with Infinitize again. It can, it, it kind of has infinite Ooh. damage, if you think about it that way. Found the Cryo. Yeah. The Titan Dream is alive. <laughs> All we need to do is continue to freeze WeQ every turn and discover a Titan that immediately wins us the game. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. More freeze, okay. <laughs> oh. Gonna go 
for it. Hold. Yeah, Zola, hang on a minute. Uh huh. Uh huh. Is this a two turn Sif <laughs> setup? <laughs> yeah, so now we go Sif, Reverb, dump all of our burn, Zola, our Sif, and then we have a Sif in our hand that does absolutely nothing because yeah. we've got no burn left. Hooray! Make more burn. <laughs> Easy. God, just download more burn. <laughs> yeah. Okay, creation comes out. There is the artificer now as well. So there's some levels of defense with the combination of artificer and freeze. Got coin maxitude again, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Cry preservation again? No. Yeah, you know, I can't even look at another ice barrier today. Got to be Sanitize one of the most. says armor on it. Yeah, that's got to be one of the most annoying Reno hero powers to see is they discover a spell because you just think, ugh. <laughs> You're trying to keep mental track of what you've dealt with so far, and it's like, oh, never mind. Straight out the window. And easily cleaned up, of course. I think that was one of the least efficient trial by fires I've ever seen in my life, and it just does not matter. <laughs> Just one, two, and three into a three, four. That was your turn. Okay. Two, four, fours threatening some damage. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you are just threatening. It's lethal. Now. Yeah. Get this first Sif down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Raven strat here would definitely just be play the Sif, chuck all of your damage at face. Hear me we'll out. Figure the rest of it out later. Hear me out. I've got a new plan. Tempo Sif, freeze, yep. and hope there's no removal, and then go the turn after. What? We, what? How, what? <laughs> the weapon kills it. Freeze. Stuff. With with what? Look, Sleep something. Skater only does minions. Something. Yeah, you have to, okay. <laughs> I'm trying to think of it out, okay? Hey! See? Freeze. So that's three. Yep. Do we infinitize to look for a fourth one and dump a snake oil or something? Infinitize has to be worth more than a snake oil, right? Yeah, I mean, I just don't think you're getting there with any kind of combo burn plan, right? Mm. Like, your goal is to actually outvalue the warrior somehow, which only really comes through... More excavates, I would imagine. Like, honestly, wh whatever line you're saying is winning the game, you are coping extra hard. <laughs> like, <laughs> and that's the way I, I like be, it. I want to be very clear <laughs> about that from the offset. These lines don't win, but we have to pretend. Or else, what are we even doing here? What's this all been for, Ray? I ask myself that often, honestly, so. <laughs> So is Yala right now. All of these years doing this, and you can't even afford an internet connection. <laughs> so, what, what Come on, I'm doing for? my best here. I've literally <laughs> got in my car and drove to another location to be able to cast. I am, dear viewers, so very literally kicking a man while he's down right yeah. now. Like, I am under no illusions that I am the bad guy here. Or mm. no illusions that I'm the good guy here. I am definitely the bad guy here. It's fine, just wait. Saul's moving up to near where I live. <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> you didn't have to dox me! Jeez! <laughs> yeah. Come on! Yeah. Uh, Scotland. Yep, that's right. Okay, some more levels of defense here. Ooh. Is that Zola on the slate? Oh no, okay. Okay, y'all have seen fatigue. You've seen it out. <laughs> I'm not sure he is. 
He's about to see a huge hammer, though. 35. Oh. So, nice. <laughs> Bonk. <laughs> nice, n- nice casual 70 that turn. Oh, oh I like no, it. Se- 76, 76, <laughs> yeah, my mistake. Note it down. Note it down for the stats. Wow. Uh, that was a rough one. Um, not the way you want to. Oh, no. That's not Yala. Mm-hmm. No. 50 50. Unlucky. <laughs> <laughs> lost the coin flip um, uh, yeah a really rough game there game one for Yala taking the loss in, in that fashion because obviously he tried to stick around and fight as we said mage can generate so many resources that you do want to give yourself a chance but Wiku was just just chilling all game there let's be honest once we got you know past turn five or so it was pretty clear that everything was going well and all week you had to do was not mess up and uh, he did that very very well taking a uh, game one and off to a great start in this series and I do wonder what this does to Yala in terms of like, okay, I lost earlier today and now game one went like that. Something must be creeping in thinking maybe today is just not my day. Yeah, and I think um, Wiki, who I don't think had the best performance in his first on-stream series of the day, I think put in a very solid performance there. Obviously, in terms of games you are going to play at this level, that was one of the easier ones to win. But still, all the way up until the end, he was locked in a very frustrating time loop where he was just getting frozen every single turn, couldn't end the game. He had the Odin down, so Yala knew as soon as as soon as you have one turn where you're unfree, uh, unfrozen, you're going to end up um, having lethal. But Weeku had to preserve two things. One, enough damage in hand that you could OTK, because mm-hmm. you might only get one turn where you can attack, and then they'll start discovering freeze again and start locking you down again, right? So make sure that you can OTK with the Wind Fury when you get there. But also, secondly... Because we saw the cryo into discovered cryo and like the rewind attempt for cryo, it was also somewhat clear that Yala was trying to find some kind of value line. Right. So at the same time, Weak U has to be like, okay, make sure I have a removal card, right? A sanitize in my hand. So if suddenly Titan a Titan comes down out of nowhere or some discovered legendary or anything else, I have the ability to like clear one crazy board that comes down. Because the other win condition there for Yala is to find some way of doing that. Like Mage Excavate Reward, get a Titan in play, freeze the face all in the same turn, something like that, right? And then maybe that board presence will help you right. get over the line with uh, then Sif and Reverb and two Snake Oils as a follow-up the turn after. But WeQ had that covered the entire time as well because any board that was going to come down was going to get sanitized in that spot anyway. So I think great job from WeQ overall, just yep. covering all the bases. And Yala did what he had to do. He stuck in there. He did the hard grind. But I think, like you say, come probably turn six or seven, he probably had a pretty good idea he wasn't winning that game. Well, we're quickly moving on to game number two, and it's going to be Demon Hunters as far as the eye can see. Uh, Yala going first, getting the uh, salesman down. And it has a bit of a uh, slower looking hand, but with both players having instrument techs available, you know this game's going to get uh, get awfully quick, awfully fast. Indeed, Wiki with a interesting discover choice there as well. Metamorphosis and Three Felon Flames, both pl- both cards that uh, tick the pick the one that's in your deck test, right? Because they are both played in yeah. uh, in various lists. Uh, just checking to see. Yep, there is a Metamorphosis in Wiki's deck as well as the Three Felon Flames. So I- actually had to make a genuine decision on that front. Yeah, and I think I, I like the decision, even though I like meta, it's in this matchup feels like it could just sit in your hand and be way too slow. Uh, whereas through Fell and Flames, I do feel like you're going to get pretty much guaranteed use out of it one way or another. Not even now paying off for itself, now being able to trade these down. And although the early board advantage, I feel, isn't the end of the world here for Yala, you know, losing that board advantage, you would still rather be pressuring than not, right? Uh, worth notes, uh, noting as well the difference in the two decks. Yala is playing the more recent development uh, with the Blind Eye Sharpshooter version of the deck, making room for some spells and a few extra Nagas in there as well, like playing Slither Spear, for example, just to try and get that extra damage. Whereas WeQ has been playing um, the list that has been fairly well consolidated for quite some time now with a uh, card like Posic thrown in there as well, the Metamorphosis going down swinging. Um, just a more straight-ahead, shopper-focused version right. of the deck, just with uh, outright damage cards thrown in there on top. And do you think with the nerf announced for the weapon that we're going to see more of this sharpshooter uh, if if people continue to play this overall style of Demon Hunter? 
Yeah, I don't know. Um, like, I haven't, because obviously I've been very focused on, like, not like, the next the meta, meta that we yeah. have for this tournament. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like, I haven't really thought about it too hard, but my, my fear is that both of these decks kind of rely on Umpire's Grasp at all to exist and maybe without umpire's grass like maybe demon hunter just completely falls off a cliff hmm. um but we'll, we'll we'll see that we will here though we're gonna see the initial discover options none of the big hitters that you're really after uh, even though tough crowd's pretty good it's not really one you want in the three slot and also it's not the one you want when you there's nothing to react to right normally you want to do that as a reaction to something your opponent's done uh, but yeah. not really the case here for Yala. Ugh. Okay. I was going to say, this is going to be one of those uh, delayed shoppers, I guess, just being able to deal with the 6 2. Yeah. Yeah, I think the uh, the turn four, when you're. So when you don't. When you're not on coin and you go coin uh, Umpire's Grasp. Obviously, then you want to curve out really fast. If you are just playing your weapon naturally on three, there's not a great deal of difference in a lot of scenarios from going three mana window shopper plus your one mana guy on four to playing your three mana window shopper, your one mana guy on five, and then also having the one mana available to play right, your one right. mana discover on five anyway, right? Like the turn you play your first Magtheridon, which is the good one that you're looking for is the same either way, yes. right? So if you're, if you're faced with that scenario, um, it's quite often better to just clear up the board in front of you to not fall too far behind on tempo, particularly on in the mirror, I think. There are downsides, of course, because if you play the, the three-cost shopper and the one-cost shopper on turn four, you can hit Magtheridon on either of those slots and then play that Magtheridon on turn five, whereas doing it the way that's one turn delayed, you have to hit the one-mana Magtheridon specifically right. to be able to get it down in play. You know, second Empire's Grasp here coming out from Yala. Yala pretty low on the old health here, but double Hunter Secret for this turn only. It's going to be... Um, oh, or not. Okay, I kind of always expect an attack to proc one of those, but hey, it's possible. 6-5 Inquisitor looks pretty yeah. huge here. Going to go hey, window shopping again. Minute. And again, uh, the Magtheridon, I don't want to call games too early, but if this is Magtheridon in this position, I feel like it it does end it a lot of the time, just because the health Yal is on, but it is not. Tough crowd reroll. Okay, hold on, okay. Is this... Oh, no, there isn't... Yeah, is this... Tough crowd, the hold for the um oh I forget the name, the lifesteal taunt, maybe. Uh oh abyssal basis, like yeah. if Yala were to get it. Exactly, because he's about to swing, so he's gonna probably get another shopper and could actually shopper into the abyssal, right? Okay. Just just a thought, that's all. Just bouncing yeah. like the uh the one one back really gain him too much this turn. Not sure. Just because the three cost Illidar is right there. So if you draw something cheap, you can actually get rid, bounce, and then go for the Illidari, maybe. Mm -hmm. Wow. I'm not going to see any Magtheridons in this one. Yeah, one this is the roll. weird part about this deck, right? Like, if, oh, you, go. if you took this deck, this mirror, this game, and then like showed it to an alien, and were like, okay... This is the deck that large portions of the community complain about as being too strong. You, they just wouldn't believe you, right? Because both of these decks seem to be doing nothing currently. But this right. but the now. difference between hitting, <laughs> hitting Magtheridon and not hitting Magtheridon yeah. is pretty huge sometimes, as you are now seeing. What is that? Six, seven, nine. It's a good amount of damage, but just slightly off. Yep. Ten as far as I can see it. Can do nine with the umpire's grasp instead, which is probably just worth. Yeah, I think so. Just push right, and then there's still damage potentially with second swing, the one drop, and uh, and even just hero power next turn. Exactly. Yeah. 
even if there's a bit of healing, there's there's a lot of damage to be able to push through any life steal, or at least the the non major life steal. We do see there's eye in Yala's hand, so if Yala can uh, beef up some attack, yeah, you kind of want to have enough mana to be able to have a sharpshooter turn and get the momentum cheap, right, and then be able to yeah. play eye. But that's just infinite also, manner in this position. hitting the eye off the big shopper as well it's that, it's that thing there are certain ones you want off certain shoppers yeah yeah ba bassist and illidari inquisitor can be good off the six five or almost never good off the one one yeah. um and then like the the temporary secrets can sometimes be good off the one one but it's never good off the six five really like there's there's a few out but really it's just magtheridon you just want to hit <laughs> but, but, but really at the end time. of the day <laughs> Magtheridon. Yeah. Oh, even the cane being pe picked up as well. Yeah, I, I did like the tough crowd hold. It never really came into play, but you could definitely see the scenarios where just a bounce would just win win we queue the game straight off the bat. So he won anyway, of course, didn't need it in the end. Uh, but still, I do like the way uh, they approach that game uh, going on there. So we queue going very quickly to a 2 0 lead. Are we just going to see a, a quick 3-0 today as opposed to the uh, the slower one you were involved in earlier? Yeah, very possibly. Uh, I guess one final piece of ab, just in case anyone needs this box ticking who are watching. In case anyone was thinking like Illidari Inquisitor, tough crowd, the Illidari Inquisitor back to your own hand. The issue with that play is backwards zone transitions, so board to hand, re remove all enchantments. So it'd go back to being an eight mana full value in, in Illidari Inquisitor in hand after you do that. It'd be too expensive to do any kind of combo stuff with the, uh, the Inquisitor and the tough crowd. So I think... Uh, Raven is probably not far off the money in terms of weak. You just wanted to hold that as a more defensive option if you needed it. Yeah, especially because the, uh, the the sort of mana and, and turn time uh, they were playing with, it, there aren't that many draws in the deck that wouldn't mean that he couldn't empty it right and be able to have the outcast uh, effect. So it was just pretty likely to have that option that's pretty flexible. But now just looking at this, 2-0 for Wiki, only needs one more win. And it's going to be that Warlock that's left over. So um, of course, as we know, guess what? If you 2-0 up, you're pretty favored in the matchup at any given point. But in terms of just Warlock versus um, the decks that are on, on display here for Yala, are there any tough matchups for this Warlock? Is there any ones that you think Weeku could really struggle uh, getting over the hunt with? First off, did I miss a memo? Because that's you're now the second caster to say it's good to be 2-0 up in a series. Which I didn't even hear it because I've been busy doing other things. So I, I'm not okay. even cop I don't even know who the other caster was, put it that way. Okay, fair enough. Um, but in answer to your question, yeah. So Custom Warlock, Pain Warlock, whatever you want to call it, is... It can be quite polarized in terms of matchups, right? Like, if you face against a deck that can fairly regularly just go, oh, okay, here's 12 damage from hand, you're in trouble, right? Because most of your game plan involves putting yourself down to 12 incredibly quickly, or else your right. deck does very little. Um, and it's not even like the deck plays... Like, Classic Handlock would go down very low, but then they could taunt their Molten Giants with some Fury or Defender of Argus mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, that's not a thing this deck really does either. You sometimes get some reborn taunts from Symphony of Sins. So like Demon Hunter, for example, with just a weapon with some buffed attack going face with momentum. Or an that Inquisitor. Will, that, <laughs> that, or an Inquisitor, yeah. Those things will kill you, you know, like because you just have to lower your health so low. Uh, one thing I do find interesting, and yes, it's right there in the mulligan, is that Weeku is playing two copies of Felstring Harp, which yeah. is not something... So, it is something you see, but I think it's something that is fairly well uh, agreed upon to not be a good choice. Like, it sort of makes sense in your head, but then it's a card that you never really want to play because you do want to spend so much of the early game doing damage to yourself, right? So if it's a card that if you draw early, it sits dead in your hand for a very, very long time. It's really only useful as, like, a late-game recovery tool, I mm. guess. Um, yeah. And also, his, his Ziliac setup does not have lifesteal on it, which is the other thing I find really interesting about his uh, his custom warlock. Yeah, most it's... people have some variety of classic Ziliacs with the lifesteal on there in this deck. Yeah, it was it's surprising to the extent for just a second when I saw the harp, I was like, wait, this, I thought it was playing this deck, right? I was just like, wait, I'm, that's how much like you're not used to seeing the harp in the build anyway. Uh, but yeah, I'm excited to see uh, more of this warlock and uh, see how it can perform. Oof. 
a harp early again. It's just not something that Miku really wants to see right now. So he's going to tempo out the two one drops though and get pretty aggressive, which is exactly what you want to do against this priest. You want to be ahead on board and you want to trade them down very quickly. Look at this juxtaposition of Hearthstone cards, by the way. Like, one mana card deals three damage to yourself is a class card, versus one mana card is a neutral, has six different varieties of upside when it dies, and they just <laughs> trade one for one with each other. Like, what? what is Miracle Salesman? Does anyone know? <laughs> you, have to, you have to buy the, uh, the goods to find out. Ah, oh, okay, yeah, fair enough. It's a it's a really funny deck to watch because you know Zoo from Warlock has been around since the dawn of time, uh, but playing such a Ooh. weak cards, just like the Geode, for example, of it's a very good card, but just as a sort of when you look at this deck in a sort of Zoo style, it's a two one for two, which is not normally what you want to be playing out, especially compared to the old days. But yeah, still very powerful, getting those card draws and double Speaker Stomper, probably going to be traded if need be in the near future. I'm going to be honest, I don't know what you were just talking about because I saw a pip copying a Crimson Clergy and a Funnel Cake and I'm real excited. <laughs> That's this all Saul needs to know. Like to do. Yep. <laughs> I, I um, Honestly, this is the first time I've seen a Funnel Cake in, in my life because I just can't draw it. I just, I'm have you ever seen one in like real life? I think we were talking about this on the reveal stream. I haven't. Sure I'll be honest. Me. I don't even know what one is. I learned yeah. about Funnel Cakes from Hearthstone. Oh my god! God, calm down, I need a calm lie down. down. No, <laughs> look how weak. So does weak. <laughs> yeah, correct. It's just <laughs> over. It's just over. Oh no! Actually, no real effective way to spend one mana here, which is annoying. Yeah, rope angler. Okay. So the interesting thing, if you spent one mana here and then played the Funnel Cake and then you drew your other natural Funnel Cake that's left remaining in the deck... Uh, you draw your you deck? Can, yeah, <laughs> then you can have very, very exciting times. Um, projectionist, actually, Projectionist is probably wanting to be used more on a Drifter at this point. So I was thinking if you still had the mana available, you could go Projectionist and get another Cleric and then if you drew Funnel Cake, but that doesn't do anything. Like, three three Clerics yeah, is the right yeah. number to have anyway, so you do probably want to hold on to it and look for Drifters instead. This makes sense. I weirdly found the um, the Celestial, like, one of the weirder cards to use in this deck. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's not it feels like it should be a straightforward card. Make a copy of your best card. But a lot of the times you have to make weird decisions about what you're copying and when. Um, and I found it definitely Ooh. wasn't as straightforward as I thought. There's the Zilli Axe, though. It can help a little bit. So you can go Speaker Stomper, Zilli Axe, or you can go Forge of Wills, copy something, Zilli Axe. Neither of those things seem particularly powerful. You can actually forge of will Ziliax. Yeah, I was going to say, you can copy the Ziliax. Yeah. yeah. You just don't get the discount that way. It doesn't actually end up mattering. Unless you wanted to play the harp, which, as we already discussed, mm. you probably don't at this point. Yeah, I think. Does it, does it not have to be copy the, the Ziliax here just for something that can kill stuff? <laughs> like, I think it's Stomper Ziliax, honestly. Really? I, yeah. At this point, what's this? What, what's the Stomper really stomping? I like just for the stats, right? Like it's a very similar amount of stats to what you're getting with the Forge, anyway, right? Yeah, but you can kill something now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that yeah. is the upside for sure. Yeah. Okay, well, Wiku's fighting back. Uh, still going to be a tough one because Yala has all the options in the world right now because of the sheer volume of card draw that has been made available to him this game. But Wiku's not just dead yet. Still got time, no. and there are some big well, draws but, from this deck. But that's 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 the thing, Raven. Like you say that as if it's a good thing. That's actually a major downside. Like Wiku has failed to do massive amounts of damage to himself this game. That's actually a problem because now most of the cards that he can draw just aren't very good off the top. Hmm. With Forge, though, Forge can dig him out of some awkward situations. There's a chance. Not, 
Yeah, it's not active next turn, though, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, what, do you think he's dead next turn? No, no, no. no. Yeah. By no means am I saying Weeku's in a good spot. I'm just saying it's not completely dire. I think the Forge Ziliax was needed at that turn, you know, to even remotely survive. Are we not uh, synchronizing our opponent's Ziliax? We are synchronizing our opponent's Ziliax. Okay. This was the line that made sense to me. Yeah. And now suddenly with that Ziliax copied, it's a big ask, isn't it, now? Just with the sheer actually amount of stats on the board, I kind of didn't really factor in copying the Ziliax for the plus stats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The debate was whether to use the finale, I think, on the synchronize. That was sure. the most difficult thing to work out as to whether you wanted extra stats on yours in exchange mm -hmm. for extra stats on theirs. Okay. Symphony. Hit the good one. That's huge. That was necessary. Yes. Absolutely necessary. And now think, Forge is active. Any route. Yes. Forge is active and also that clear did six extra damage to weak you, which is great if you're weak you. <laughs> How Hearthstone has evolved. <laughs> yep. It's it's like always draws five minions without fail. One. It's never actually drawn a spell. Oh, it has. I could tell just from Weeku's response. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, well, why are you bad at Hearthstone? Imagine drawing yes! spells with Magatha. <laughs> you know this. You've seen me play. Yeah, yeah. Even though a lot of value, still just a, it's a decent amount of refill, but I guess the problem here is it's starting to step into Titan territory, right? Like the the sheer volume of card draw and just the mana available means that Yala can start really pressuring in the next turn, maybe even just win with them with the extra turn. Exactly, yeah. I think this is the problem with this matchup is that if you yeah. aren't incredibly dominant incredibly quickly, you get two turned so quickly because you're so low the entire game. Yeah, and Speaker Stomper's not really going to help with that either. Nope. Zero mana 5-5, five, five, Will, though. Yeah, with the Forge. Yep, and Freeze one of the freeze. others as well to help. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when it's not working, it looks like the worst deck you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> yeah. The first time I played that Trient, I just sat and asked myself a question of, am I actually playing this card? Yeah. Just a it's weird like... weird feeling because... to just sit and go, I'm just dealing five damage to make a 2-2 two -two to myself. No, no, that's the thing. You're not dealing damage. It doesn't even work with Imprisoned Horror, and it still makes the cut. Because you oh, don't deal sure. damage. Yeah, yeah, it's just you, it's health. You pay yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. it literally doesn't work with half of the payoff cards in your deck, and you yeah. still play it. it That's it's how not weird a flame it imp, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And there's the extra turn, and I think damage adds up. <laughs> Boop. Already locked Boop. in. Boop. Well, we do know about this match is that Yala is not going to be swept. Priest gets a win there, and as you said, we saw the uh, the weaker side to this custom warlock. Yeah, no trolling from Yala there that time. I'm not sure if uh, what it was at the end of last series, but he had a Zarimi turn where he had like six damage over already just by playing Zarimi, and he went through a full turn like playing other minions and then <laughs> playing funnel cake and drawing cards. Sometimes you've got to be sure. Sometimes yeah. you've got to be sure. <laughs> but that time. Just jams the Zarimi, deals the damage, nice and efficient, easy as pie, and Yala is going to make his way back into the series. Um, I actually, like, I believe in Custom Warlock. I, I've played a good amount of it. I think it's an incredibly powerful deck. Um, it might be that same nostalgia bait, though, where, like, I'm saying I like Zarimi Priest because it reminds me a little bit of Naga Priest, and that was awesome. Um, maybe I just like Custom Warlock because it reminds me of Handlock, and that's like the deck I spent basically the entire first two years of Hearthstone playing until Patron Warrior came out, and then I played that for like six days or however long they let it live before they nerfed it into the ground. Um, so I'm a big fan of the Custom Warlock. I think it's absurdly powerful. I do think it's very fragile. Like, I think there are metagames that exist where it would be completely unplayable. Oh, yeah. 
Um, but I don't think that meta is now. I especially, I especially don't think that meta is this tournament. I think, I think Custom Warlock could actually mm. put some work in in the this. Um, so we'll see. There is something weirdly satisfying about bringing your own health total to near death and then saying, "I win." <laughs> right? It is. It's a because. It, like you said, outside of exactly Handlock, and this deck accelerates it way faster than old Handlock used to, it's not really a game plan that has ever existed in Hearthstone to say, I'm going to keep yeah. hitting myself in the face, and it's a good thing, right? So but yeah, it's definitely a also, cool deck to try out. I think this deck feels even more reckless and even braver than Handlock did, right? Because... And look, you'd get your Molten Giants down, you'd get your Mountain Giants down, and then you'd go, okay, here's my Defender of Argus, you can't kill me this turn, now I'm going to start heal botting or whatever and right. boost my health total back up behind this wall of taunts. Custom Warlock doesn't play any taunts and does not really play that much healing. You basically put yourself down to 10 HP and then you just stay there and say, <laughs> and you come just on. say, that's enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, just try and hit me from this point. And a lot of decks just can't which is really yeah. really strange which is why i say like there are certain meta games where no that, that like this just wouldn't be able to exist because if if every deck in the format could do 10 damage from hand it would basically be unplayable now right. speaking of <laughs> here we go with warlock versus mage yes decks that can deal 10 damage pretty easily and it's something that Wiku is going to have to deal with because it's not like the uh, the harp is is going to save him in this scenario, right? This feels like one of the matchups where you go all in, you bring yourself down, splurge all your minions onto the board, and then kill them quick because if you don't, you are dead. Keeping hold of the fracking though, do you like this? Do you think this shows the uh, the desperation of hitting a good curve in this matchup? There is very, very little to do on turn one in this deck. It's flame imp or bust a lot of the time, so I don't mind holding on to fracking in order to have a look. Uh, you know, you're not going to play harp on one most of the time. You don't want to play shard on one. So just for the upside of finding yourself a curve and also sometimes you hit furnace fuel and you're just having a really good time, right, if you're fracking into furnace yeah. fuel on turn one. so I'm okay with it. Now, is this a matchup where we're going to see Coin come out nice and early here? It could be Artificer with Geyser. It could be the audio. There are options, and there's a, there's a lot of cheap mana to spend here. You know, a lot of two costs in hand from Yala. So I think trying to grab the board in some way, shape, or form early is going to be a real benefit. And I know Yala's very value-based, but I see value in winning. Oh, it's going to hold. Okay. It's an AFK turn two, not really what you're looking for. As you mentioned, obviously this is a scary matchup to play because the mage can just chuck a bunch of burn at you. It's not necessarily a bad matchup for the warlock, just a difficult one to navigate. If, if, yeah. Again, if you can get huge minions down very early with forge, like just get two or three eight eights into play early, that's not really something that mage is equipped to deal with, as unless they get to turn five turn six right turn six probably um, mm. because even if they just sleet skate to one of your eight eights if you still have two others you're not really that bothered about it right you can right. easily outpace that damage and that that armor gain that they're getting from it um but you do have to start making those big boards very very quickly um, if it does then go to that late game it can be a little bit tricky to to restabilize and not just get burned out at the end of the game even right now obviously there's going to be a card draw between now and then but i'm looking at like flame imp projection forge right you know just to like spam stuff on board for wq because i think uh this matchup's getting just a uh, going a little bit too slow i mean wisdom just for that extra card draw and slowly build up this board yala i guess to no one's surprise taking it slow Oh, I'm going to go speak of something instead. So I'm going to go a little bit taller, a little bit more annoying, instead of going super wide with like flame imps and stuff.
And I think this makes sense because it, it will almost certainly make your opponent have a bad time. Even shuts off any uh, like coin creation possibilities to be able to clear right. this up, which you would be weak against with the uh, slightly smaller, smaller and wider board. And I do like the addition of stompers. I think most people in this tournament have come with some variety of cult neophytes and speaker stompers in their decks. Uh, not necessarily all of them, but just sprinkled throughout. I think most of the pain warlocks do have speaker stompers in there, which I do like as a call in the tournament. Yeah, for sure. And I, I was actually a little bit surprised when I looked at the deck list just to see how many stompers there were, you know, just across all the players. But yeah. the, the more you see these matches play out in this sort of current tournament meta, you see like, okay, Ooh. yeah, fair enough. Oh, did they get the hit. plus six on that? Oh. Yeah, hit it in the right place. Um, but yeah, this we're in a mage matchup right now, but just to go back to the speaker stompers, I think Shaman is one of the biggest yeah. reasons why that exists. People don't necessarily want to ban Shaman. Um, and Shaman is the best deck for Cult Neophyte and Speaker Stomper because they literally tell you when to play it. They hold up a sign <laughs> that says, I am going to burn you with spells next turn. As soon as they play Flash, you play Speaker Stomper, they're probably in a huge mess. So that is something to look out for long term as well, where you might see Shaman players doing things that look strange, not playing Flash on certain terms where it seems really obvious to just play Flash and then go for the lethal because they're trying to play around um, Speaker Stomper long term. Like, do you remember way, 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 way back when the very, very best Freeze Mage players would also find lines that played around Lotheb as well as playing around yeah. everything else? That kind, of, that kind of vibe that you might be seeing a little bit later on in the tournament. Well, week has been pushed off board. Forge is active, which means that board can be built up pretty quickly again. But just the cards are just flimsy, aren't they, right now for week There's none of the uh, the big boys in hand. <laughs> Never mind. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you I, say I, that. okay, yeah, proven wrong instantly. I'm, I love it. I'm gonna call you a liar. I mean, I, I'll take it honestly. I'll accept it. This is it, right? It's kind of the spot I was talking about. You need an answer to this board. And yeah, Sleep Skater can stall out from here, but it's certainly mm. not answering the problem. Ooh, there is Glyph and then deal five from the creation. Maybe Glyph can get him there? Like find a discounted spell from Glyph to at least kill one of the big... Yeah. Ones. Oh, wait, is that Rock in Hand? In that the is Rock in Hand, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you can just use that to at That's least enough. one. That's enough, yeah. So you are trying to work out whether he goes for, like, wisdom first. Because still has the coin available as well, worst case. I'm going to go discovery, okay. It's one of those discovers where you just sit and sort of stare at the cards and go, oh, okay. I think Tide's uh, definitely the best one here. Yep, I'd say good enough for Yala. Good enough. Could have been a lot worse. See what the draws are. There's another Stomper, but not another massive minion to go with it. Like, if that draw was like... Stomper Molten Giant or Stomper Five Five, like something like that. Could it's close with the rock. Incredible turn. Yeah, yeah, but the, the like one saying is the rook could come down anyway, and if you also drew a Molten Giant, yeah, you'd still be yeah, playing yeah, an yeah, entire yeah. Molten Giant alongside that. This <laughs> I do like well. playing extra Molten Giants. Yep. I was going to say, this creation is actually a little bit annoying, isn't it? Because Wiku doesn't want to trade into it, but it is dealing three, which is a pretty significant portion of Wiku's health. It's such a massive number. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go for the uh, copy again. I 
Oh, the Zilliax is a knight. Okay, I didn't. Oh, that was the in Zilliax hand. Was that right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the in hand buff? I didn't even notice. That's huge. Yeah. That could now potentially be a winning card for Yala here. Oh, never mind. You can just play Kaka. Oh, I'll yeah. Kaka Blizzard. Easy. Yeah. yeah, that'll solve the problem. Y'all can get another ice barrier. <laughs> Casual gain 19. As you do. See it. I think that's the lifesteal deal 6, right? If my I think so. recognition is correct. I think so. The speaker stomper, though, it's going to be pretty good. Is there a spirit bomb going to come down as well? <laughs> yeah, spirit bomb is so weird in these spots, right? Because yeah. you're what like, about... well, this game's probably only going one or two more turns. Is it worth hurting myself for four to take three damage mm. off the board? You know? <laughs> like... <laughs> I wanted Spirit Bomb Rook, to be honest. The real play. <laughs> oh, taking the trades as well. I mean, it's a lot of damage Wiku's putting out right now. And Yala yep. with that, that Speaker Stomper is in a tough spot. And again, good timing of Speaker Stomper. Again, all, going all the way back to Lotheb and Neophyte stuff timings. It's like, yeah, this is what you want to do. Build the board. And then cause the trouble. Second Sleet Skater was really the only card that gave Yala a don't have to think about it level mm. good turn here. There is double Artificer in hand though. So that's there something, is, yeah. yeah. I mean, you still then want the spells you're casting to actually affect the board, right? Let's turn the really tides. Not compensating. Turn the tides takes care of the 10 3, uh, which is nice. And you gain 10 more. Or oh, the other line. Oh. It's just hit Blizzard. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Sometimes. Sometimes you've just got to hit Blizzard, you know? <laughs> well, no, it's not that one. It's You don't ping that one because you're hitting Blizzard. What are you doing? That's not how it works. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Wow. Uh, let me do the quick mathematical calculations there. Yes, lethal. That means Wiku takes not only the game, but the match, taking out Yala. And what a win, because I feel like Wiku was on an emotional roller coaster there. Game one, cool, calm, collected with the warrior. And then uh, after a couple wins, started to slip and get a little bit frustrated, I think, at least just based on the camera. But managed to end it with a victory on that Warlock. Congratulations to Wiku as he uh, moves through the group. Uh, what a match, honestly. It was a bit, uh, it looks a bit lopsided in some of the games we cast, but uh, a really exciting series overall. Yeah, Wiku not quite making it to 100 in the Warrior game, I don't think. Very, very disappointing. Not quite making it to zero in the Warlock game. Very, very <laughs> disappointing as well. Must try harder next time. But yeah, I think... We have to give a shout out to Yala, of course. Um, he has bowed out of this one early with WeQ uh, defeating him twice. But it was great to see Yala dipping his toes back into the uh, the very, very top of competition, grinding out those ladder points, making it here after, you know, HGG champion with the Czech Republic, incredibly dominant in probably the toughest field of players to ever exist in European mm -hmm. Grandmasters. Um, so he is absolutely one of the all-time greats at this point. But sometimes it is just not your day. Sometimes someone just has your number, and it looks like today Week You had your number. Yeah, really strong performance for for Week I'm looking forward to how he how he does in the rest of the tournament on Sunday, because uh, again, like being able to just 
dominate an opponent like that, uh, you know, f facing them twice, especially when your opponent's the caliber, as you mentioned, of Yala, is uh, must be making you feel good going into the rest of the tournament, right? If you're going to beat someone, uh, you really do want to beat the best. Uh, so really, really strong performance there from Wiku. Um, and that's how Group A looks like. We've got three more groups left, but for now, Group A is done. And uh, was this the way you saw the group going, so before we started today? Honestly, no. Um, I certainly would have expected Yala to have a deeper run, um, and I kind of fancied you. Um, so I actually would have got this almost entirely wrong <laughs> if I'd have put my neck on the line at the start. But there you go. I'm an honest man uh, that will let you know that I would have got it wrong, even though no one called me on it to begin with. But um, I think both of these players have put in very, very strong performances. I think uh, Wii Q was very shaky in the opening series that we saw, um, where he looked quite frustrated. I, I was going to bring this up with you, because you mentioned there, just towards the end of that series, he started off kind of calm. I looked over at you there to get like a facial reaction, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, how much more you wanted to talk about, and then realized I was talking to a mannequin. Um, where you said, you know, as the series went on, he seemed to get a bit more emotional. He was quite emotional for that whole first series as yeah, well. Yeah. And I don't know if this is just me misremembering. I don't remember him being like this in Worlds. Do you? Like, I felt uh, like he was quite stoic throughout the World Championship. So yeah, this does seem to so. be a little bit of a new side that's coming out. Yeah, again, maybe we just have a shared memory at this point, but I also agree. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I do think um, Wiku seems to be... Again, we're all like that to an extent, but like... Uh, calm when things are going well, but when things aren't, it definitely seems like he's at least visually effective. It might not affect his play in any way, shape, or form, of course. Uh, but regardless, that was us rounding out Group A. There's a whole nother group coming right up, so make sure you stay tuned, and we'll be right back after this break.
Hello everyone and welcome back. We are halfway through the day. We are done with Group A. We've got Group B coming up. But before we get into it, I thought we'd have a bit of a uh, little sit around and chat about how the day has been going so far. So welcome Lorinda Sottle and TJ. Uh, Lorinda, just starting off with you. Um, what did you make of Group A? How, how's it gone for you so far today? Unfortunately, I have to echo Sottle's honesty and say I would have got all that wrong. Just everything would have been <laughs> wrong. Um, yeah, very surprised at how it's. Well, not very surprised. They're all great players, but yeah, Yala and Gyu, two of the best players around, going out of Group A. Uh, yeah, very surprised and interesting to see how the other two make it through on Sunday. And Sottle, as we look at the players in Group B, do you have any uh, standouts? Is there anyone you're rooting for? Or do you think, based on lists or anything, there's anyone that you actually think is favoured going into it? Uh, oh, apologies. Oh, Sottle Missed the first himself. half of that. I was just talking about how great Regvan was. Don't worry about it. But I think everyone he else... He said Raven, had... but... Yeah, how right. great Raven is, yeah. yeah. Um, whereas Gamer <laughs> RVG, the rare America's representative, right? That's got to be worth something for at least some people out Woo! there. Woo! Um, <laughs> Kimchi Slap just has the name buff, right? If you're rooting for someone just based on name, then you've got to be rooting for Kimchi Slap. But also, we've been hearing rumours that Molestar... pretty good position in this tournament and I think Molstar is also incredibly happy with his lineup against the field and in recent tournaments we've seen lineup advantage play a massive factor like yes pocket train is one of the best players in the world the biggest reason why he's our world champion is he had a, such a better lineup than mm -hmm. anyone else in that world championship tournament so I would say real dark horse shout for Molstar in this group and uh, as we see how the uh, first matchups from the group came out, America uh, for the Americas, TJ, is this the time? We heard the, the little yelp, I believe was you. I don't think it was Lorinda. So. No, that was definitely Neil. Definitely Neil. Uh, <laughs> I could see the cameras before. 100%. Yeah. Uh, wasn't me. <clears throat> Are you going to ask if this is the time for Americas? Yeah. Is this the, the finally, after 100 years, is this the time? N no, absolutely not. Um <laughs> I don't think it'll ever be the time again um, is the, the, the sad part of all this. Um, if there ever was going to be close to a time, this, this still wouldn't be it. No, uh, we're going to have to wait a little bit longer to find out. Okay. Um, we'll see. Uh, well, but Kimchi Slap is, is going to take it all. It's all the way. Okay, well, we've got your like. prediction, TJ. Thank you. And thank you, Sotl and TJ, for joining us. It's going to be me and Lorinda taking you through the first match on stream for Group B. So thanks, guys. We'll see you later. But Lorinda, it's just the two of us now. Um, are you ready for this first matchup? It's not the first match of the group, of course. As we saw in the bracket, the initial matches have been played out. But just seeing that bracket, um, how are you feeling about who's left in that upper one? Yeah, I've been doing the same research and comments and reading the same things as Sotl, I think. Um, <laughs> Construct shouted out how Molestar was like the, the god of control. And I had a, a little bit of a back and forth, just quick comments with Stinty um, the other day as well. Stinty was saying that when they used to play collegiate stuff together, when mm -hmm. Molestar was a uh, captain of UCLA, they used to just ban his warrior no matter what. Like It didn't matter what the meta was, just ban uh, Molestar's warrior because that was never wrong. And so Molestar has had that reputation for a while. And the only reason Stinzy says is he didn't really want to talk about Molestar's Warrior too much is because he's not just a, a one-class god. Sure. He's just good at everything in Hearthstone, uh, specifically Control. Yeah, I mean, you know my preferences in Hearthstone since we've known each other quite a while doing this job. Uh, and you know, like, there's nothing more scary to me than someone who's willing to just sit back and play the long game. Uh, that, cause that is a game I do not want to play most of the time. So, uh, yeah, definitely a potentially terrifying opponent with the Odin Warrior, of course, but then the Sith Mage, the Rainbow DK, and the Shudder uh, Shaman as well. So um, Rainbow DK, definitely a deck I am personally a fan of. Uh, I like it's, uh, how flexible it is, but I know you've been sort of uh, going through deck by deck of the meta. Uh, I've been watching the stream uh, recently, and uh, what, what decks have really stuck out for you in this meta specifically? Uh, whether they're strong or whether they just think you, you, you know you enjoy them. 
I mean, custom warlock is the most fun. You just sit there and <laughs> hope it works. Like it's great. You don't have to. Th well, you do have to think it's actually quite hard and balanced. But you know, the, the meme and the way you can play it is just shut your eyes, play your stuff, take your damage, and see what happens. Um, really, quite like the look of priest, except when it does its thing. I think it's a little bit too powerful when it does its thing. Hmm. And I love, I absolutely love nature shaman, and I absolutely love um, window shopper as a card. Although I do like reducing it multiple times, which you shouldn't do, but it's fun. <laughs> so I, th I think we've got a lot of fun cards, a uh, little bit of balancing to do, I guess, but yeah, we, we've got a lot of things, and DK's not one of those, Raven. I know you like the DK, but DK for me... I like uh... it. Um, take a look at Requiem, though, and the lineup overall. Uh, I was jamming some games of this uh, this Rogue uh, just you know a little bit early today and, and while I've been messing around on, on a break or whatever, and it's another one of those decks that... I think on surface level looks like it's oh you just go all in you know you do, you do the shuffle go all in hope it works if it doesn't you lose if it does you win great but I do think there's been many times in Hearthstone's history where decks have looked like that and then you watch really good players play the deck and you're like oh it's just that I'm bad right and I think that's something hopefully we'll get to see from Rekvam um as of course this is a winner's match which means uh, even the loser of this match just drops down into the bracket and isn't actually eliminated so even worst case uh, we'll be able to see Rekvam play a little bit more so I'm excited to see this rogue just because personally I haven't run into it too much on ladder like now and again it's not super common at least for me uh, and I do want to see you know how it can perform at, at the highest levels of play which is definitely where we're at in this tournament yeah, a lot of these decks, uh, you make your percentages in the games where it doesn't do its thing. Like, anyone can win when they play four eight eights on turn two or whatever <laughs> right. it does. It does something like that. I know it's something like that. Close enough. Uh, it's near enough, right? But um, how do you eke it out? How do you buy yourself an extra turn in the, the matchups where it doesn't do that, the days where it doesn't do that? Same for a lot of the decks in the meta, like you said. Like, with the Priest, the Priest is probably the most mind-breaking deck when you just have one cleric, one dragon, and a Zeremi. It's like, do I want to draw cards? Do I need to copy the dragon? What do I need to do? Right. Um, and the rogue definitely falls into this category. I want, I want to see somebody like Rekvam, who I think really likes this deck as well. I don't know how much he's memeing about it. It's always hard to tell, but I think he really likes this deck. I want to see how he does with it. It's going to be interesting. Yeah, I, I think a, a deck style like this with this rogue is, is a deck you bring because you enjoy it. Because I, I don't think it's one of the most powerful decks in the game right now. I, I definitely don't. Uh, but it has the ability to just snatch games, right? And I think that is that is a powerful factor by itself. Like if you just say, "Okay, I'll go into a match and then just pop off," and then you just you do get one of those games where you just you know turn three or four, you've just got two, three, eight drops. You're like. Yeah, okay, I win 1-0. That's a, that's a nice deck to have in your back pocket, especially if you're playing these sort of high-pressure uh, scenarios, uh, which means you maybe just want something that you can just maybe grab a little bit of a, yeah, a couple of quick wins with. So, yeah, looking forward to this match as we are going to get into it right now. It's going to be the Rogue on the bottom with Rekvam, of course, and then on the top, Molestar, going to be on that Rainbow DK. So, uh, yeah, we'll see how this one pans out because I... Literally played this matchup about two hours ago, where that was just before I needed to start casting stuff. And, you were getting uh, I got, very excited. I got dumpstered by the uh, the DK because I was the rogue because of the likes of crop rotation with poison, right? And yeah. like you know, there's DK has many ways to deal with big threats, um, and if you can make too many of them, that can be a bit of a problem. But DK isn't one of those decks right now that just. Oh, if they make three eight eights, I've lost. They they definitely can fight back right. and win. Yeah, I will say one thing about DK. I mean, I've said a lot of things about DK negatively, <laughs> although it has slowly but surely tightened up the list. I think they've got rid of some of the um, things that tried to be aggressive and just made it a full on combo uh, control deck now. Um, but you do have versatility with the deck. You have a lot of options with the deck. I'm not going to claim that all the options are always good. Um, particularly on ladder when I'm, when I'm ripping into <laughs> decks like this. Obviously, these <laughs> players bring them because they think they're the right decks to bring. But um, you do have choices to make, and it is reasonably tough to actually play. Yeah, this will be interesting from Molestar because there is an option to just forge this Watcher uh, or just tempo it out because, again, the, the Rogue's removal generally comes in the form of either the weapon and a little bit of a buff, um, or 
dropping these, just having more stuff, right? Having the A8s on board and then maybe sticking some uh, little robots to them to give them rush. So there's not really tons of removal outside of uh, a couple of specific scenarios. So do you see Molstar actually go for the forge though and go for a little bit of that, the higher value play instead of just the raw tempo? Yeah, Molstar with a thread as well, which always clears the board. It's not defiled, yes. it, just cle it just kills everything. Like, everything dies. Honestly, this is going to make me sound bad, but I don't think people will be surprised. If I ever need to use threads, I don't even count. I I've tried counting, make stuff, it's not possible. click threads, trade, the board's clear. <laughs> that's that's how I view that card. I don't even count. Sometimes that has caused me to lose games, but most of the time, yeah, you don't need to count. It's great. I've sat there playing oh. against it on on stream, and my, my chat saying you don't need to count. Going, yeah, they haven't cleared my board this time, have they though? And then my board yeah. vanishes. I'm like, where did it go? Like it, it just always clears. Looking at the hand now from All Star, there's Headless Horseman and there's Light Bomb. And it's turn three, and there aren't 800 big minions on board for Rec Fam. So, this is one of those games, as far as I'm concerned, uh, yep. Lorinda. The shuffle's not been done. The, you know, the threats aren't really there. Can Rec Fam pull something out of the bag? Or is Molstar just going to secure this one? Because honestly, if you drop more and pour now, there's not that many ways it's going to get dealt with. And then the options become endless. The only thing to consider is if Rec Fam is managed to actually pop off now, then he yeah. might be able to get the board big enough. Although I'll be honest, my screen There's clock rotation up, threads as well, which should clear most things up. There we go. Yeah. I also have the same issue as you. I think, Raven. Yeah. yeah. I'm good. I refreshed. I'm back in. Oh, okay, cool. You, you go then, because I'm, I'm... Okay, yeah, hit refresh, you'll be fine. But yeah, at the moment, Rekfam drew Cult Neophyte again. Just none of the card draw that's needed. None of the ways to actually go off. There is weapons. We could equip weapon and go for the card draw if he feels that desperate. Uh, of course, the other side of this is, yes, we can see the light bomb, but Rekfam isn't exactly dying right now. There's Monpar and then there's the, the yeah. Salesman, of course. So it's not like... Most are setting up lethal on turn four, right? But you do want to rip and get cooking, because as you mentioned, the more time goes on, the more you are opening up yourself to like crop rotation with threads or crop rotation with poison. Um, I, I always forget the name of the card that gives them uh, poison, but you know. Oh, it's um, yeah, sickly grime walker. That one. believe. How do you summon an undead? Give it poisonous. Yes, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was uh, typing. Was Trot Viper going to go down as well to lose some of the draw, which is a little bit unfortunate. Requiem didn't get value from that, but there's gear shift. That is something. It's not great, but it's something. It's more card draw than literally none. <laughs> yeah, some is more than none. That's but honestly, with this deck, so it's very true as well. With this deck, you want any card draw at this kind of scenario, <laughs> right? Like, just anything to try and get the shuffle going. Yeah, this hand has been pretty atrocious as well. Break down. Oh, quick pick. Oh, my. Okay, can give it stealth. That's something. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to forget this is some sort of mech rogue deck. It's not just a combo <laughs> Oh, I love Headless Horseman, but I wince. Yeah, me and Rekvam, I think, just made the same... If I had a webcam working, you could see it. But me and Rekvam just made the same face. Because even though I, I love the Headless Horseman as a hero card, it's rough when something like that happens. Yeah. Yeah, getting rid of stealth. You don't expect it, really. It's not fair. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Giant still costs five. Mm -hmm. Right, so this is the attempt to at least clear the way, but Molstar has been chipping away through all this as well. And with the Headless Horseman set up, Rekvam's only got like two turns to just not lose now, let alone winning the game. This oh, is really team. interesting, because I, I think it's Might of Menethil. I was mm. going to say, do you ever hold so you can freeze uh, the minions? But Molstar doesn't actually need to hold, right? Because uh, not only is this just 
basically setting up lethal anyway, but also because there's light bomb, because there's two double threads with crop rotation, like you didn't need to freeze this. This weapon choice was just a raw damage output scenario here. Yeah, so there's life steal. He needs rush. It'll be fine. You got it. <gasps> that was big. <laughs> uh huh. It's not. It's probably not big enough to win the game, but he's not lost it yet. Yeah, I mean, he needed it urgently. Yeah. It's definitely yeah. better than losing the game. Well, probably better. Still a lot of damage from Molstar. Obviously, he has to kill this. Otherwise, the lifesteal will be incredibly irritating. Doesn't want to light bomb it. Um, because there's more to come in theory. But he does have double threats. So maybe he will just light bomb one minion. You can see how much he hates it. All of your control player instincts are telling you this is awful, but then your logic is saying, no, 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 but I've still got double threads, I'm fine. I'm going to kill my opponent, let's just kill them, it doesn't matter. The problem here is I think, like, uh, if it was anything else, it just wasn't really guaranteeing good kills, right? This is too much health. Shadow Nothing step, to rush though. into this no. time, though, Raven. Yeah, this is a big gamble on the summons here. I think yeah. that's all Requiem can do. I guess there's like Neophyte, Shadow Step, Neophyte to just help out. You're dead on board though. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Everything must come back. <laughs> there's Gear Shift as well. Double break. Oh, this is the turn Requiem wanted ages ago. <laughs> Needs to gear shift into taunts. He's already used the bots, right? So there are no taunt bots, I don't think. What can he hit here? Okay. Oh no. Wait. No, oh, that's that's good, right? I mean, oh, for 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 Rekram, that keeps him alive. Yeah. Because the weapon only deals five. Obviously, we can see that there's the the crop, but from Rekram's point of view, that keeps yep. him up. That's what he was trying to hit. I mean, he was trying to hit better, but that's what he was trying to set up, was hit yeah. something from everything he must go and see what he could get. You don't need this to know card in half, so you just need to know that's all you've got. Yeah, this turn was supposed to happen four turns ago, basically. If, you want, if you've not seen this deck too often, this is what the board should look like on turn four, maybe turn five at a push. How much does crop rotation cost? Oh, just five, okay. Yeah, yeah, it'd be it's five. five. Double Neo five, yeah. And that is going to be game one, going to Molstar. Molstar never really had to worry too much. There was, of course, the lifesteal uh, earlier on from Rekvan, but again, with Headless Horseman, with the um, uh, the light bomb that was made available, it w Molstar was comfortable. You could tell. It was just like, yeah, you make your thing, I'll clear it, and at that point, I'll be too far ahead. And that's exactly what happened. Yep. Uh, we didn't talk about the lineups that much. We just talked about its control versus interesting rec van things. Um, Molestar's Mage is the question mark deck in this particular match. Uh, for me, as always, though, there's a disclaimer with Mage that the stats in the hands of a good player are massively mm -hmm. different than the stats of an average player. I still don't know why that is, but I mean, you're going to say it's a high skillful deck? I'm not sure. I mean, it must be is the answer, but yeah. Your list My... of decisions must make a massive difference, but this mage, on paper, is very weak against Red Gun's lineup. Yeah, I think one of the examples in terms of, you know, best player versus good player, potentially, for a deck like Mage, is just mispicking discover options, I think is one big thing. Uh, because I've done... In, in all my years casting, I've been surprised throughout the times by certain discover picks in these sort of matchups or decks, you know, where they're very card generation heavy. Yeah, I go, oh, I wouldn't have picked that. And then the player that did pick it wins. I'm like, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> you know, like, I, I, yeah. I'm worse than you at the game. You know? uh, so I think that that's definitely one of the factors where you have so many options, which is powerful in itself. But when you have that many options, it can be very easy to pick the wrong one. And then that can be the difference between winning or losing games. So, yeah, we'll have to see. Definitely uh, some uh, combo heavy stuff going on here. For Molestar, whereas Requiem still has that road to get through. We saw the uh, the bad side of that deck, right? When you don't get the shuffle, the deck definitely feels uh, pretty meager. 
Yeah, just go back to the majors where we saw Yala earlier. You know, reverberations on a salesman just to get yeah. the extra oil, just to use 27,000 turns later for, for lethal. Yeah, like, I don't think I'd have made that play, I'll be honest. Yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do, uh, a lot of options as well. So, Molestar is going to be having that Shaman and Mage left over. Wreck Farm stars the Rogue, Priest, and Demon Hunter. And uh, what do you make of the bands here, Lorinda, with that Warrior and uh, Shaman band, respectively? Like, Do you think, uh, do, do those make sense to you? They did. I thought that um, Wreck Farm might actually ban the Death Knight. Um, right. Of course, he has some sort of shot against the Warrior with a couple of the decks, but... I think this meta is largely um, choose what to do against Warrior. Make sure your lineup can beat it or ban it. Um, right. You know, and just a lot of people choosing to ban it. But yeah, I, I thought he might ban the Death Knight. Just difficult to know entirely because we have fewer very, very top players these days. That That's a fact. And that means that sort of tracker statistics are not as good as they used to be. Plus, we have a lot of nuance in deck building right now. A lot of decks are only 28 cards the same, which sounds ridiculous. It's like, well, that's the same deck, isn't it? But no, we, the little differences make a huge difference in matchups right now. And with this being a tournament, you make a lineup, you can you can tailor matchups that you're weak against to go your own way. So, yeah, it, it, it's difficult to know exactly what's hmm. weak and what's strong in matchups and what to ban right now, unless you are the player and know why every single card is there, or in case, unless you're incredibly good at looking at lineups. Yeah, most time on the top on this Shaman uh, is running that uh, Shudder Block version of the list, of course, as well. Uh, with oh, it's a... not even the list, Raven. This is, like, controly weirdness. True, yeah. This I'm is still the just deck looking you at this... might think it is at home. No, no, I've got the deck in well. front of me, but it's, it still has the ability to burn, is all I'll say. It's not not as high as, uh, sure. uh, as, as the others, of course. Yeah, this this is just some sort of control card in a deck. But yeah, it, it could do some damage. We've got two dirty oh. rats in here. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Double dirty rat can be pretty good um, in this matchup, but the problem is it's too late. <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> yeah. uh, I've played, you know, when you go for dirty rat against Demon Hunter, you generally try and get those shoppers out of the way, right? Just because the, uh, the, the benefit's way too strong, but already we can see there's mini shopper in hand, and there's most importantly, the Mag Theradon just sat ready to go for next turn. So I'm looking at this the other way because I'm the eternal, I don't know, optimist or something. When you're playing control, which I'm going to call this Shaman in this matchup, mm -hmm. um, against Demon Hunter, you only have to kill four minions. You just have to kill the six fives and then you win. You I need to fives, you send you some replays of games I've played, right? Whereas I've killed six fives and lost. <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of damage after the fact. There, there is, but if you, if you survive the six fives and you're playing this sort of deck with so much life stealing, sure, that's sure, sort sure. of where I'm at. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, if you survive yeah. it with um, with custom warlock, sure, they they might just <laughs> yeah, true. yeah, and they will, in fact. Requiem did whiff on the mini shopper though. The abyssal is is not super impactful. <laughs> mini shopper. You can watch for the sundown. Some face, stop the, the second shopping expedition from happening. It's really funny how the meta evolved kind of around this weapon, in that Viper doesn't really achieve what you want it to achieve, right? In, in like, normally Viper's like been the answer for weapons for such a yep. long time, and now it just has to be freeze. Yeah, the death rattle on the weapon was a, a new twist on it, which I kind of like. It's not a new twist, but a, a rarely used twist on it. Hmm. Uh, it's, it's that impactful anyway, right? Yeah. yeah I like the ideas stuff. of um, nerfing the weapon so it's a 3-3 three, three and things like that that <laughs> yeah, people yeah. like to come out with. Like, good effort. Well tried. And we'll start facing down a weirdly dangerous looking board, only on 21 health, but still putting forward a good chunk of damage from Requiem here. With the weapon swing still to go if you can't refreeze. Okay. So he's having a look see first. Huh. 
Right. Is he going to freeze again or is he going to wait? Yeah, he's going to freeze again. Yeah, why not, right? You just want to delay it as long as yeah. possible. Also, if you, go, if you go too long anyway, the shopper costing five is less of a disaster for Vecvan when it, you get to turn at eight and nine anyway. Yeah, it's for sure. kind of what I mean by shutting down the shoppers, right? Get a bit of health, shut down the shoppers, and you end up in this spot. It's a sharpshooter. Oh. Looks like he's setting up for the next turn now. <laughs> the old one mana do nothing. Yeah, oh, so he can deal. He can, he can deal with the if there's another freeze somehow now because he has the weapon to break the weapon. And also, I mean, look at the sharpshooter turn that's set up. Yeah, it, he's, he's it's looking sick. quite okay. It is, yeah. Most has a lot of options though. It's true, but they're all a little bit slow. Like, I, I don't think you can afford to forge the sun here. There's altered cord, of course, but you're killing a one-one to heal, which is you know, is fine. Yeah, no titan, no volcano is definitely a bit tough. Yeah, this spot. yeah. He's gonna go for the forge and hope uh, the spell's gonna dig him out of a situation here. And Punk. It is. Well, not this turn, unfortunately. No. Okay. Just using his cards and his mana. Arsenal 101. Wreck from now. Access to uh, all the cards in the world. Let's see if he can make something happen. It does have the swing of the weapon because this that second shopper is still in the deck. Just trying to get the order right here. Wants to remove the three five, obviously, so more stuff goes face. The shopper, yeah. Yeah, it does Easy. we'll end up with the mini shopper option playable. The shop option. Yeah. Just three damage? Yeah, Plus three I attack, so. I think. Just cash Wait, it in. Else in your hand? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, he doesn't need oh, we've life steal. I think we've swung. We've swung. Oh sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course, of course. It's so late in the game, I just think, like, of course, you know, the, that's all been the, uh, done and dusted. But yeah, uh, the, the, the lifesteal is good on the one drop, but it's also just not needed in this matchup, right? That's normally, yeah. or at least I would consider the uh, the lifesteal on one very powerful, but yeah, not at the moment. It's going to be the Fiend instead. So, how do you utilize the rat here? Well, either way, mm. Consecrate's doing some heavy lifting. It is. It's There's also a weird option to like rat first and then conk. Right? Yeah, yeah. Just to get a big taunt in the way. Not being able to get the shutter block going, unfortunately, for Mobstar. Oh, and that's a. I oh, no. You. Never mind. What do I admit? She is going to go for the Consecrate to clear the majority of the board out. Does have turn the tides to clear this up completely? Looks clean to me. Very much so. Back to Vecvam. Do it again. He's got a lot of damage here. Doesn't seem to be a killer blow, right? Everything's lining up to be really nice, but I'd like to get the weapon equipped personally to get the, the six-five green rag into place for next turn, so I don't have to spend mana next turn. Is he a sigil again? Do you think? Because that would be um. 
A lot more stuff, but does it help? Is the stuff going to be cheaper? <coughs> oh, it's just got a green rag now. Because okay. mm -hmm. it's expensive and it's not a naga, I guess. Just get it done. Put out a ton of damage here. Going from wreck from it's not so much just sat in the hand as well. That's the scary part. Like of course, like Molestar has again, it's like the push and pull, right? A lot of damage versus a lot of healing. But I just feel like wreck is just too far like just always at one step ahead in terms of pressure. And just it's not like he's running out of juice anytime soon either. Yeah, at some point. Right? Yeah. At some point Molestar can stabilize, but it doesn't he's he's not gonna get that, I don't think. Because he has to be able to get his shutter block down to to have a pop off. That's a good pull, though. It is. And just delete this, no problem. It's like he may well end up pretty overloaded, though, if you're going to go for knowledge and lightning storm. Oh, no, it's going pop up book. Okay. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. Yeah, a nice level layer level. of defense there, honestly, and even Requiem with a bit of a smirk, just being like, right, i just start hitting through these somehow. Oh! I was That's just useful. looking to see if that was in the list, but it helped me out by just appearing. There you go, <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty useful, isn't it? Yeah, the rat was played second, right? So... Doing this way so as not to waste the weapon charge. Very easy mistake to make to think you're going to be able to do the damage to the rat and then have the weapon vanish after it hits the one mm. maker. That was just a bit of a weird turn, honestly. It was. Because there wasn't enough to go down swing in. <clears throat> Played a 1 2 that did nothing. And yeah, of course, set up more draw. I guess Requiem's just going to, like, trying to just stack resources for the pop off turn, but. Yeah. I guess I was just thinking of, what if you just clear the board and hit him in the face again? But I guess that can be done next turn as well. I mean, it can, but look at the state now of um, what Molestar's doing. All that armor. Yeah. Gonna have, like, a zillion weapons from Ignis, so there's the wing condition sorted. And if Vekram doesn't kill him, like, I'm gonna say, for sake of argument, now, he mm. might never do it. Oh. Well, there's momentum. But I think, like, as you said, the armor plus just the st the taunts in the way is that. Uh, well, taunts not not a big deal because of going down, but yeah, yeah. Um, the armor definitely is not what Rekfan was after. <laughs> seeing this, turn. yeah. I mean, you say they're not a big deal, but their presence is going to cost Rekfan four mana for very little damage. Sure, sure, sure. I guess I just viewed it as uh, the the clearing oh, yeah. of the board anyway, right? Argus yeah, yeah. though. Not a bad pickup, actually. Well, he's fully combo site set now for next turn. I think. Yeah, there's a sharpshooter there. Hiding yeah. In the middle. yeah, there is, yeah. Yeah, there's still one left there. Dirty Rat obviously only got one. There is another Dirty Rat in hand, though. Yeah. It's definitely worth looking at because there's lightning storm. Like, there's enough on board that Molestar can pretty much just say, whatever's Dirty Ratted, I can kill. Right. And it's under a mini, right, at the moment. Yeah. So it just wrap everything. Well, not everything, but a lot of things. <laughs> literally everything. Just literally everything. All the cards on the board. Just going down swinging, just chilling on the board. You know. Taking down the Argus. No problem there. <laughs> Alright, right, Vam. Right, go. Do the, do the thing. I'll be honest, though. I am not comfortable with potential damage numbers. Uh, with this kind of turn, I need a phone a friend and I'll phone Sottle. He normally knows this, this, uh, or at least has good good friend. estimates on this sort of thing. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm afraid you've got me unlucky. Yeah, I've got I mean, Graham's I'm... head shake. That's what I'm going on. <laughs> I'm okay to just uh, sit and go on the journey of this turn, but yeah, <laughs> definitely a tricky one. I was genuinely interested in seeing the crazy double air uh, dirty rat from Molestar, and we just didn't get to see. I'm a little bit disappointed. We still might. It's still under the the mini, I think. I don't think anything's been played with Battle Cry since the mini came down. Molestar's just full on greeting it. See, so yeah, Rex, I'm going to clear everything here. Uh, Molestar's going to do it next turn, isn't he? He's going to just rat the rat them. Oh, Mr. Damage on all those minions. Just, yeah, even if he doesn't hit the sharpshooter, he just gets rid of so much stuff, right? Yeah. He's got Volcano and Storm to get rid of it. Oh, okay, sure. <laughs> Shaking the head for Requiem again. It's like, oh no. <laughs> That's a, yeah. a few Zilliacs on the board. Even just better. a few. Yeah. I mean, lock it in, right? There's As far as I can recall... There's nothing really left for Rekvam to, like, do this or wait, right? I'm gonna roll some yeah, dice. Now the swinging is gone, he's gotta, yeah, just, just gotta high roll something here. Yeah, literally. Not the dice he was looking for. just playing cards it's all point, he can really do i think after that zilliax yeah after, <clears throat> after the zilliax uh spam uh, there's nothing left requiem doesn't have titan the already just used going down swinging so it's like there's just three what three cards two cards in the deck now there's just not much to do other than just lock it all in and hope there's some kind of miracle right that like saves which there isn't just can't get through all that health all those divine shields and wow all star with a bit of a nod there feeling good about that game no doubt because that's a game that could definitely spiral out of control right with the shoppers yep. it's exactly what the deck's built to do and then there's the secondary worry of those sort of pop-off turns as we saw Rekvam gearing up for and i think Molstar did a really good job of defending against, you know, initial Demon Hunter Wave 1 of Shoppers and then putting himself in a solid position to negate the sort of pop-off combo turns later on. That was really well played. Yeah, like like all good control players, when they do it, it looks easy. I think I called like four turns completely wrong in that game. And yeah, my plays were fine. I'm sure they'd have been okay and I'd have lost thinking I played well. Right. Um, but when really good control players do things, everything just looks so easy to put into the right order. I'd, I'd miss that the Zilliax was going to copy for the battle point. Right. Um, but that's which why I wanted to rat and clear, which probably also does well. But they just make it look so easy. It's like I constantly was thinking, well, he hasn't got the, he hasn't got the, the shutter walk down. How is he going to do it? Right. And then he plays the mini and then does nothing for three turns, just continues to use yeah. removal spells. And it's like, oh, look, my mini's just... The one that I put in the bank a few turns ago. Here we go. Now I'm going to win with Zilliax. Yeah, that's the type of game where I would have, say, got to that spot. I would have played the Zilliax. Then I would have been surprised that the Zilliax multiple copied and gone, oh, yeah, forgot about that. And then like, oh, yeah, cool. And then I uh, got on from there and maybe maybe won the game back. So, but, yeah, really good game there from Molestar. Currently 2-0 up in this winner's match of Group B. If you're just joining us, we are just starting out the uh, broadcast matches of Group B. The winner of this one goes on to Sunday, the final day of the Masters Tour, and the loser goes down into uh, the lower bracket in the group. But Molstar, just that one game away, Lorinda, like, what a day. Yeah, I'm not going to say the thing, though. Actually, I am. I'm going to say exactly the thing. As much as I'd like to be 2-0 up, because going 2-0 up is good, this is the deck I highlighted at the start that... Um... I'm interested to see Molestar play against specifically what Rekvam is bringing because I think he's big underdog three times in a row. We've done right. this a million times over the years. If you're big underdog in Hearthstone three times in a row, you are still favoured. Um, but this one ain't over. I think that this mage needs to be played incredibly well to take a game here. Yeah, there's some pretty uh, aggressive decks from Rekfam uh, coming out with a lot of early board pressure, potentially again in the likes of the Rogue and the likes of the Demon Hunter uh, and the Priest. Um, 
fairly aggressive builds overall. Mage can be a little bit weak to that, but these mages are running a decent amount of freeze. We've seen them be able to hold off, and maybe the Wisdom Ball is going to be a little bit friendlier uh, going forward than what we've seen too many of today. I think if he gets to the point where he's got a Wisdom Ball, he's okay, but like the Rogue might just put a load of 8-8s on the board against you. Right. The Priest could just make an unbeatable board, turn 3 or 4. We all know how Demon Hunter works. It hits you hard and relentlessly. If Vecbam's, I mean, it's kind of the, the meta. If Vecbam's decks do their thing, they will win. But um, they will do their thing more often than Molstar gets to Wisdom Ball, I think. I think that um, Molstar's got to find a way to stall and stall good against one of these three. Right, yeah, we'll have to find out. Uh, going to be a tough one for Rekrum, for sure. Um, I'm excited to see more of this mage, though, because it's a deck that I think is really difficult to get a good grasp on. Like, yes, of course, play Sif, kill him. We all know that. But I think getting to that point, especially in this meta, feels quite difficult. I think some of the matchups are really tough. So take a look at the list now. And there's so much generation that... I feel like the punish for, say, picking wrong in certain scenarios yeah. is so high that in this like super high-powered meta, you just lose if you mess it yeah. up. So uh, this deck, at least for me, has been it's quite difficult really like to learn. Meta as a whole, um, there, there's always things you can pick in holes in metas that you don't like personally or whatever. But what I think I really do like about this meta is make a mistake, lose, back him up, try again. <laughs> Like, you, know, you, you I, I, don't get the option to lose make two or three mistakes in this meta don't right. don't make mistakes or you will lose the good news is if you make your mistake you will die quickly and you get a chance <laughs> to play another game and hopefully your opponent makes a mistake first in the next one yeah, and taking a look at Rekfam's Priest uh, I know you've been jamming some Priests recently um, are you a fan of the Hearthstone Brew because I feel like the so, uh, everyone's I'm just a, putting Hearthstone Brew in, pro, in like their the decks now priest. just as a, I, I a, a sort of throw it out there and hope um, yeah, I, I don't empty my hand well enough for Hearth to be good enough for me at my level, which is you know, 500 to 1,000 on average legend. Um, the very top players do end up with empty hands, and so Hearth, I think sort of summed it up, it's nine Hearthstone cards, which is, which is great. Uh, but personally, no, I don't, I don't think that the card is required in the deck. I don't, think, I don't think you're behind in games where you've emptied your hand often enough. I think if you've emptied your hand, you are winning. Well, the game is ready to go. Uh, I think one of the players just took a little bit of a bathroom break, which is fair enough, especially if they're maybe expecting this match to go a little bit longer. Uh, we'll see if Molestar can close this one out quickly or not. Uh, he's going to keep hold of that Frostledge Cross Stitch and Frost Bolt, so you can really see the, uh, the game plan here is kill the priest stuff so they mm. don't kill me. Yeah, and that's that's something I've struggled with in this matchup, which is again meant to be strongly priest favoured as Fallout for Mead. If the maze just kills your things, you have no things. Um, t t complicated equation there. Okay, I think I've lost Lorinda here for some reason. Okay, I can. Oh hear no, you. yeah, okay. I, I maybe lost the end of your sentence. Apologies. Um, I was looking at the uh, connection quality. It was okay on my end, because you know I'm nervous about that now. <laughs> but moving on to turn one, as the players are ready to go, we're going to see a couple of miracles, Miracle Salesmen sorry, uh, be available for Rec Fam. So nice early pressure. And oof. Sif, a little bit too early for Molestar right now. Yeah, and the creation looks good, but not got all the um, the juice for it just yet. So, Molestar already with a decision. Yeah, I find this sort of position quite interesting because Molestar's kept a Frostbolt uh -huh. to answer early game minions. Is this, in like, on curve, is this a minion worth answering? Right? I think it's an interesting point. Because it is interesting. It's, it's not the biggest threat, but it can become a threat, right? Because it's just another minion on board added. But you're also wasting a point of damage. Frostbolt does three. It's a 2-2, two -two, and there's a lot of three health minions in the deck, so that's why it's a choice. Yeah, he's going to respect it, though. Take it off. Okay. Well, Replica is normally something you just rip in this position, thin your deck, get some stuff, but obviously it's turn two where you're doing nothing. Yeah... 
Has potential of coin though. Right, with whelp. It's that problem though, like, is coining a minion out versus mage going to achieve much? Or, I think Requiem would be more aiming at just creating an actual board, right? And not trying to just yeah. uh, drip feed Molestar minions one by one to die. Uh, so yeah, I definitely think um, also, holding on to it is a little bit more worthwhile, especially with the hand that he's got. The, the streamer in Requiem on turn one, when he had both salesmen, he played one and then he hovered over his Amethyl. Mm. And I think that was trying to show us why he's not coining out the second salesman. I might be wrong. Right. I think he wants to coin. I want. I think he wants to coin Amethyl on six. I, again, I could be wrong there, but that just looked like I've seen Vecram do that before in tournaments too. He's so used to streaming and so enjoys sort of people enjoying the game with him. Uh, right. Try to let us know what was on his thought process and, at that point. And it makes sense because Vecram's hand isn't exactly the all-in early game hand, is it? Right. There's, no, oh, well, there's a funnel cake now, though, so that, yeah, yeah, that can help. Gonna start a little trade. Oh, we've got loads of wands, Raven. I can see How many multiple wands. can we make? <laughs> <laughs> no card draw, of course. It's gonna be the salesman, I guess, yep. Yeah. To try and yeah. solve that no card draw problem. Yeah. We'd love to get a pip or something off the top here and get like reduced four sixes, drifters. Mm. It's nice though. Molstar getting the not only the bit of removal there, but also just sticking a, a chunky minion in the form of that water elemental, right? Like that is gonna be a, a relevant threat on the board for Requam, not a threat in terms of his own health total, but being able to just like get multiple positive trades. I'm trying to work out if he can get Zilliax down here. I don't think he can. No, I don't think so. Just a little bit shy. I needed an extra couple of one drops, maybe. He could have done, he just chose not to. But he's busy making dragons. Yeah, I think Rec from here is just saying, I'm building a board, right? It's early enough. I'm, again, I've not been keeping tracks, so that's my bad, but I don't really think the creations is good enough here. I think it's I one, it's been Frostbolt and uh, Stitch, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, I think you're right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's n definitely not good enough. So I think this is just good timing here from Rek. I'm saying, look, the hand's not amazing. Obviously, we're looking at potentially getting into this arm and thaw later. But for now, if this can just survive and push a little bit, suddenly the Zilliax can help out, and then he's no doubt hoping it'll snowball from there. Yeah. But good reverberations there from Molstar. Yeah, and Rekvam still hasn't actually connected with everything, and he's used the coin. So even though he's building boards for the reasons you've said, he hasn't got anywhere and he's run out of card draw. So yeah, he's going to now generate some card draw and try desperately to get something going again. Okay, this is good because this sets up um, some dragons for Zerimi at least. Yeah, it's something. But Rekvam, looking stressed, I don't blame him. Is in a tough spot, whereas Molstar, even with that, you know, the early safe, the awkward creations for now, is still looking kind of okay. This is a very manageable board, and there's enough resources, as there always is with Mage, of course. You're never really going to run out of resources, um, especially with Wisdom now. So, yeah, I think Molstar's in a pretty good spot. The only worry is you've always got to be a little bit scared of a uh, Timewinder, of course, and like just trying to think, well, what has to happen for me to get two turned here <laughs> and try and hold that off? Yes. That's one of the things I, I hear people, they, they're not joking us. They're, they're joking, but they're not joking. Like, oh, shall we take Zerimi out of the deck? Because it's kind of the worst card. The second it's not in the deck, you don't have to worry about that stuff. Right. Like you don't. So just the fact it's there means you have to, like you said, worry about these two the turns. The old George C. Leroy plan from exactly many years the back. the words I said to Sotl when he said it. 
You can explain the George Stevie Leroy plan because that was like six years ago, Raven. I'm not going to explain it. If you were there, you deserve to know. If you weren't there, you don't deserve to know. Fair. Yeah. That's it. At George C, I'm sure he'll love it talking about a game he played five years ago. Snake or cycling to power cord isn't terrible, but are we going to see the tempo play? How many more dragons is it? Are we power cording? I think cording three, it said. Oh, okay. Yeah, three's too many. I Try could again. be wrong, but I think I caught I think three right. there. I think you're right. Yeah, so I'll confirm three. This looks like when I play Priest. <laughs> yes, this is how I feel when I play it too. What do you do? Molestar might actually find himself in a position to play Chadgar. Yes. You know what I said about that? Because I'm always right. Ooh, it's going to be heal pass? Oh, no. There's no, like, heal... Dragon, power cord. Is that the plan now, I guess? Maybe a power cord. No, you can't, though. Okay, overdrew the glyph, but that's fine, I think, from All Star. Didn't go for the power cord from Requiem. I'm just going to hold on. Yeah, you just can't. Yeah, I mean, you'd be doing it to just do it, right? Like, there's, there's no actual good outcome there. I think your win conditions now are some sort of opponent doesn't have Sif is one of them. And my Amanthol goes crazy and gets copied is probably another. Yeah. There's star power doing what it always does, clearing the board regardless of health total. Spoken like a true hunter player. Ooh. Oh, when the lightning bolt. I was yeah, very he's tempted. Like he's, he's not far off. Yeah, that's that's absolutely fair. It's just my eyes were drawn to Huh, not much to do this turn. Four mana floating. What if you just play meta and you have like yeah. two turns of one, like, you know, the, the yep. deal four damage? Like, you, You've mentioned it a couple of times, like the um, the discovers the difference between the very top players and other players, you know. Mm -hmm. Most has got the vision that he thinks he's going to end this pretty soon, so. Which is fair enough, like you said. A lightning bolt when you're playing Sif, yeah. Good card. Here it is. Amanthol hits the board. <laughs> Gonna go for Voon. Yeah. It's one of those situations where, like, yeah, there's lifesteal, but does that really matter <laughs> against this deck? <laughs> Gotta do something about the, um,. Yeah, I'm thought, so... Yeah, oh... That, that did something. <laughs> yep. They're just building his Ooh. own board now. It's another excavate if Molestar wants it. Something with the dragon deck that um, people might be wondering, oh no, I'm getting so unlucky, no dragon. There's only four dragons in the deck, usually. Or well, five right. if you count Zerimi. There's things that generate dragons, there's ways of copying your dragons, there's, there's dragons that make dragons. Sorry, there's things that make dragons, but there's actually not many dragons in there. You, when you get stuck like this and you can't get your Zerimi going, you often just don't get it going. Yeah, I mean the the even though the Zareem is like the flashy, crazy part of the deck, it's not the core of the deck, right? It's not the sole goal, no, even though it can win you a lot of games. Like you really are just building a board yeah. early and powering through tons of card draws. So yeah, that's Pip. Yeah, this is every this is Pip on the clergy yeah. with a zillion funnel cakes. This is this is Rekram's big turn. He needs to watch his board space, needs to draw a lot of stuff, needs to set up some sort of lethal opportunity and he doesn't do that unless he plays at least a dragon and probably two for what we've seen yeah and the zilliax is like basically free right like whenever rack fan wants yes. it to be at this point all right let's go replica if there's a dragon left he can copy a power cord he can mess around with more funnel cakes to there's also mana. Voon. there's also voon okay he's good has he got dragons. space so he can do what he wants yeah, this is 
I mean, this looks like a good setup to me. Yeah, he can't get the Zilliacs down, which is really annoying for him. But yeah. Okay, well, now he has two Zerimis. <laughs> Yeah, next turn his plan is to basically, um, he's challenging Molestar to get rid of all his stuff on the board, which is fine. And then next turn it is just the lethal setup with double Vasiliax, if there is a next turn. Because Molestar has to kill some of this stuff, it's too threatening. And then when some of it's dead, obviously your Zilliaxes make this board more strong. I'm really trying to stare ways. at this creation and try and think how much it's, uh, if I've missed some spells or not. But... I'm trying to find a world where Molestar, um, yeah, he's he's trading maximum minions in here, right? So that he gives minimum board space to wreck Vamp for next turn. I think that's what he's doing. I mean, no, he, he can, oh, he, they're on oh, five. He just, just closed the okay. board. Yeah, and he gets to board. push five as well. Sure. Like pushing five is right. pretty sick. Basically, I mean, Rekram must be assuming this is setting up lethal, right? I think Rekram's got it now, though, right? I think, yeah, with the... Wait, has he? Oh, he's got Funnel Cake still in hand. Yeah, he's he's got all sorts of stuff going on here. He's just going to make sure he gets both Zilliaxes down if he can. Um, preferably what, at least one this turn, but if he can't, so be it. Yeah, this to copy, replay, funnel cake. Yeah, that's that's. Yeah, he's got one hundred percent stage one, and then follow up time. I mean, it oh, just yeah. doesn't matter. He's he's got this now, as long as he counts correctly. Six, seven, eight, eleven, fifteen. Say that. I think it's exact. It must be more than 28. It's significantly more, I think. Yeah, it is, right? Yeah. Plenty. Could, if, he, if he needs to, he can trade in one of the three fives and play another Zilliax. Like, there's there's loads there. But yeah, there's plenty of damage anyway. Yeah, it's I think it is anyway. Yeah, I think he, he did the usual of this. Is, if I mess this up, I probably lose. So I'm gonna triple count everything and make sure it works. Rekvam, just about pulling it out of the bag there, and that kind of leads back to what Saul I think touched on a little bit earlier uh, on on the show today, where we talk about this priest and that you're not even though it looks like it, and even though it can do this, you don't just go one drop, two drop, three drop, four drop, five drop, win, right? You can play mm. late game, you can set things up for a more drawn out game, even if it looks a little bit dire sometimes. And uh, Rec Fam, you know, we know, we know Rec Fam's no pushover. So yeah, really well played there and just about got to where he needed to be. I really like the air, uh, the Voon. Um, the Voon, the Voon yeah, was really good, sure. yeah. Because that, that is so much extra, not even just damage, but just options that, that it gave him available. Because he ended up with, obviously, two uh, two timelines as well. Yep. Yeah, he ripped the, um, the dragon that he required just in time. I think he was dead the next turn, almost certainly. I haven't yeah. counted it. and I'm, It's really hard to count when you don't know how many spell schools and things have gone. But hey, it, uh, do my best. <laughs> It's hard, especially like because there's a lot to keep track of on both decks there with you know the priest dragons and then the Sif. Uh, I love making excuses for why we're bad. Um, and then like the, oh, yeah. <laughs> the Sif with the uh, potential spell damage is always a little bit tricky. But yeah, Rekvam is fighting back. Priest is ticked. That means it's won a game, and then uh, Molestar's still gonna have to sit on this mage and try and get something done in the next game or two to be able to move on to Sunday. Yeah, got the um, the mage win under the belt. Again, I feel like the mage should struggle, but it looked like he was going to get it done there, to be fair. And still two more goes. Um, really curious to know how it deals with with the rogue, if the rogue gets going. Mm -hmm. Obviously, because the creation is just too small. 
So yeah, it's uh, maybe reliant on the freezers. Yeah, we'll have to see. It's, uh, the the rogues are always a tricky one because um, a lot of the games with rogue look very polarized one way or the other. Uh, because if you can drop an AA and then stealth it, suddenly you're feeling pretty good about life. Uh, but you know, if you leave it open, some options are very tricky. But it looks like we're going to be checking out the uh, Demon Hunter. Uh, first of all, again, uh, another tough one. I think uh, a deck that can really just push out the mage very, very quickly indeed, even though this is the uh, slightly more combo y based one, let's yeah. say, uh, with those blind eye sharpshooters in. But at the end of the day, you can put all the fancy combos you want in. Sometimes you can just get the weapon, swing it, play shopper, and then off the back of that, kind of steamroll the game. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said earlier, sometimes you just don't even get there. You just play some ones and twos and you've done 16 damage before you know it. And yeah, the game kind of just ends. Yeah, and um, we'll see how this is going to go as the players are just going to be getting ready here. It looks like it's going to be the Demon Hunter coming up. Um, in terms of this matchup, because we've seen, like as we mentioned, the Demon Hunter are able to push a lot of damage, but... How do you feel this matchup is just broadly? Like, is one favoured? Is it just extremely close? Uh, is Demon Hunter just going to stomp the mage? I think Demon Hunter's going to stomp the mage. But again, I, I just keep adding this caveat. I, I, I have to always add it in tournaments. that mage does better in tournaments than it does on ladder. And that isn't because it's lucky. That's not because of matchups. It's because the players playing mage in tournaments are better than the players playing mage on ladder. As, a, as an average, even if you count top 1,000, it it's not enough. Mm. You've got to count top 25, top 30. So always very careful when I say about mage, but also I think the Demon Hunter will stop the mage. Yeah, it's going to be a little bit tricky though because there's always the outcomes because I feel like we we are seeing it a lot and I guess it's you know, it is down to Mulligan and down to the weapon, day, the, the uh, tech draw uh, as well. But if Demon Hunter just doesn't get hold of the weapon, uh, and because this is a slightly more combo-y version, let's say, uh, from Rekvam, you don't really have time to mess around, right? Because the mage will just overpower, has access to freeze as well. Uh, so it's not like uh, this is just... I, never mind. Umpire's grasp in hand. I mean, it does play Whatever. four weapons, to be fair. It plays yeah. two, tech, oh, two weapons. Exactly, yeah, yeah. With, with, with the tech and the weapon, it is common, but it's, I'm just like, oh, yeah, so what's the world where there's no weapon? Molestar can get ahead. No, there, there is the weapon, so whatever. <laughs> Ignore yeah. everything I just said. And even in the world where there isn't a weapon, the Demon Hunter does have a lot of ones and twos to, to fiddle around yeah. with while it waits. It's it's much, much, much yeah. less on good display without the weapon, the as hand. we're going to find out on Monday. <laughs> yes. Sorry, like, yeah. yeah. Requiem's opening hand looking pretty nice. It's got those selections of the ones and twos we talked about here. A Slither Spear Salesman. Um, that's not one card, by the way. That's two. <laughs> I just realized. I've just created, I've just leaked the next card from the, the next set, maybe. Uh, but yeah, Slither Spear going down now to challenge. And then there's just options Coin Grasp uh, from Requiem. It's going to really accelerate this game. Yeah, and I'm looking to see what Molstar does here uh, with regard to these frost bolts. Are they going at the face? With Requiem keeping cards, Molstar can be fairly sure that the, the weapon's won. Like, you don't keep much else. Yeah. I wonder if, um, it, because so... of the second frost bolt, is it ever frost, excuse me, frost bolt the slither spear um, this turn? Let the swing happen and then frost bolt afterwards? Uh, it's kind of, oh, it's so tricky. It's definitely, I mean, that's how you'd go about it if you want to frostbolt the Slither Spear, but you've also got the option of just letting the Slither Spear lift and then frostbolting them on turns four yeah. and five. Oh, um, it sounds stupid. Is it frostbolt face now? Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think this is probably the play I wouldn't make, but the play I wish I'd made because, yeah, as yeah. you mentioned, you saw the keeps. It was a what, two keep? And this two coin. Keep. So it's like, hmm. <laughs> and the artificer just dies to the weapon, right? So I do like this. Uh, unfortunately for Molestar, though, there is uh, multiple other options for Regvam, as we can see. Yeah, the Oof. reason I'm curious about it, and again, I know that he's right and I'm wrong, so I'm just interested, is I like to make them show me the weapon and do the first swing, and right. that way they haven't developed any, any tempo, so they've just developed a weapon that then can't swing the next turn. Uh, whereas I when think... you do it this way, you do let your opponent actually develop board because you've told them yeah. they can't swing this turn. I think the artificer was the difference. Mm -hmm. 
It's because it just it's just defending the artificer, right? Whereas if yeah. there was no artificer on one, I would definitely agree that like you know you can either kill the slither spear or do something else, and then frostbolt weapon after. Yeah, fair. Oh, oh my! They both gone face. Oh, a little chuckle there from Requiem. He's loving it. He is loving it. Oh, okay, yeah, a natural draw of the shopper. Look at this though. Umpire's grasp. Uh, that's the balance change. It's becoming a one drop. <laughs> Don't upset the people, Raven. They're already <laughs> upset. Uh, and this is going to be tough. Like, Requiem's ticking all of the boxes, right? Board and yeah. weapon threat. And there's going to be a shopper, or at least there's, it's extremely likely there's going to be a shopper next turn. Yeah, it's a bit rough. This is almost in the line of what you were saying earlier, like, what happens if they don't draw a weapon? Well, I know he's got a weapon, but it's, it's the rest of the stuff is what's doing the damage right now. Right. The weapon just represents about another trillion damage after you take this board in the face. Yeah. Yeah, that's the problem. Frostbolt number two going to face. I mean, that makes sense. I'm definitely not questioning that play, but it's the sacrifices that have to be made for that play, right? Like, Molestar's just left a board full of minions up, and now yep. the second weapon, crunching it out, it's going to make it uh, a little bit awkward. Yes, the shopper doesn't come down, but it's still a bit of a disaster. I think Rick Vam's just thinking whether he's going to Burning Heart this one too. I don't hate it, honestly. Because when are you playing this Burning Heart? If next turn's three mana shopper, one mana shopper, one mana shoppy. Yeah, I don't hate it. Pushes one extra damage to face and defends your board. Like, yeah. Sure. The only weird thing is because all your minions are two health, it doesn't defend it against much, right? I guess is the it other point. Against creation. Exactly. Like, creation, you want the burning heart so you can hit the creation next turn and go yeah. for. E either for stuff's six. dead or it's not. So I don't mind. If there was one more health on this Slither Spear, I'd just be like, yeah. yeah, okay, sure. But, you know, kill it, whatever. But because there yeah. isn't, I actually like this uh, uh, hold back here from Requiem. Yeah. Because there's always time for burning heart later, right? Like the odds on there being nothing to hit and then push the extra damage are so low. Yeah, if your opponent doesn't play a creation, then you don't mind that you've held a burning heart because you're going to hit them for all this stuff anyway. Yeah, and oof. Basically a pass turn from Molestar. Of course he drew a lot of cards. You know, I'm not saying it's literally a pass, but it feels like a pass from where I'm sitting because, wow, this is a lot of damage. Now, I want to see the one-mana um, secret generator here if it's not a Mothodon. Uh, we missed. Oh, Shadow's good. Oh, really? I think this is one of the spots where a lot of the secrets are quite handy, especially the hunter ones. It wasn't secrets, though. No, that's what I'm saying. I wanted to see it because I'm greedy. Oh, right. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. I'm just... I think I would have took three health. Maybe I'm stupid. Maybe the health just doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it matters, personally. But... Yeah, maybe okay. maybe it matters more than a one. I guess the one one lives through creation, right? So it's an extra point of damage next but turn. Look how low. Did he know it was Molestar getting is. divine shield though? <clears throat> no, but there's there's reborn as well, right? I guess, I guess. Yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. Sleet skaters coming down now. Going to be yeah. gaining some health here for Molestar. Yeah, actually saved him there. <laughs> Double sigil of time. <laughs> yeah, just a couple of cards. Uh, it's not just paladins that can do silly things. So, if Requiem... Oh no, he won't draw from the swing anyway, right? Yeah, it doesn't matter. No. Yeah, you're worried about the overdraw, but it's fine. For a second, I was worried. Yeah, there's also the... I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't think the overdraw is going to matter. I was just realizing that the uh, the salesman can also potentially cause overdraw in this scenario, right? Uh, yes. Unless he just trades and plays the oil. 
Uh, oil's good though with upcoming sharpshooter potentially, right? Oh yeah, I'm, by no means has to play the oil. I was just interested at what Rekvam's uh, thoughts were on that overdraw or not. Oh, oh now yeah. Did, did he mean upset. to play the oil? So I think I think he meant to play it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because you probably wouldn't have traded it. If you weren't going to play the oil, why trade it? Yeah. Is, is I'm guessing... No, you're right, you're right. What's happened here? Yeah, I think that was just Rekvam getting himself caught up in a few things. He also might have done the thing I've definitely done, where it's like, oh, draw six cards, I'll be fine. But there's a natural draw as well. Yes. <laughs> Which is the problem. <laughs> Yeah, something doesn't look right here, for sure. And honestly, Don't worry about this, it. Wait till next turn. At this Plan point, how you're going to win with your next 10 cards. Molestar can clear the board, right? Yep. I think the Inquisitive creation's enough to clear. Uh, <laughs> it hides. It's four, four plus the so ping. Okay, anymore. yeah, sure, sure, sure. I thought it was on five, but yeah. this. I mean, this is fair enough, right? Um... So, effectively clear board, 15 health, arguably 14 with the 1-1 one -one sitting there. Everybody, just pay attention to what the overdraw ends up being. <laughs> oh god, don't. Okay, whatever. Okay, it's, it's fine. fine. Gotta check for lethal. What? Wait. You think this is lethal? I don't think it is, but you've got to check for it. I guess so. It's a decent amount of health on the board, you know, like overall, though, right? And there's none of the big spikes of damage. Oh, I'm just looking at Burning Heart, Burning Heart hit you. Like, nothing. Not right. looking for clever sharpshooter stuff at the moment. That's my oh, first okay, answer, okay. Have I sure. just got See, I'm, I'm sat here staring at sharpshooter and thinking, God, I'm too dumb for this. <laughs> no, that's the, yeah, that's, that's the secondary thing. That's what I'm actually doing. But yeah. I would like to lethal say if Rekvam's locking it in, then it is lethal. But maybe he's just... It's a lot of damage, especially with the Naga pickup. I don't think it's lethal, though. Oh, wait a minute. That's plus one on... That can attack face. Close. Close. Still set up, in, set up himself in a very good position here, though, because even though it's not lethal, it's a ton of damage, and there's still a lot of damage left in hand. Second sharpshooter pickup, as well as, as you said, the burning uh, double in hand. Yeah, and going down swinging. As oh, well going down swinging. I so. didn't even notice the going down swinging was there until right now. Yeah. Yep. No, you're right. You're right. <laughs> Crafters go. Okay, face going down frozen. Swing can swing, but not face. Um, if loads of taunts got made, for instance. Creations to clear. Okay. And Molstar's just saying, well, that's pretty much all I can do. Freeze the face, clear the board. The usual suspects. But this is looking like it should be fine. Oh, no, he doesn't have the other... Oh, he's... Wait. This could oh, be no. fine. Okay. <laughs> There was ways that could have worked out. Obviously, never mind just yeah. the damage RNG, but like the discover and so on, so on. But yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, Requiem got Molstar down to two. And I don't think there's anything else that can really go down here, honestly. Nature spells. Huh? Nature spells can heal for That's six world, quite often. Yeah. Oh, no, going for reduction draw. Okay. I was confused for a second then. Oh, Ooh. skater. Yeah, but nothing dangerous enough, right? No. Ice Barrier, go! <laughs> so Ice Barrier... <laughs> Rekvam's like, just press enter. Just press enter. But this now is Glyph! This pain. Oh. 
I look over Frax, I'm just like, please just press end just turn. <laughs> make this oh, yeah. nonsense stop. What are you doing? Like, from where Vecvam sat, Molsar's just drawn like 15 ways to win the game. From where we're sat, he's drawn a coin and an ice battle. Yeah. But yeah. He needs to be able to stack ice barriers like uh, sigils and auras can be stacked. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> there used to be somebody on that bottom camera. Now it's just a hand. <laughs> now it's just emotions. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, that's helpful. Yeah. That's very helpful. This is this burning and then blind eye? Sure. Oh, all that. Yeah. Please go face. I can't stand Rick when being so upset for so long. <laughs> no, I didn't go face because he's attacking. Uh, oh, he didn't do it. That's right. Uh, yeah, he's just doing this and now he's going to proc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is fine. This is fine. Yeah, you got that. Oh. Uh, Game four, going to Rekvam on his way for a reverse sweep, potentially drinking out of the Hearthstone flask thing. And confirm. Looks like the Hearthstone one to me. Regardless, Mage once again left over for Molstar. Molstar kind of just got ran over there, honestly. Uh, did well to defend as long as he could, but just could not stabilize in terms of the health. And again, it's one of the bonuses that that build of Demon Hunter, sort of new age versions of Demon Hunter have, is they just have kind of just damage from hand that isn't negated by freeze a lot of the time. Uh, but now, Lorinda, we've got, at least in this series, the two flimsy decks fighting each other, right? We've got the mage that has struggled so far for Molstar, and then we've got the rogue, which can be extremely powerful or extremely weak, yeah, depending on uh, from what we saw earlier on. So, uh, interesting way to end the series, honestly, and uh, often the way this can happen in Conquest, although we've seen some more one-sided matchups today, I think. But a lot of it does come down to the two weaker decks just try and hit each other a little bit and hope. Yeah. Um, I'm not, I don't know about this rogue deck. I think it might be fine here. Like, my instinct says... My instinct's not very good against Mage, keep saying that, but that the rogue will get enough time just to make a bunch of 8-8s, and, and that should do it. I don't think the Mage is going to combo quick enough, so it's a case of the freeze. Is there enough freeze mm. for the mage to stop this from going off but with neophytes in decks and... well well that's it it's oh, um no. you, you're a shadow step and a neophyte away from a good time a lot of the time right and then also you can stealth these mechs too which is a big yeah. deal um i hope subtle has uh, enjoyed the order in which the key cards have appeared uh, so one special one for subtle that one um uh, but yeah i uh eight and three nice. <laughs> but i uh i i think Again, a rogue has game, right? You can do this. There is the stealth. Uh, there is the neophyte specifically against mage. Uh, but you need to hit it. And most importantly, you need that gaslight gatekeeper, right? That is the card that really unlocks the deck, even when you play it as early as turn three or turn four. Like, that is what you want to do. Card draw, card draw, or card generation as much as you can. And then gaslight gatekeeper, and then go is basically the way the deck's played at least yeah. in the initial openings of games so that's what Requiem will be looking for we'll see how it works out uh, once the players get into the game but yeah for me at this point Lorinda could easily go either way if Rekvam takes his time again, like we saw it in one of the early games in this match, it could be a little bit awkward and let Molstar gather all these freeze effects and sort of controlling effects. Uh, but if Rekvam does the thing on three or four, that is extremely early for the mage to be able to fight back. Yeah, I think I think if Rekvam does it on say turn four, I think this game would end fairly quickly. Um, obviously, there's always generated blizzards and things can slow things down, but yeah, we're missing good old go Frost Nova. Nowadays, so yeah, I actually you said that. Rogue, I think you just get him. <laughs> I said that when I was playing. Uh, it's people watching like a few days ago. Now I was like, I was like, do you guys remember Frost Nova? What a card! <laughs> like, there are so it's many so cards right, right now that are like kind of ish Frost Nova, but they're not quite Frost Nova. Uh, it's glorious. But let's get into it. Game five of this match. The winner moves on to the final day of the Masters Tour Spring Championship. The loser gets knocked down into their lower bracket of Group B. 
Let's see how this one's going to go. Molestar on the top on the mage. Rekvam on this rogue. A bit of a crack of the neck. And uh, fingers crossed for the mulligan. Yeah, very much so. Um, curious to see what Molestar does with this as well. Does he want the discovers or does he want to trust his deck? The problem is, yeah. Ooh, keeps him fit. Wow. Okay, interesting. I was going to say, the problem is early game. I don't know what you're looking for, right, with the mage in terms of, yeah, yeah. like, what for, from the cards, like, what are you trying to glyph into on turn two? Because you don't really know. Because it depends how the rogue opens. Uh, starting off with a gear shift into gear shift, though, is going to be pretty nice for Wreck, though. Oh, everything must go. Everything's going to be going pretty quickly. Back into the deck. Molestar going to start off getting that infinitized value. Lizard, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's one you're looking there for. It is. Stack those blizzards. Ooh, okay. And that's what he's going to do, isn't it? Molestar is just going to go on a big freezing trip. Hmm. Just make space in hand, gets you some armor, and allows you to do it all again. I think I like this. Um, we glyphing? Yeah, molten runes probably tempting for a second, but a cheap glyph is a cheap glyph. He's just assembling the deck he should have brought. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to go quick pick and I really start to try and stack the hand. And even though we've talked a lot about, you know, you want to pop off on turn three or four as rogue, um, if you don't exactly do that, this is the thing you want to be doing, which is start stacking the hand, drawing cards and fishing for that key set of combos. There's a playhouse giant, another everything must go, but it's just not hitting the gaslight. There is no card draw there now, no. Or no. A gaslight would change everything. Another really blizzard. Weird. It's got to be right. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a I'm a, I'm a Blizzard enjoyer right now. Not only uh, in this game, but um, in general. Mm -hmm. uh, freeze to stop the card draw. Maybe start stacking armor. Get the escaping trog down as well, just for a little bit of extra pressure sprinkled on. Break dance. <gasps> uh oh. Gotta be Mim, right? Yeah. Oh, this is the problem. The deck is so reliant. Oh, I don't know whether reliant is too strong a word, but it's so much weaker when you don't have Gaslight by now. Like the difference in power level is absurd. Yeah. And now we can see just Molestar chilling on the blizzards. As Wheel mean, of yeah. Death, go! Ooh. <laughs> Behave yourself, right? Look, you know it, I know it, chat knows it. We all wanted to see Wheel of Death. There's not subtle here to keep you under control if you go off the rails. Exactly. I will join in with you and it will be a mess. Yeah. I've even moved my location so I can't be found now. There's no way to stop me. Yeah, he's coming to get you, don't worry about that. He doesn't know where I am. There it is. There is a last Sigh last of relief card. here from Rekvam, because this is the card. Okay. Still needs to draw. Ah, oh, there we go. Shadow Step. Oh, that's so big. Okay. I think, yeah, everything Easy must go. Well. Shadow Step, go again. Surely. He's got it, right? Oh, he's going to... He's gonna... Prep my... Ah, oh, Prep mic drop to... To draw more cards. Yeah, th this is also fine. As long as Shadow Step and Gaslight happens. Yeah, sure. Okay. Drop coins just to give a little bit more wiggle room. One less card drawn, but uh, one more mana, so reasonable trade. That's what you fancy. 
Really wants the max. At least oh my one. Goodness, no? where are they? Oh no. Okay, that's not too bad. No, um. Oh no, what's the name of the card? What's the one that bounces it back? Break? Um, break dance? Breakdance? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah I, just, I just blanked then. Uh, but yeah, no breakdance is kind of rough. Well. Still got decent stuff on the board, though. It's only 25, well, the, but it's just going to keep getting frozen now. That's the problem. Ah, yeah, but the big thing here is, I think, for Molstar is Molstar does not have to Blizzard. This is a very not Blizzard blizzard needed board i was very eloquent there um true but yeah this is not threatening enough i don't think when you know basically what the rogue is capable of this is a very low power level i think uh, most i can just deal with this uh, manually yep yeah, i like right. it that's exactly what he's done yeah. creates an elemental as well and again this is going to be a nightmare because if Rekvam just plays eight eights even if Molestar has to be in desperation mold, uh, mold, mold, <laughs> mode, um, uh, he could just trade the water elemental into one of the eight eights to freeze it out. It's another giant, though. Right, plenty he can put down. Again, we we can see that these things aren't attacking face for any is time, this... but he's, he's got to make the best board he can. Surely, yeah. Is this, yeah, magnetic giant giant? See what the magnets do, and then shadow step the. Uh, gaslight again? Sure, yeah. Let's try and get some breakdancing going. Get your um, copies, yep. Oh, we're gonna hold? Wow. Okay. Oh, no, uh, he could still do it. No, no, yeah, he could still do it. He's got one left, right? I was gonna say, he's got more confidence in the matchup than me if he thinks he's going to turn eight or nine. So, getting him down now feels right. Oh, I'm not gonna go for the shadow step. Okay. Yeah, this is rough. Stealth. So, yeah. Was the stealth better, though? Because this A8 can get frozen, no problem. The Shadow Step would have gave options for Breakdance, which just... Because the problem now is, if these die... Yeah, he's done, if these die. That's just game, right? I I, yeah. I think, because the... both Breakdancers are still on the deck, and but there's nothing left to Breakdance. Yep, agreed. Yeah, I think Rekfam just... Uh... Got a bit of a rough end of the stick here. I'm really surprised he could have shadow stepped and gone for the uh, the gaslight a bit earlier and not had not done all the the bots thing. Even though I do understand stealth is strong here. Yeah, I think he's just seeing he's feeling it a bit, but also he's just seeing no way to get there through what we yeah. can see. We can see the double and... blizzard. I think he thinks he just <laughs> might get there. We can see it just doesn't. Yeah. And most this of is... 48, like, I, yeah. and even that the fact. Still not requiring a blizzard. Really good. Uh, I, I tell you what, Molstar and Yala should be friends. Um, oh, okay. Breakdance there. Fine. So he gets to do the breakdance if he wants. The problem is now he's, he's, he's kind of just dead. Even he if it's just blizzard, just go face with the minions. Blizzard, go face with the minions. Game. <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah. Man, it's like... And also, there's we like cre blizzards. there's like cre creation shadow step as well. <laughs> Oof, this is a rough one. I just can't yeah. believe in this matchup, Molstar picked Blizzard early, which was perfect and correct, and he's just chilling with them. <laughs> he's just not like, yeah. no, I don't need him yet. It's fine. That was made available by the fact he kept the infinitize yeah, uh, yeah, of yeah, the yeah. Um, mulligan and just decided to go looking for stuff that would save the game if he got in trouble, and that's what he did. Yep, 22 with the yeah. Wind Fury, but the armor's going to keep Molestar very safe indeed. And now here comes the ice. Unless it's lethal. Which I don't think it is, but there, there might yeah, be. Yeah, I don't for think it here. is, but yeah. And I don't think. There's any punish for Blizzard, right? There's no, like, no. unfreezing, and these don't have charge or anything, right? So there's no... There's no other the little mini-bots left, so it's not like... 
the hands full of mini bots, so it's like if they freeze, you wreck them, can bounce them back and then play them and then have like lifesteal rush or something. So I don't think there's any great punish for Blizzard in here. So I think this is extremely likely to lock out the game. Yep. Uh, getting the armor back just in case. Yeah, why, why not? not, right? Yeah, it just doesn't matter, like whatever. There's no mechs left. As far as I can recall, I may be yeah, wrong. Yeah, no Titan or anything crazy hanging in there, so... You know. Oh, no. Mimron's there. I forgot okay. about Mimron, I'll be honest. <laughs> but yeah, Molstar can basically just do whatever because there's just another Blizzard. And then there's still Glyph. There's still the, um, the creations as well. There's the armor from the Freeze if required. He's just got every base covered at this point. Yep. Just have your last look. See if anything so, Rekfan's looking for stealth. Doesn't hit. Wrong blue. I think it's the wrong blue. Yeah, I don't think that's stealth, no. I've had trouble with those blues in the past. <laughs> yeah, pretty sad. Still no lethal there. <laughs> it's double infinitized to keep going fishing if it wants. But again, like, just another blizzard and it's just done, right? Is there a way that's like blizzard and then sleep again just to put a little bit more damage on board? I think most times uh, just fishing for lethal. Yeah, I think he's just checking first for lethals and then he's going to blizzard when he runs out of mana. Yeah. Fine, blizzard yeah. push three more. Infinitize if he wants for zero. Probably. Yeah, it can go fishing for damage if he wanted to. I think it just leaves it open. Now, Mimiron. Can Mimiron achieve anything? It's a turn nine mage that couldn't do six damage. How silly. <laughs> They've always got six. They gained a million armor, though. Yeah, I mean, he's absolutely the right play. It's just, why haven't you got six, you silly mage? <laughs> And to be fair, if he hadn't had to spend five on the blizzard, he could probably have found lethal in another way. But why why risk it? Oh yeah, there's just that that's it. That's how um sort of one dimensional the blizzard is in this matchup, right? It's just well if I blizzard you you, you can't attack me. Done. Like that that's the end of conversation. The weapons are gone, uh, the buff to like attack uh, for the weapons are gone. There's just like nothing really. I don't think that there's like everything must go is like a really small outlier, but I don't think there's actually anything it can create that would cause a Molestar a problem at this point. Neophyte's going to be a little bit annoying. Yeah. Just adds a check to the number of times you get to discover and stuff, but mm. it's absolutely fine. I'm not sure what the Creations is on, but I think with these Blizzards softening the board up, that Creations just does the job. Again, same as we've talked about. There's no reason to take any risk on 39. The 8-8s eight are all gone. Yep. Everything's off the board. There's no win condition left for Rekvam. You don't actually have to do that last six damage. Of course, Rekvam can't kill you. Look, he's only got two more cards in deck. Yeah, there's, like I said, there's everything must go as, like, one last ditch effort, but another blizzard. Take it. Um, but I can't <laughs> think of, of another... <laughs> Yeah, hundred oh, percent. Look, Mole Star is an acolyte of Yala, surely, because there was an option to have a, a spell that dealt damage to face. He just picked Blizzard again. It's like, nope. Yeah. Oh. oh. I mean, it's not Surprise. enough, but it's a cool outcome. It's something I didn't Five really consider. Yeah. <laughs> All right, if we can just keep the Dragon Bane alive for the next ten turns. Yeah, imagine if you rolled two of them. <laughs> Still wouldn't be enough, but it'd be more exciting. Hey, there's still Celeste. Uh, oh, yeah, can't do it, can he? Won't be enough. I was looking at manner of whether it's like uh, projectionist again. <laughs> just, just pop off. Okay. It's a good effort. <laughs> I'm just smiling. It's like, oh, I'm going to make you win this game of Hearthstone, whether you like it or not. Fishing for lethal? Glyph? Fishing for lethal? <laughs> Frostbolts, kind of. Three, five. Maybe. 
please. Just make it end. Oh, no, it yeah, is with ping. Yeah, sorry. Ping. Thank yeah, yeah, I, I missed that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there you have it. What a match. Rekvam almost managed to claw it back, but the rogue just let him down again. And Molestar, oof, popping off with a celebration as well. Let's yeah. go. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad he stopped there. I don't think that's something we can broadcast if he kept going. But yeah, congratulations to Molestar. A uh, really good win, and I think um, cool, calm, and collected. I think he was just chill. And yeah, it was a tough series. It's not like it was easy. It's like he ran Rekvam over. Rekvam definitely uh, put a lot of pressure on there. But I think Molestar really is just showing his, how comfortable he is with his lineup. Yep, nice to see somebody um, playing control in this field. It's a very not controly field. It's a very not controly meta, really. It's slightly slow, but it's not particularly slow. Um, and yeah, interesting to see somebody bringing the lineup again. The mage is going to be my question all weekend, but he got it done through to Sunday already. He can put his feet up for two days. For two days? I'm not, not sure how day days now. work. Yeah, I was going to say, bro. It's, it's nearly bedtime where, where I am right now, so uh, yeah, two days is a stretch, but yeah, congr <laughs> congratulations to Molestar there. I think, um, like I said, comfortable with the lists, good knowledge of the matchups, uh, and just a really good uh, uh, ideas of how to win those ones. So really big win over Rekvam there. Uh, congratulations to Molestar. Rekvam is not out, though. I know there are a lot of Rekvam fans, uh, but as you can see, as we take a look at the updated bracket for Group B, he is in that decider match. So he, he, if he wins the next one, he's still through. A little bit more of a tough go of it, but he can still get there. But of course, we have his opponent to find out, which is Kimchi Slap versus Gamer RVG. Uh, so we'll get an update on that very, very soon. But uh, yeah, definitely a, a cool match. I'm really glad. Uh, I really enjoyed casting that one, Lorinda. It was a it was a longer five game series, but it was a very interesting five game series. Yeah, it was. It was interesting. It was clash of styles or clash of matchup lineups, whatever. Anyway. Mm. Um, Looked like Rekvam was finally turned the corner there. The, the first two games didn't feel like games at all. Like It, it feels like um, that Shaman deck is pretty terrifying. Obviously, Warrior is, is scary. The DK in the hands of a good player looks good. Mm. The Mage looked like Rekvam might have got through it, but no. Um, Molestar just came good. Showed what we've heard from people who know him for the last few days, that he's a very good control player. But he's got to keep it up for all of Sunday if he is going to get to the World Championships. Yeah, that was just our first broadcast match from Group B, but we've got more where that came from. We're going to go to a quick break while we set up the next one for you guys, so make sure to stick around, and we'll be right back after this.
Welcome back to the first Masters Tour of 2024. We are here for this Spring Championship. And to continue the action, I am Dragon Rider, joined this time by TJ. How you doing today? Doing great. Doing great. It's been a while since we've got to uh, watch and cast some competitive Hearthstone. And I've been enjoying today. We've had some, some grueling games, to be quite honest. Some grueling matchups. Uh, and it's been fun. It's been fun to watch. Yeah, I think there's some really interesting things with the lineup this time around uh, of the players, plus the actual lineups of decks that all of those players brought. Like, it just feels like a really cool event overall. Uh, we have a couple different kind of storylines, these very familiar names that a lot of people are uh, kind of already familiar with that we saw with Yarla, for example, in the first group. Uh, but now we're getting to see a couple players who you may or may not have heard of before. Uh, and first we have Kim Chi Slap here, who has been in quite a few Masters tours, uh, but this time around in this big top 16. Yeah, this matchup is going to be quite difficult for me to, for who to root for because Kim Chi Slap has the name to end all names. Uh, but Gamer RVG is the America's representative uh, the the last hope of the Americas for the past um, I don't know year has held that title, <laughs> so uh, that's going to be tough. One thing I do appreciate about Kimchi Slap is uh, he's a Hearthstone Brew gamer in a couple of decks, which a couple of decks is above average for amounts of Hearthstone Brew uh, in a tournament lineup. So I'm very excited to see. Uh, what these are going to hold. But right now, we're just looking at the pretty standard Chopper DH. Hearthstone Brew is kind of just there for that refill once you uh, sort of run completely out of stuff. Um, and Gamer RVG there we see uh, did have a second place finish at Grandmasters first season for Americas. Can you do yeah. something like that again? We'll find out. Yeah, it's it's... Game RVG was one of those players in Grandmasters that was, I don't want to say underrated, uh, but kept sneaking out wins against some of the top players. Um, when Game RVG was very new, uh, so I'm, I've definitely grown to really enjoy Game RVG's gameplay. And uh, the other thing is, I've really come to enjoy the bunk bed, um, which I hope that is playing under still find out uh but look at this shaman uh i think uh, it was touched on a little bit earlier the nature shaman that has kind of been uh changed up a little bit and we'll see how it fares this is not uh running the jives and it's not quite the uh full uh shutter block kind of control version that we just saw from molstar uh, but instead, this does focus a little bit more on the spell damage and just trying to put together a lot of uh, a lot of those big turns to be able to pop off, create a lot of damage in one turn. Uh, but I will say, the matchup for Warrior into the Shaman, not good for the Shaman, uh, which I think is probably a big reason why we did see Gamer RVG actually uh, go ahead and just ban the Warrior for uh, Kimchi on the other side. Yeah, it's uh, this version especially of the Shaman does not fare well against Warrior. It does consistently provide um, the damage reach, but you don't kind of have that X factor uh, of the conductivity plus uh, plus drive. So uh, we'll see how it's going to fare against the uh, the rest of the lineups. Um, what one thing to note. Um, Never mind. I don't want to note it because Gamer RVG has already won with the Warrior. So I got that well, backwards, even though we talked about it right before this this went on, that it was Kimchi Slap that I uh, was playing the Warlock in that first game that we missed. So yeah. well, now well, you'll just have to, uh, to know, right? not know forever. 
That's right. Well, we'll we'll say that the note is to point out that they did play the first uh, game of this match uh, off stream while the other series uh, that went to that quite long game five uh, was finishing up. So yeah, we do have Gamer RVG already up 1-0 with that warrior beating Kimchi Slap's Warlock, uh, which is that kind of what we're calling custom Warlock. Uh, very interesting to see uh, what's going to happen now, because now uh, that means Gamer RVG just has to win with uh, his own custom Warlock or that Shaman. Yeah, the, so I will say, as we wait for these players to get in here, because this is relevant, because Kimchi Slap actually does have it in his lineup, it's not banned. Uh, the deck that I've been impressed the most by um, so far this tournament, and this is going to come to as no surprise to, to anybody, is the Priest. The Priest just feels like, even when it loses, it at least had a good chance, you know? Um, so I... This variation of the priest uh, from Kimchi Slap uh, is one of one of my favorites. Um, does have the Heart Stone Brute in there uh, for that little bit of extra juice right at the end. We've seen players not really need that little bit of extra juice, but it has um, it, it's there. The priest, you can never really count them out, especially since that extra turn provides you with so much room for tempo. If a game's going to go late, especially. It, we, we saw that game from Rekvam just in the previous series where uh, really was just counted out nonstop. And just the ability to uh, have 10 mana available, have the funnel cakes, uh, be able to copy the Zilliacs. There's just so many crazy things you can do. Um, and I feel like that's kind of the X factor of this deck. Um, if it was last year standing, I'd put all my chips on Priest. Uh, to just be that that deck that can sweep because it can beat anything. So uh, we'll see uh, if Kimchi Slap's going to be able to uh, use that well uh, throughout this matchup. It's, I mean, it, it's almost going to have to take a win on the first shot because being down one zero in the series, uh, you're going to have to likely win some some unfavorables in order to get the job done. Yeah, which I did want to ask you how you feel about uh, these two lineups versus each other, because I feel like uh, the decks that were banned out leave quite a few kind of very, um, I would say, even or close to even matchups, I feel like, between these two lineups. So I'm kind of curious how you feel about that. Do you think that these matchups that we're going to see here are a little bit um, closer together and not as kind of... Uh, varied or polarized as what we may have mentioned in previous uh, discussions well i think that first uh first matchup uh went a long way i think gamer rvg starting off with a warrior win um was a big deal because looking at the lineup side by side i do think that it was quite even um maybe with a a, a slight favorable to gamer rvg despite the priest uh, but winning that first first series or that first game in the series is a big deal because now he's got a little bit of wiggle room. And there's the bunk bed! <laughs> it's still there. It's just as it's just as glorious as I remember it. It is it is fantastic. It actually looks uh, like it's changed up in format slightly. Um uh since the last time I've seen it. I think the ladder might have moved back a little bit. The storage is slightly different. Um yeah, but nonetheless, it's, good. it's gonna be Warlock versus the Demon Hunter to kick kick things off. And I would say uh, they both have not terrible looking starting hands. Uh, Kimchi Slap on the Demon Hunter. Going to be able to go in with the instrument tech on turn two, be able to find that uh, umpire's grasp and start getting to that shopper. And on the other side, Gamer RVG uh, does, I guess, is going to go ahead and just coin into this geode here. But being able to start uh, dealing some of that damage to his own hero and be able to get additional card draw out of this seems very, very good. Using the coin there, though, does mean that turn two uh, might have to be some sort of combination of trading off the Speaker Stomper or maybe just going for a hero power, which I, I know we've kind of talked about this and it was brought up quite a bit in the previous series. To me, it sounds so weird saying, 
hey, you know how this warlock wants to deal damage to themselves? Yeah, the hero power is too little too little damage. <laughs> no, no, no. You don't want to deal two damage to yourself. You need to be doing three, five. And just a hero power is actually not enough damage to yourself. Yeah, it's... Coin that out just accelerates the clock because you're using that coin to get that damage just a little bit faster. Um, which, like you said, very important. Um, the hero power, I feel like you have so many plays to make on curve that it doesn't really make sense to just try and fit it in in, in, you know, in between playing cards. The deck does rely a lot on tempo. It is sort of that uh, board flood deck and the life taps kind of just there as a as a backup plan. Yeah. Yeah, we saw a gamer go for that fracking just to discover and had the option for going for a flame imp, which could have fit in with the turn. Uh, but I really liked that choice of just taking the Molten Giant. There's already two Forge of Wills in hand. And going into turn three, we're going to see this Malefic Rook come down, which just is so good. Now we get the Imprisoned Horror coming out. This Molten Giant going to be able to come out very, very quickly, which I think in some of the other matches, we didn't even get to see Molten Giants come out with the Custom Warlock uh, until a little bit later. So we're going to be able to see the very quick Giant here, which... I think is going to be potentially difficult for Kim Chi Slap to deal with uh, on the other side if Kim Chi Slap wants to just go for using this weapon and going for shoppers. But the red card might have to be used a little bit more defensively to uh, kind of keep the Molten Giants uh, a little bit sleepy for a couple turns. Still a lot of damage being presented on board, however. Yeah. And you only got uh, so many red cards. <laughs> yes. To put him to sleep. I, I guess Kimchi here is probably just thinking, you know, how badly do I want to fight for this board versus go face? Yeah. And this is a, an interesting turn here, I think, as well. Something that was mentioned before is kind of that difference between the turn four shopper plus the mini coming down or that turn five. Uh, Kimchi Slap going to go for the three cost shopper and just a salesman. But I would say didn't didn't really get the uh, early board presence that you kind of would have liked to see in this matchup, either to start fighting board or to start chipping away. Uh, at damage, which feels a little weird against this Warlock, though, because do you actually want to deal damage to them and allow them to play a Molten Giant earlier? Or do you want to kind of hold off, let them deal that damage to themselves, and then try somehow to save up uh, some attack damage and hit them with a weapon swing? But Kimchi Slap not really able to do some of that here, and I wonder if the Metamorphosis uh, was the other potential, right? Instead of going for the board, just go for that metamorphosis and hope to close out the game in the next turn or two with over-the-top damage. Yeah, the, the problem with that is that would have been Kimchi Slap's entire turn yeah. uh, without even activating the hero power. You're giving up board, you're letting Gamer yeah. RVG um, just do whatever. Um and it means you're limited to just that single game plan uh, of trying to go face. Ended up going face anyway, but now it can kind of weave in. But now that option's kind of gone. Um, just because there's too much damage being represented on board. The red card is there. Um, the Observer uh, might be able to buy some time, but it's so, the effect is so random uh, that you, you have no idea if it's even going to impact your board whatsoever so yeah and the shopper discovers are interesting in this matchup as well um you know, the mana wasn't there to play whatever was discovered off of the first shopper anyways but at this point now if kimchi slap even wanted to play the mini Something like uh, just going for finding a Magtheridon doesn't do much against the board. It would have to be over multiple turns. Yeah.
Okay, well, there's 18 right now. So one of the six <laughs> damage effects, okay, goes for the lifesteal. It's going to be just one off, but it's still just such a big health swing. That it should be enough to get the job done. Game RPG just sat back like, okay, that's what I needed. That little, I needed that little <laughs> yeah. bit of extra breathing room in order to really get this done. I mean, that little bit, but it almost just felt like Gamer RVG was really in, I, I don't want to say in control of this game, but in the the driver's seat, just putting out all of these answers, forcing Kimchi Slap to actually respond to this. And even though Kimchi Slap got that amazing uh, kind of start with instrument tech into the weapon, being able to play Shopper, that was way too slow compared to what Gamer was able to do. Uh, okay. A little bit of damage. Hope to get some good secrets. Red card. Well, it's a mage and a warlock secret. Yeah. Or a mage and a hunter secret. He's a warlock. <laughs> <laughs> I, guess, I guess you just smack into it, right? There's nothing else you can do. Slightly awkward, though, because you really have no idea what those are, and you can't afford to really hold the turn. If it's Freezing Trap, whether or not you go face or anything, I guess you check for Freezing first with the uh, Forge of Souls. Yeah. At least to uh, uh, get rid of that possibility. Can also gain some health uh, with the Ziliax now that you have another minion in play. Oh, this is kind of interesting, too. If this, uh, it ends up being the freezing trap, but there is kind of that debate of if it ends up being uh, the plus, or, uh, plus stats to a minion. Not really relevant in that case because there was lethal after that. So really just had a test yeah. for the freezing. But yeah, sometimes those secrets just are so interesting uh, to kind of figure out. But you mentioned it the turn before those secrets weren't really doing much and then they came down when mm -hmm. i feel like it made even less of an impact so yeah unfortunate uh there for kimchi slap but uh pretty pretty good game here for rvg being able to just get all of these minions on board uh heal up a little bit as you said and just be able to stay in the game that little bit longer to be able to close it out yeah, that was a a nicely done game. Even going back to just the uh, the coin play uh, to get that damage rolling, just to calculate uh, when when to be able to get that pressure down. So um, nicely done, and that's a two zero lead right now for Gamer RVG, and only the shaman remaining. Which we we've seen the shaman um, be a little bit hit or miss. Uh, so far today, obviously, we've seen multiple variations of the Shaman. Uh, but I do still think it is one of the stronger decks out there. It just kind of needs to line up to the right matchup because it does have the more polarizing matchups. As as you mentioned, this is the more nature, uh, the nature Shaman, uh, <clears throat> more focused on that spell damage and those big turns with lots of burst damage. You can see the Spirit Claws. Um, the extra spell damage uh, with the Cobalt Geomancer. Um, so really akin to the uh, classic uh, Nature Shaman uh, in that regard. Yeah, I, I would say notably one of the, well, there's just kind of two big differences uh, from this version from the previous versions, which is there is uh, no longer people are running uh, the two threes anymore so you don't get quite as much of uh 
the kind of tempo board presence. I think that's another reason why people are kind of running the cactus cutters a little bit too, adds a little bit of draw. Uh, but notably, the biggest thing is that not only did we have a new expansion, uh, which added a few cards like pop-up book that we're seeing, uh, but there was also the rotation. And that means that bioluminescence is no longer available uh, for these nature shamans to be running for the really big burst turns. So they do have to rely a little bit more on discovering, finding more additional damage through additional spells, rather than relying on just the spell damage and, and using those minions on board. Yeah, you, you do have ways to buy yourself a little bit more more time, but again, no no really tempo options. Um I guess Miracle Salesman is enough tempo and it has the added benefit of giving that snake oil, which does have some flexibility and can be used as spell damage burst later on. But let's get into a potential last game of the match here for Kimchi Slap and Gamer RBG. Uh, a little bit of an awkward hand for gamer rpg but it can come together quite nicely uh with a couple of draws does have um the Golganess ready to go which is a, a key part of basically any matchup always nice to see and we do have kimchi slap having the the uh umpire's grasp there is a window shopper in hand though so it could run into a little bit of an awkward situation if the second one's pick up before the weapon uh, comes online. Could. I, I think the helpful thing for Kimchi Slap is having that coin available, though, to be able to just coin that out next turn uh, and then get that Umpire's Grasp uh, solved or uh, Death Rattle triggered before hopefully drawing the second Window Shopper. But you never know. As Hearthstone, the uh, draw order could always be <laughs> a pain to deal with. Uh, but I think with how many cards are left, this is a pretty good setup for Kimchi Slap here. Just hoping to not draw that next turn. And unfortunately for Gamer, so far, not really, not really the cards he wants early in the game. Yeah. He's just going to spend mana here, try and preserve some health. Uh, gets Taunt Totem as well, so I'll... A solid amount of health preserved. But does need something to get these cards online. Might have to pre use a, an early lightning reflexes just to have uh, kind of playable turns. Ooh. The Bassist or Inquisitor. Both possibilities here from the first half of the Window Shopper. Both are pretty good options. Which one do you feel like you want to lean towards if you're picking these. I mean, Inquisitor is just damage as long as you can get it through. Yeah. There's a just a slight cost difference because of the effect on the basis, but Inquisitor just allows you to double up on the damage if it sticks. Yeah, yeah, the added uh, discount on the bassist is really nice. It can't be played this turn, though. So, yeah, I was going to say, I think if, uh, kind of as you said, it is damage. But if you're having to wait to play it to a different turn anyways, I feel like just going for the Inquisitor uh, it just feels like it gives you the best odds in the coming turns. Yeah. In an ideal world, Gamer RPG has a pretty dead turn this turn, and the next turn you get to play the Inquisitor, rush it into the frog. And then you're pushing oh, 14 damage next turn, <laughs> uh, which is pretty absurd and just makes the rest of the game just that much easier. Gamer RPG just picks, does pick up a nice card here with the Ancestral Knowledge that also activates the Flow Rider. So looking a little bit better, and the overload is getting out of the way uh, right before turn five, which means that Game RPG can set up for Lilith on turn six, uh, which is looking like that's going to have to be the game plan, assuming Game RPG is even alive <laughs> at that point, because Kimchi Slap is loading up, loading up a bunch of Kimchi in his hand to give a big old slap. 
I mean, uh, yeah, it's still being in the game is okay. kind of important for uh, trying to win. So I would say that that definitely being in the game still would benefit gamer RVG. Um, I am a little interested as well. This I feel like was kind of a decision of having previously seen the window shopper come down and knowing that there is likely to be a discounted minion coming down or the mini is still coming down now at this point. Uh, but I feel like gamer RVG really kind of had to decide last turn of, okay, I saw the discover there's demons in hand. Do I want to set up more taunt right now and not go in on not the zapper potentially go in on it next turn. But if I do go in on it next turn, going to be overloaded and can't go into Golganath. But also again, like you said, is is this going all the way to game or uh, to turn six or is a uh, gamer going to have to kind of commit something like a zapper and board removal potentially next turn and just hold out as long as possible that's gonna be tough to deal with <laughs> i don't know if yeah. we're getting to six i don't think so yeah uh, no Ancestral knowledge, you don't, again, you don't really want to overload because you want the Golgoneth next turn. Um, maybe Lightning Reflex and try and find something. You can get Altered Cord. Because um, there is some yeah. overload. I think that's a necessity at this point. Uh, not really much else to do. If you deal with that 7-6, then you are setting up for a pretty nice Golgoneth next turn to be able to clear and heal based off what you can see. Yeah. Still hasn't seen... Oh, we're going to go with Flash first. Okay. So the Amphibious Elixir does heal, but it doesn't answer the minions on board. So it doesn't do quite as much as... Uh, the removal option you were talking about if uh, that had been discovered from lightning reflexes. Um. Yeah, but if you don't hit it, you know, then what's yeah. the plan? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Aftershock is fantastic. Because next turn, Golgoneth uh, into Aftershock as the free spell would be enough to clear all this up from the board. Um. The POSIC, though, is quite interesting. That provides a little bit of uh, protection from um, AoE that's rather expected from Kimchi Slap at this point, uh, given the plays thus far. Uh, Illidar Inquisitor represents a great opportunity to push damage, but it's almost always going to be there. Whereas the POSIC, you can kind of protect this board, but how likely is the AoE going to be able to clear the board? Um, I think it's, yeah, I, I like it. I like it. You're still pushing the damage on board. You get to hold on to the Inquisitor, and you have that protection from AoE. I like the uh, the positive that was drawn off the top here. Yeah, I, I do too. I think, uh, looking at there was only 22 uh, possible damage to push that turn if Kimchi had gone for like, hero power plus the Illidari Inquisitor. Uh, but then, do you have to worry about if you go all in like that, even just trying to set Gamer RVG down pretty low, uh, I guess there would have been an additional three uh, from the uh, Magtheridon still, but not. it still just was slightly off of a lethal. And then if the board clear comes, or there's clear and heal, then Pazic just kind of sits there and doesn't do quite as much on the following turn. So I do, I do agree. Just putting out this pressure now with the Pazic, forcing the clear and then being able to push additional damage afterwards. Yeah. Still actually going to be a clear, though, with the uh, smack from the Spirit Claws. Um, so that Aftershock. Oh, yeah. I think we're just unable to see the Discover options here. Oh, OK. <clears throat> yeah. Maybe looking for cheap nature spells to try and get Crash of Thunder out. Um, I don't know. A little bit surprised by the lightning reflexes there. Because if you hit 
double like one cost or less uh, with the flash, um, flash of lightning, nature spells, the crash could have come down, and then I guess you could draw with the Golgoneth, but I, I think the heal was kind of necessary at that point. Yeah, um, I, I wonder if the the out was potentially just trying to find a pop-up book that would have been discounted and free just to put up another couple of taunts as well. Yeah, maybe. But, Game RPG down... Oh, nope, that's... With the red card, that's enough. Yeah. <laughs> thought it was yeah, going to be one off, but we had the uh, <laughs> extra attack damage. Yep, and that's the second time we've seen the... Would it be an offensive or a defensive red card? I guess an offensive red card. Yeah, yeah, uh, let's go offensive. Uh, to be able to seal it up. So, very nicely done. Um, but yeah, the pop-up book's a good call-out in terms of... Uh, what game RBG could be looking for. That's a tough game, though. Nothing really to do in the yeah. opening. Had to use both pop-up books just to block early damage. And Kimchi Slap just happened to have the cards that could kind of uh, bypass those taunts a little bit in the form of the Magtheridon picked up from the uh, miniaturized uh, Window Shopper. And was able to cl clear out, uh, finish off the game with that Illidare Inquisitor that was being held on to. Uh, even though the Posic was cleared, I did like uh, that play on the previous turn, just to make things just that much more awkward for Gamer RBG. Yeah. Uh, but now, it, Gamer RBG is not immortal. <laughs> Can hey, lose a game. You know, you know what, TJ? I am just glad that on the day one of a tournament that I am casting, I finally get to cast a match that is not a 3-0. I think this is the first out of like six that I've done in a row now that's not just going to be ending in 3-0. So we made it, finally. Well, the 3-0s that have been happening today have been long 3-0s. They've been good 3-0s. We kicked off the day with a, yeah. um, a very good one that was well over an hour, uh, which for a 3-0 you'd expect to be... Uh, much shorter than that, but I'm glad you got uh, your wish. Uh, there shall be look, no uh, sweeps uh, here. <laughs> look, it, the the three O's that I somehow cast on day ones are always like 15 minute entire matches. It's like you blink and you miss it. So look, we're yeah. not getting to that point in this one. Finally, we did it. Mom, we made it. All right, here we go. Getting into, again, potentially game winning point for our uh, gamer RVG with that shaman still has to get a win on the shaman and kimchi slap now coming in with this zarimi priest okay you're, you're a big fan the best deck <laughs> to ever exist in the history of decks it's really not it's good <laughs> um but we have a uh interesting variation from kimchi slap i i do like it um, it's got the double um, speaker stomper, which I, I find a little bit interesting. Obviously, you want to protect your board, and that's a good card to do it. Um, but in some matchups, the speaker stomper you actually don't want. And when every man accounts in a deck that's so board focused, like this one. Even just the fact that it's tradable may not necessarily be like that huge of an upside, uh, but does throw it away. And the opening hand looks pretty reasonable uh, for Kimchi Slap. It's obviously not the best opening hand I've seen. Um, no dragon for the gift wrap whelp, but does have a, a play on one and a reasonable curve. Uh, this is one that's missing another cheap dragon and a funnel cake, and we're cooking. Yeah. And on the other side, I would say for uh, Gamer RVG, this is not really the best looking starting hand uh, either. But I know for Shaman especially, uh, Saddle was mentioning earlier about that uh, Speaker Stomper inclusions in a lot of these decks uh, and even the Cult Neo fights. And if you look too, it's, uh, it's very interesting. There is double Speaker Stomper in the Demon Hunter for uh kimchi slap that we just saw there is double speaker stomper in this priest and double speaker stomper double neophyte in the warlock uh so yeah definitely seems like 
gamer RVG is maybe going to struggle a little bit with the shaman if that is kind of targeted to this. But also the the draws are just not really doing gamer RVG any favors either. Yeah, uh, specifically against shaman, the the uh, speaker stopper is even better because they're usually yeah. their turns are so so telegraphed. Um, if they play a flash of lightning and are holding on to a lot of cards, speaker stomper, it, it, that's the go button, right? <laughs> so yeah, um, this deck in particular from Game RPG is, is going to struggle, even though uh, got got up to a uh, a good start, which was expected looking at the rest of the decks. This is the one where um, Game RPG probably knew was going to be a tough time. Um, however, if you're up 2-0 and your opponent has to win uh, three in a row, even if you're unfavored by like um, you know 60-40 unfavored in any matchup, you're still favored to win in the overall odds in the series because right. you don't assign your opponent to win three in a row, which no matter what deck you're playing is very difficult to do um, in Hearthstone. Uh, unless you just have the worst deck imaginable, <laughs> but this Nature Shaman is tried and true, so... I mean, RPG. if we're if we're seeing these top sixteen players and they have had to qualify over two months of ladder, I sure hope they are not bringing the worst decks ever. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the, the Miracle Rogue <laughs> is pretty bad. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's not that bad. You, you just have to believe in the heart of the cards, TJ. Thought we had agreed on this already. <laughs> I suppose so. <laughs> ah, in a little bit of a pickle here. If I'm Game RPG, yeah. I'm very worried about that cleric um, because of yep. the possibility of Funnel Keg. It doesn't feel great using the Aftershocks um, just to deal with two minions this early uh, because you know that the Priest is just going to flood the board over and over. However, I feel like that cleric is a little bit too threatening if you're just passing over the turn. Um to potential funnel cake shenanigans and no other way to deal with it. So I like it. And yeah. you can tell Kimchi did not like it. So that means it's a good play for game <laughs> RPG. Now the gift wrap up is still stranded uh, without a dragon to be seen. Really not much synergy going on in the hand whatsoever. Um, I, I might even just play the celestial projectionist here as a tempo play to get something on the board. Uh, but it looks like it is going to be one drop uh, instead. Just getting the uh, non-active gift wrap whelp out to spend the mana, get those Thirsty Drifters a little bit cheaper, and try and save the proje Projectionist to go for a big board with those. Yep. There is a Flash of Lightning and a pop-up book here for Gamer. Could I go like in on the Flash. Yeah. Uh... You got two free lightning reflexes next turn to just try and play for uh, maybe yeah. tempo or, or react to kimchi slap. Because you know there's and... got to be some type of board built next turn, right? Yeah. I think the uh, the discover options from lightning reflexes are really interesting right now at the moment. Uh, there are 16 nature spells, I believe, that uh, that can be discovered. And... Only two of those cost more than five, and even the ones that cost uh, five can easily be discounted to free or one or two. Uh, so really, it's it's pretty easy to play a lot of the things that are discovered off of the reflexes, uh, especially with the added discount. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I kind of like Thirsty Drifter, Thirsty Drifter Dreamboat, because playing the the first Thirsty Drifter is is a one cost. So it'll discount the second one, and then you go full in. I guess this works too. Yeah. Because you're guaranteed a one drop um, dragon, so you're still putting a reasonable amount of power on board. But the Dreamboat represents a lot of damage. Maybe Kimchi Slap's trying to do the dragon math, um, and then using Dreamboat as a follow up. Yeah, it could be a combination of that, plus knowing that uh, that that's what I believe the only the ship's uh, is the only one cost left. 
So, or one cost or cheapest dragon. Uh, so adding a little bit of health uh, to hopefully pad the board a little bit, knowing that there is likely to be at least one crash coming out this next turn after seeing Flash of Lightning's last turn. But oh. look, this is, this is I love what this. I'm talking about. Look at all of these cheap spells. I love and this. so much board removal. The conductivity, pays, amphibious pays elixir combo is just so, so yeah. fun. It's a feral spirit or just getting on board uh, with the turn the tides. This is not necessarily a matchup like we saw with the demon hunter where getting taunts on board is as critical if you're able to just kind of keep the board clear. But it's a pretty effective board clears for gamer rvg yeah and did dump both crashes here because this is basically the all in turn yeah. from from kimchi that's both both thirsty drifters um none copied so no opportunity to do that zarimi not active uh, even with that extra dragon fit in last turn, there really wasn't much played. It was Miracle Salesman Cleric where, where the two one-drops played in the opening hand. So Kimchi Slap doesn't really have anything to do this turn. Um, that That's proactive. Just play the Magatha and then hope that next turn's enough. Uh, the Zerimi might even be two off, which is a little bit awkward for next turn. And even if you drew a funnel cake to try and cheat mana from this Magatha, it'd be handed right back over to Gamer RVG. So, <clears throat> no speaker stomper either picked up for Kimchi in those <laughs> yeah. draws, which is running two of them. Couldn't find unfortunate. How safe do you think Gamer RVG feels here? You, you think he can just kind of commit? both of these flashes uh, or would want to and just kind of draw and then set up for additional cheap stuff next turn. I guess the downside is that did already play his lightning reflexes. So what is he hoping to discount next turn? I, I wouldn't even be surprised if there's like powered synchronize on the flow rider. That'd be uh, fun. There's not even that many nature spells left in the deck, is there? I guess there's a lot, because a lot of the spells that played thus far have been generated. Uh, but it's going to just push damage uh, right now. So Yeah. I mean, I like the potential to draw next turn with the Flash of Lightnings uh, into the Lightning Bolts are pretty great. Or just forcing Kimchi Slap to actually answer these couple of minions and the weapon that's on board as well. Because uh, with having this Blood Mage Thalnos in hand now as well, uh, Gamer RVG doesn't have to rely on a hero power trying to hit the 25% for the uh, spell damage totem to increase the attack on that Spirit Claws. Uh, so that is some added damage plus a decent chance of drawing into additional damage. One thing about this deck is it doesn't really um, have any comeback mechanics on the board outside of taking an extra turn and then using the board that you build to attack your opponent's stuff. You do have Amethyl later. Yeah, which isn't even no way to really interact. A, yeah, it's only six mana currently. So put, just putting up this pop-up book means that these minions are almost always going to connect, and then that's a lethal setup from Gamer RPG on the following turn just from hand. So there's not even anything that needs to be looked for. And there it is, yeah. Gamer RPG giving that little fist bump. Yep, the celebration. that'll be enough. Draws the crash as well. Yep. Who even needs it? You don't need the nature spells. You just get them with the minions on board. Love to see it. That celebratory uh, cheering there for Gamer RVG taking the match three to one and uh, going to be going into 
uh, I believe, the last match of the day now. The last match of the day. Uh, so, yes, this is worthy of celebration. However, there's still some work yet to be done uh, in order to make it to that Sunday. But that was a nice display uh, from GamerRBG. Getting ahead with those two games. Being put on the deck that's got tough matchups across the board. Um, and still finding a way to win at the end. I uh, really love the uh, discovered conductivity um, into Amphibious Elixir play. Uh, just to be able to have a million spells um, it, uh, allowed an aggressive use of spells on that turn to push a little bit of damage and to clean up the board. So very nicely, very nicely done. Yeah. And uh, the speed with which he did that turn as well, just discovering all those spells and just going, uh, definitely shows how well-versed he is in that Shaman deck. So uh, very exciting to see that. Uh, but unfortunately, that does mean that uh, Kimchi Slap has not made it out of the bracket here, which now we'll take a look at that. We're going to see Gamer RVG uh, move up to that decider match to face into Rec Bam next and then we'll get to see which of the two of those will be joining molestar for our group b winners to move into sunday for the top eight i i got my eye on molestar for the top eight on sunday molestar just refuses to lose <laughs> games of hearthstone uh and has the decks that allow him to refuse to lose um which is a very uh, great quality in a Hearthstone player is one that will continuously just try and find outs to delay the game and continuously try and find those fringe case scenarios where you can, can eke out a win. And this is one of those metas where you can do that, uh, I feel. There's a lot of decks where you can uh, pull wins from nowhere. And I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, especially with Hearthstone Brew. You can really pull wins, wins from nowhere uh, with Hearthstone Brew. From nothing. I, I from I, are, are only card in hand, it? just whoop. Well, we, <laughs> are we even going to see it at any point this weekend, though? Some point, right? We've got to see one played. I mean, that's the thing. It's only <laughs> in the... It's like break glass in case of emergency, you know? Break hearth in case that's, of emergency. That's fair. Um, you know, it's 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 the fire extinguisher of a Hearthstone deck. You, you, you hope that you won't have to use it. You hope that you'll just get through that Hearthstone game with no fire. But True. everybody secretly knows that if you do get to use the fire extinguisher, it's really fun. So. All right. So now we know everybody make sure you get on social media uh, and tag TJ with all Where's of the going? fire extinguisher memes. <laughs> Just okay. Spam the fire extinguisher memes. That's, that's I, thought, I thought you were going to condone <laughs> people purposely starting fires in order to. This is a no, metaphorical. No. I, I, Look, I, no, we don't need to do using that. Using a fire extinguisher <laughs> in real life is. is it, I hope you never find yourself in a dire situation. This was purely a metaphor, only for Hearthstone. Hearthstone right. brew is, is cool. Don't try this that's at right. home. Disclaimer, 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 yada, yada. You know All I mean. of the hearth in your hearth in your hearthstone and speaking of that we still have one more match of hearthstone to be played so make sure that you stick around for the last match of our day number one here don't go anywhere we will be right back
Welcome back, everybody. Pietnitzer, Week U, and Molstar have made it through to Sunday, but still one more spot remains, and it is going to be either Recvan or Gamer RVG. And with me to steer through the action is going to be Sotl. Sotl, which one of them do you think is going to make it? Uh, I mean, it's a bold call to be trying to make immediately straight out of the blue like that. Um, I think Gamer RVG played pretty darn well just from keeping 75% of an eye on that series that just went past. Um, I think Rekvam has had a bit more of a struggle to get to this point, I guess, overall. Um, and have I have more lineup questions about Rekvam's lineup, but I also had lineup questions about Rekvam's Worlds lineup when it came into Worlds. Um, and then when you slowly start to break things down over time, you tend to then realize that Rekvam is actually just three steps ahead of you the entire time, and it takes yeah. you a while to, to get on his level with the lineup. So uh, we shall see. Um, I do think there is a lot of interesting matchups uh, in this series, largely because of a decision that Gamer RVG made last minute, uh, where he switched from, I believe, the identical Priest deck that Rekvam is playing to a custom Warlock which has then made this series just a little more interactive between the two. There's far less mirrored decks now with those things going on, which I think is kind of cool and just uh, varies up the matchup spread just a little bit. Yeah, and I think um, the custom Warlock gets the better of that one. And having a look at what I make the matchup match spread to be, which is far less accurate than it used to oh be, God. can't just oh God, steal no. stats anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, I feel that gamers got kind of a decent looking edge in this one, mm -hmm. um, as much as you can. But part of that is down to, can Rogue really beat anything? And Lorinda says no, so that doesn't help the matchup spread as much. Lorinda says no, I see. Yeah, I, but I do like Custom Warlock as a choice for this, uh, generally. Um, I like Rekvan's lineup as a whole. I am yet to see the light on the Shuffle Rogue, particularly because right, I feel like so many of the decks... Um, and players don't like to admit this, right? Like, it's very uncool to talk about how, like, decks are skillful and how you're playing well and beating your opponent, right? But I feel like a lot of decks in Hearthstone do have that right now. Um, there's just, there's lots of flex, po flex points of decisions that need to be made. Um, Priest has it, the Pain Warlock has it, uh, Rainbow Death Knight has it, Shaman certainly has it, especially when everyone in the tournament is playing like eight Speaker Stompers in their deck, then it becomes an yeah. incredibly difficult deck to navigate properly. Whereas to me, this deck from Rekvam, this feels like one of the few decks in the format right now that's draw the good card or you lose I really struggle to see much more going on with it than that um, and I think we saw a little bit of that in the previous series right where Rekvan just could not yeah. find a gatekeeper to save his life um, I'm willing to be proven wrong it's not a deck that I've put hundreds of games into just really a, a, a cursory visit on the uh, on the shuffle rogue so we'll wait if Rekvan can show us some magic because if anyone can Rekvan can <laughs> sounds good yeah it's true. No, Rekvan can, definitely. Uh, there's plenty of draw in that deck to find the good card, but oh, you yeah. have to find it so quickly, that's the thing. Um, like Demon Hunter, if it doesn't find the good card, still sort of just hits you for 10 on turn 4 if you're not careful or something. Yeah, I think, um, exactly. If Demon Hunter hasn't found the, the curve into weapon, they've probably played a 1-drop, a spirit, and then they can follow up with something, you know, and they're just pushing damage every turn, just getting the job done, and then maybe they can just burning heart you to death or something. Like, Rogue does not have a plan B. They have to have one of those cycle turns more often than not to be able to do something effective. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. I mean, we should see more of Vekvan. We've got three games going. If he's going to lose, then he probably loses with Rogue three times. So we're going to get these three more chances to let it redeem itself. And he did win the first match of the day, of course, which we didn't see. So it's obviously got through at least one of those. Um, I, know, I know he's been a fan of the deck on and off for a while. It's hard to know because I wasn't sure if he was memeing or not and then he brings it to the tournament, right? He says he likes a deck and then, you know, 50% of the time with Vekvam, he's just saying things to say oh. and the other 50% of the time he means them. Means yeah, yeah. Go, go to any chat of any streamer anywhere and Vam will be in that chat posting a code and saying, play this, this is the nuts. And like 90% <laughs> of the time, they're the worst decks you've ever seen in your life. But that 10%, that's what you've really got to look out for because he will find the deck, you know? There's, there's some there's some 
thing about throwing a certain substance at a wall until something sticks. You know, I don't know if you've heard this before, but that does very much seem to be Rekbam's approach to deck building. And you need people like that, right? You need you need your Jambres, you need your No Hands Gamers, people that will just not treat anything as an instantly bad idea. Like, no, I'm going to put this card in my deck and I'm going to play 20 games of it and we're going to see if it works. You know, like, you need those people because... While a lot of the time they will just take a good deck and make it worse, sometimes they take a good deck and make it the best deck, and that's how you end up with uh, a lot of these meta yeah. terrors that we've seen recently. Absolutely, I do that, but I can't hit the wall. I just, <laughs> just <doesn't, laughs> yeah. nothing sticks to it. Doesn't, doesn't get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you we just try. release at the wrong angle, and it just all blows <laughs> up in your face immediately. Yeah, it's unfortunate. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I think in these days as well, something we've seen is is decks get refined a lot more slowly. There's a lot more players willing to just copy what they believe is the best deck, uh, which is fine. By the way, if you if you want to do well in the computer game, and if somebody has made a good card, you know, deck for you to win with the computer game, play the good deck and win computer game. But we are seeing because of that, um, decks do get refined more slowly. I think that Death Knight in particular has evolved incredibly slowly into the deck it is now. People with Corpse Bride originally tried to hit you with it, and suddenly realised we don't need to hit our opponents. We just need to not die. Um, and I think we've been through three or four iterations of that deck over three or four weeks. Uh, whereas in the past, maybe that would have happened over two weeks. So there is definitely room to innovate at the moment, I think. First off, you know you can't say computer game that many times without making me laugh at the fact that you're literally 75 years old. Neil, earlier, were, no, yesterday, was annoyed at the fact that app was now a thing people use to describe things that you use on a PC and not just on your phone. It genuinely livid about it. It was, it was fascinating. How am I meant to know if I'm on my PC or my phone if you're going to call it the same thing? <laughs> How do I know where I am? I, I might get lost. Well, right, we've got some action to save me. The computer game has broken out on the screen. Oh, there's so much computer game happening. Look at it. <laughs> and it is one of the um, sort of more interesting games of this match uh, it's, it's basically a 50-50 in my mind this one uh, I'd take the Shaman I think more often than not um, just the there's not too many boards that you generally need to have to deal with and um, Pop-Up Book is just such a wonderful stalling technique in mm. uh, a lot of positions in this game so I, I do like the Shaman end for, for this personally. The Shaman another deck that took a little while to find its presumed final form we've gone through fizzles we've gone through shutter blocks we oh even even that we... there's still like two or three lists in this tournament <coughs> still right i'm not sure we're we're necessarily solved on it yet yeah we're arguing about how many jives to play in the deck i think is the current sort of territorial battle depending oh, where no, you want to go with the deck there's two main builds spell damage build that plays no jives with like spirit claws and kobold gypsy yeah. mancer and stuff so and neither feel like they're necessarily perfect. Yeah, I think there's still maybe one or two cards that can be uh, can be messed around with for sure. Um, particularly uh, for for tournament lists when you're expecting you know six to eight speaker stompers in your opponent's lists, as we've been talking about. Um, I think the jive list maybe does a lot little better against that kind of stuff because you don't necessarily have to win on the turn where you flash. You have a you have a plan B after that sometimes with the jazz base and so on. I was talking about this a little bit earlier. I think we're in a position more than I can remember, which is probably about a week, um, in Hearthstone, where tech cards really work now. Like you can't load your deck full of them, but Things like Speaker Stomper, and there's there's many examples, Dirty Rat Court side of account, kind of accounts, can be used in your deck without too much detriment as long as you don't go nutty with them. And they make a massive difference on outcomes and matchup percentages. Yeah, I don't know how much of that is like a tournament versus ladder difference. Like I don't think I'd necessarily advocate for like double mm. speaker stomper on ladder lists a lot of the time. I think people are playing too many glacial shards on ladder even, honestly. It's like yeah. such a bad card in the matchups where it's bad. But we've seen it in tournament for quite some time, right? Like we've seen what the the 16 weapon destruction lists winning tournaments, you know? We've we've seen that happen down the line. <laughs> um so it's 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 a tale of as old as time really is if you can kind of guarantee 
that your opponent is bringing a certain deck, then tech cards kind of become more powerful just by nature of, of what they are, right? Like, if you if, yeah. if you know you're facing the matchup where the tech card is good, it's not a tech card anymore, it's just the optimal card, you know? But now that um, with tradable or cards just have decent stats or they're just kind of good, or, sorry, not kind of good, but they're just not terrible if you draw them and they don't do their techiness, I think stats have gone up on tech cards, I think. I think it's interesting, but yeah, you're probably right. I'm probably just imagining it. It's been known. Meanwhile, the game that is on the screen... Rekvam seems to be in a decent spot. Okay, he's facing down a 6-5, and he'll be facing down another one next turn. Doesn't have a crash in hand currently, which is slightly annoying. Like, I think the... If you take the distribution of the games that Shamans win, it's around this point, turn 5, turn 6, that the Shaman probably plays some sort of turn that does an amount of damage and involves playing at least one Crash of Thunder to, to clear the opponent's right. board. Whether that's a lethal turn or whether that's just to clear your opponent's board and buy some turn turn, um, it's usually the kind of thing that you want to see happen. It's that or uh, Titan AoE normally that you want to be seeing around turn 6. Um, just because of the way that Demon Hunter builds board, it's around that time where you kind of have to release the pressure or you're going to end up taking way too much damage way too quickly. I'm going to be interested to see how much he gets rid of here because secrets in hand next turn. Now, I know you'll argue that... Whoa. Never mind. That secrets aren't that good, but if you hit a counter spell, they can be pretty damaging. Yeah, oh no, I'll have to throw away my zero mana snake oil to deal with uh -huh. the entire turn. Sounds terrifying. Look, they might end up with a 6-6 six, six rat, okay? If you do too much. They might end up with two 6-6 six, six rats, how about that? That's happened. <laughs> not sold yet, are you? No. No, I'm not. Uh, if, if you're not getting the vibe here, uh, Neil thinks Observer of Mysteries is a decent pick. I think it's like absolutely unplayable in most situations. Off the three, just to be clear, right? On the one, you do agree. No, 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 no. Not at all. Okay, cool. Oh, we no. can fight then. It, because it doesn't cost one. It costs the the amount that you've paid for the initial window shopper uh -huh. plus the one that you've played for the second window shopper plus the one that you then play for the eventual minion. So for that to be worthwhile, you have to hit two good secrets, which you don't. Ever. Okay. It's just an unplayable card. People will uh -huh. realise. They will. Uh -huh. They'll uh -huh. get on my level eventually. Fell Screamer. There you go. It's the card that people need to realise. Anyway, is this lethal? This looks very lethal. <laughs> It looks extremely is there damage in lightning reflexes, which there appears to be. Only one so far. So we can go digging for some spell damage now, maybe. Yeah. Doesn't find any. Right. So that is 2, 4, 7, 10 remaining, needing 12 more. Can't be found from two spells off the lightning reflexes. And this is the tough part of the deck, right? It is, yeah. If you can find one more copy of Crash, I think you're very, very happy with your turn regardless. Just going to take the full heal. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Okay. So, yeah, full heal, did a load of damage, still has a handful of cards. That's the good way to bail out, the way that good players do. <coughs> And Gamer played a vanilla 3-mana 6-5 as their quest reward, <coughs> essentially, from uh -huh. last time. Yes, because yeah. it didn't, none of the secrets actually went off. Which happens. Which sometimes. is what always happens, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ah, you're so negative, honestly. If, look, if you perceive accuracy as negativity, there's not a lot I can do about that, is there? No. You should, you should try harder. Okay. Rickfam is very overloaded. Yeah, it was such an awkward turn. When no spell damage was found, 
it did become a little bit tricky. Um, I don't know how much of the turn got impacted as by the fact that uh, conductivity with certain spells eats so much of your time on yeah. uh, animations as well. Um, particularly because the altered chord that was used was the first card of a lightning reflexes. So you were locked out of doing anything else, right? You cast Conductivity, then you cast Altered Chord. Then the game goes, okay, we have to show you your second Lightning Reflexes card now because you just used the first one. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So you have to sit there and wait for that entire animation to resolve before you're allowed to do anything else, which uh, chopped into Wreckband's time quite significantly. Did still have the uh, the headspace at the end to not spend that last one mana, which would have um, theoretically propped a hidden meaning from the temporary secrets. So... It does seem like Rekvam at least kept his head on his shoulders and, and executed a turn. I do wonder how much of that led to Shudder Block being cut on Ladder. It's like, you just couldn't play the three um, snapshots even if you wanted to. <laughs> like, everyone was like, oh, I could, do, I could have done 80 damage, but I only did 47 and ran out of time. I wonder yeah, if you yeah. just thought, well, if this is the only one thing that the Shudder Block really does, is generate a load of snapshots that I can't play, then it really... It was borderline before that anyway. Let's just get rid of it if we actually physically can't play all the cards. Do you remember the uh, the topsy turvy simulator that someone bought so that pe someone uh, built so that people could practice the uh, the APM kills with the the ball yes. and the really really yeah. old combo pre stack? That was fun. Yeah. So okay. someone should do that just with you know 100 health Yala from the the first series of the day, and then you have to kill them with a triple photo shutter block nature shaman hand. That'd be so much fun. Because you can do it. The, the triple photos, just there's a lot of damage in there, obviously. Yeah. Meanwhile, what do you think of the sharpshooter build of um, Demon Hunter? It seems a bit clunky to me, even though this particular game is going to show off why it's good. Uh, yeah, I think it's a really smart development, honestly. I think I, I, I do think you will sympathize with the idea of wanting a plan B in the shopper deck, right? Where if your shoppers mm -hmm. don't just land and win the game, then what on earth do you do? Um, and I think all in all, this has been the smartest variation of that that I've yeah. seen um, in terms of not playing cards that, you know, make you lose self-respect when you look at yourself in the mirror <laughs> as a person that puts that card in your deck. Ah, never lose self-respect. Just, just go for it. There we go. That is the lethal, though. Mm -hmm. um, chunky amounts of damage there for seven mana. And Rekvam, you know, ruining his loss there because he was in a good position. Uh, looked like he would either get lethal or at least get into a dominating position, and just really whiffed. Not so much on the reflexes, but on the on the card draws themselves. And um, that's where the debate about lists comes into play, right? Because then, if you start to look at the spirit clause list instead. You play out that same game, you'd be expecting to have a Kobold Geomancer or a Blood Mage Thanos in your hand by that point, right? Because you're playing the extra spell damage minions on top of the Zappers. Um, so that's one of the sacrifices that you do make. Um, but people have somewhat gravitated away from that kind of build since the deck had to make some adaptations from the, the gift being nerfed, the removal of the Lightning Bolt from the gift. Uh, but Red yes. Bam, yeah, on that, that crucial turn, just did not find the damage needed, had so many spells in hand, but just had no way to get them to do more than, than zero, two, or three at a time, depending on what those spells were. Uh, and then just fell behind, even though got a very effective turn, healed back to full with the triple altered cord. Um, at that point, Titan came down, Titan was unkillable, and then from there, it was easy, what, 20, 20 plus damage, I think, from that yes, sharpshooter yeah, well uh, turn, even with the sharpshooter costing four. Uh, it goes to show how much damage you can output. If you play Momentums on a Sharpshooter turn, your opponent just kind of dies. It doesn't really matter how much that Sharpshooter costs or how much health they have. Like That damage adds up so, so very fast. Well, yeah, the Shaman's doing four damage for zero with their spell damage and their lightning bolt. You're doing four damage for zero with your Demon Hunter that's already hit them for a load. So, yes, I agree, strangely enough. Six damage even, because the sharpshooter is going to shoot him in the face as well when you play it, as long as you do things in the right order. But yeah, the Demon Hunter gets out. Um, just looking at the build, the Warrior has been banned away from Wreckbam, and it is a Demon Hunter ban from Gamer. So we are going to see, I guess, the the question decks coming into this one. Um, I think some people would view Pain Warlock, uh, Custom Warlock, whatever you want to call it, as a question mark deck. I think both of us are pretty big believers in the deck. Um, and then the Shuffle Rogue, the Miracle Rogue, the uh, the Giants Rogue on the other side from uh, Wreckbam. That's three names for the one deck. I didn't just 
name his whole lineup. <laughs> and he's, he's, a, he's accidentally brought three rogue decks to the tournament. Um, and they're all I the same that... deck anyway. Like, Zilliac's Rogue is a different deck, but it's the same deck. <laughs> you have to just draw your one good card and you're good. It's what? Fine. No, okay. In what I'm presuming you're referring to is, is Mech Rogue. Like, you can also do the thing where you just curve out Mech, 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 and then they die, right? It's just, yes, the stealth Zilliac's doubling is probably the most effective way to do it. Um, I love that, like, that, you know, when Mech Rogue was a thing initially, and it was a, quite a complained about thing, right? How easily they had access to stealth. We're like, oh, they just give their minion stealth every turn. I can't interact with it, and then yeah. eventually I die. I love that just, okay, yeah, well, you haven't had to deal with that for a while. Now here's literally one minion that you can <laughs> just play, and it just doubles its own power every turn while having stealth. I, okay, I think people might have an issue with that if it ends up being really powerful. But thankfully, it's not. It kind of sucks. So we're okay. So I want a prediction from you, because that's kind of my job, is to ask you for predictions, because that's how this pairing works. How many turns will this game go? How many turns will this game go? Yeah. Uh, I will say... Hold on, let me just check some lists real quick. No one's playing Speaker Stompers in their Shaman, right? No. Well, people are, but not these two players is what I mean. I'm going to go for a player gets lethal on their 7. Okay, I'm going to go for 12. Wow! Okay. See what happens. <clears throat> Only because every time I've seen this matchup, and it's I haven't seen it that many times, even though I've been playing the Shaman deck, it just seems to turn into this little dance where you both can't quite kill the opponent and you have to kill all their minions and you run out of stuff. Because you don't really I think... want to take eight points of damage from minions or something like that. So, so having said that, Rekvam did Im immediately turn down a trade and go face, which I'm fully on board with, by the way. We'll see if Gamer RPG decides to do the same thing. Because to trade at this point would be to admit that you are the lesser person. Yeah, that's it. I mean, or Gamer RPG. Gamer <laughs> RVG's just conceded dominance at this point to Rekvam, as far as uh -huh. I'm concerned. Um, what I will say is Nature Shaman mirrors back when Bioluminescence was in the game. I do agree you had to respect their stuff a lot more often. I find more often than not in this matchup, you do actually just want to go face a lot, particularly because Pop-Up Bok... Uh, Pop-Up Bok? Pop-Up Book mm -hmm. exists when it didn't before which allows you to put situations like this in play, right? Where you can just say, I don't really care about your minions because that my yes. minions are protected behind taunts. So I'm just going to slam you in the face repeatedly. And swarmers were an issue before. Obviously, that was one of the reasons they would go long. It's like, you've got to respect that because double swarmer turns out to be a lot of damage if you're not careful. Um, so they were a the thing with the Bioluminescence version, which made them more minions. Obviously, Feral Spirit was in there. So all those things could add up to... You know, an eight attack board, and I agree that this is less, but I have seen this go sort of long far more often than you'd expect, is what I want yeah. to say, I guess. I believe you. Uh, help me out here, what's a swarmer? Piranha. Oh, piranhas, right. You know, I, I think you're right, they are called piranha swarmers. Yeah, yeah. I've just never Efficient heard anyone piranhas. Call swarmers before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was talking earlier on. Uh, but I completely deleted the fact that Octobot was called Efficient Octobot from my brain entirely. Like, I absolutely would not have got that right given 300 attempts. But no, apparently that was a thing. No one knows that. No, no Everyone in chat that. will be like, yeah, yeah, obviously it's called Efficient Octobot. They're oh, all yeah, lying. Chat knows. Don't believe them. No, 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 don't believe them. They're lying. Mm -hmm. Sure. Chat always knows. Mm-hmm. As long as they're active, though, I don't, I don't care. That's the most important <laughs> don't, don't activate the chat. <laughs> Meanwhile, Vecvan once again just putting every point of damage he can to the face. Um, also has overloaded this turn so that he'll be okay to play the Titan on six and muddle around on five. Although muddling around on five might just involve playing a flash Ooh, with this hand. baby. Just looking at Vecbam's flash on five, actually, with his hand, it really does look good. The, the little bits of chip damage that he's done have really raised his lethal chances on turn six. Oh! Wow! <laughs> Gamer's double flash and hit a second spell oh. damage minion? Okay. He sat forward in whatever it is he's sitting on.
real wood, I think, that chair. It's one, two, so it's five, ten, twelve, plus lightning reflexes currently, plus a draw, plus an ancestral knowledge. Yes, as long as every other card that's played costs zero, you can get all that in. He needs it, because Vectram has hit the, um, the zapper. I think you go face here. I think you're, if your opponent is double flashing, they have at least one spell damage in hand. So giving them the snake <laughs> oil just kind of works as extra damage anyway. I guess they have the option of trading into your 3-4, right. but I'm not... My point being, I'm not scared of the 2-2 two, two snake going face, right? I think that is probably going to be less damage than the snake oil being in their hand. Okay, sure. I think I think that giving them... Yeah, 28 and 30 are quite a long way apart when it comes to... But unless You're they can go the face the with the 2-2 two, two, and then shoot their own 2-2 two, two with a spell that's free that couldn't go face. Sure. Okay. And then shoot the snake oil at your face, they're getting that damage back anyway, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah, and Vectam, who has almost certainly got lethal next turn, not happy because it looks like he's getting lethaled here. Yeah, snake oil, snake oil is... Four. Four. Overdraft is some. Oh, there you go. Makes it easy. Yep. 2-0 for Gamer RVG in the final match of the group. The winner will go on to Sunday for the, fight for the top eight. The loser will have to go through ladder once again to get back here in the summer. Still did need a couple of outs there. Um, hit lightning bolt off the first discover from the uh, from the lightning reflexes, and then hit more damage from the flow rider, which isn't like you're kind of entitled to hit damage when you play flow rider in, in that deck. It's kind of how it's built. Um, but the the lightning bolt being the first port of call off the lightning reflexes was very very handy indeed. Um, but I think Gamer RVG really just had to do some some solid maths there on turn four, trying to work out. You saw one flash of lightning, assessed the hand, and then went, okay, I'm going to sit here and count for the next 65 seconds, which is what he yep. did, and then settled on uh, the, the coin second flash. That coin second flash hit another spell damage minion, which I think was just straight up the, pos the best possible outcome, specifically the Zapper at that. The Zapper is so much better than the other spell damage minions, primarily because it costs one, but then also because if you're casting Overdraft on that turn, it's also adding damage to the Overdraft by being an Overload card itself. So uh, the, the result of the second flash was as good as it could get, but you can argue that Gamer RVG earned that by sitting and calculating everything so carefully before doing the coin second flash on that turn. Yep, absolutely. Um, and that's one of those situations as well where even a good player might make that decision because you know, they, they understand the strategy as well, but the execution was actually... With the ticking clock, we've seen it many times. You make discover mistakes, you make choices with your flow rider can go wrong. Not, not when you see the lightning bolting you in the game, even I can get that right, but the choice to play the flow rider can be the wrong choice, etc, etc. And yeah, he managed to execute it all within the time as well. And that's where I keep on about it, but the top players just do that so well. And it's really hard to get across sometimes because they do it well. You only know if we, if we had a tournament between all the people ranked 500 to 1000, you would see people doing it badly and then you'd see why these players are so good. Wow, so much shade at rank 500 legend players now. I pick on my own level spine. <laughs> <laughs> What's it called? Yeah, because, you know, there's there's a lot of talk in, like, you know, social issues and general discourse about punching up and punching down and why understanding the difference in that is important. Is it just punching when you're doing it punching to Punching yourself, I don't know. Yeah, yes. yeah, I'm not, not quite sure how this works. But anyway, uh, one thing that... Once, one person who will be punching themselves is Gamer RVG because he's about to play some Pain Warlock, uh, which is going to want to do that as rapidly as possible. It is such a weird deck to commentate on to watch if you're not familiar with it if you haven't played it a bunch you know i had a series earlier on where we were commentating it's like, oh you know they're doing well they played a couple of minions they're curving out and i'm like no they're doing terribly because they're still at 25 they've only done five damage to themselves so yeah. far this game which means they've got like six dead cards in their deck that they draw and just do absolutely nothing because if you haven't done the damage to yourself early with the deck, your Molten Giants are dead, your Imprisoned Horrors are dead, but also, weirdly, 
cards like Blood Triant then become dead. Do you know what I mean? Because yep. because it's you rubbish, don't have yeah. because you don't have the payoff cards yet at that point. You then draw a Blood Triant and I'm like, okay, well this takes me from twenty five to twenty, which just isn't relevant. But then yep. my opponent is going to hit me for twelve, and then suddenly it is relevant in the way they want it to be. Like it's such a weird deck to comprehend how you're supposed to develop boards and play with your health total, but. When you get a handle on it, I do believe it is so, so powerful in this current meta game. I agree. And it's weird because I played the, the Imprisoned Horror package for a long time in, in Sludge. Yeah. I thought, and when I saw this, I'm like, well, just, you're never getting a Molten Giant down. You, you don't, you just, it's not happening. <laughs> just Turn play, four. Just, just, <laughs> just play Barrels of Sludge instead. It's fine, right? My build has to be better. Then I played this for like, I don't know, two hours. I was like, okay. This is yeah, just yeah. really good. I don't. I can't quite explain why it's really good. I don't know why the giants work so well. The part. Um, so I was talking. I was talking to TJ about this earlier. The part that gets me. I'm fully on board with like you know making huge sacrifices to make huge boards. I think that's cool. I think that is historically been very powerful in Hearthstone. The part that weirds me out is that there's no defense mechanism to pay yeah, off yeah. your huge minions. It's not like you go Molten Giant, Molten Giant, Defender of Argus like you used to in Handlock. You just play the minions, and for some reason, decks can't kill you, even though you've taken yourself down to like 12 HP or 10 yeah. HP to be able to do that. It's very strange. But somehow so it does still work. There's an element to the, the deck that we haven't talked about much, and it's a card that is in a lot of decks, and I haven't heard anyone calling for it to be nerfed, anyone calling it a problem. I'm going to throw it out there. Projectionist. Mm -hmm. It's just really, really good and enabling a lot of stuff right now in a lot of decks. It is very, very powerful. But it's a very um, Shadow Step adjacent card, right? Where when you play against it, you notice all the times where it's allowed mm. them to play t two, uh, two Thirsty Drifters or two Molten Giants <coughs> or two Zero Mana Ziliaxes or whatever broken thing it's ended up doing. All the games where it's sat in their hand doing absolutely right. nothing yeah. because it's a Bloodfen Raptor, you don't see those turns, right? You, so you just assume every time Projectionist comes out, you lose because that kind of is the reality. But much like some of these rogue cards we'll be seeing hanging around in Rekbam's hand, if it's not the right scenario for them, they're super, super dead. But continuing with what I agree is a Shadow Step adjacent card. It's a neutral Shadow Step adjacent card. Like, Rogue's supposed to be able to do Shadow Steppy things. It's balanced around that. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're giving Priest and Warlock the chance to kind of Shadow Step things, because <laughs> it's better than um, a Brewmaster or something where it's just way too slow and you wish you'd never tried it. Oh, it's like, much better than Brewmaster in most scenarios. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, projectionist into, I have two zero mana eight eights. In multiple decks across the board now. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that's a card to keep an eye on, honestly. It's certainly the enabler in this deck. Um, it's because you get your zero mana horror twice, you get your zero mana giant twice. It just pushes the number of zero mana things from, from four to six, which is a lot. Meanwhile, looks yeah. like Gamer RVG just got freaking customized. Yeah. Customizing Vecvam as we speak. I drew projectionist though, that's gotta win the game, right? <coughs> yep. Excuse me. No, I drew it again! See? It's great. No! Oh, God. So Why many. does this always happen to me with Sotl? Why? <laughs> <laughs> it's not okay, fair. rush, rush, oh, rush. Oh, oh, they're green. They move. Neil, you can move those cards. That's powerful. Uh -huh. There's a breakdance in hand as well. Yep. Oh. I'm actually seeing enough movement. Next turn, how many 8-8s can we play with these projectionists we have in our hand? It's amazing. <laughs> Currently, zero. <laughs> I'm checking. I'm checking VAR on the number of 8-8s. <laughs> Check complete, zero. Uh, that's not the projectionist's fault, though. Ah. <laughs> uh. That's the Giants' fault. Talking of movement, Rekvam, are you there? Hello? Oh no. Gonna take the five with the face? Oh. No, okay. And actually not gonna break dance, I would imagine then? Just decide there's no point? Yep, okay, fine. Well, 
Gamer can end the game right now if he wants to. <laughs> True! And that is a problem with this deck. This is, um... Obviously, it's one of those things where when you first play it, you think, obviously this is going to happen. Then you play it a while and you think this will never happen. It's just an idiot thought. But sometimes you just can't play the cards in your hand because they will yep. hurt you too much. It is yep. actually a real thing. 100%, yeah. And th this exact spot is where you really need good Hearthstone knowledge of exactly what your opponent could do. Like, how much damage can you take here? You would love to play at least two of these cards. You can't play both spirit bombs, that's a good start. You do get hero powered. Yeah, which is really sad, because playing two spirit bombs is really what I'd like to do right now. <laughs> Hardly he wants to hero power and see if we can get a better card. Oh, we're setting up lethal. That's fair enough. Yeah, incredibly loosely, but it is technically there. It's just a little sad, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, here it we does go. Does not ask for much. Wait, what? What does this do? Nothing. 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 And it's a projectionist at the end, obviously. Game of RVG goes through to Sunday with a 3-0 win. And that looked convincing to me. Obviously, he had kind of a good draw there, but the Shaman game, the Shaman Mirror in particular, very, very good. And yeah, he's earned his spot in the top eight. Yeah, and see what it means to him as well, Game of RVG. Uh, normally, a pretty pretty low-key guy emotionally. Uh, nice, chill uh, chill stream if you're in the, the market for that kind of thing as well. Go check out his stream. I think it's a very uh, comfy stream, as the kids say these days. Yeah. Um, but you see the uh, the moments, these big moments in these big events can bring out the uh, the joy and jubilation in everyone. But from Rec Bam, you see that just wasn't his series, right? Like, you know, we can sit here and talk about this deck as a bring... We can uh, talk about the Shaman Mirror, we can talk about various things, but sometimes you just queue up a game of Hearthstone, you queue up a series of Hearthstone, and uh, it just wasn't just wasn't your day, right? Card games can just be like that sometimes, and I'm not sure uh, not sure Rec Vam had an awful lot going on that he could have done in, uh, in this particular series. Yeah, the, the wave goodbye there at the end, as he uh, bricks on a Gaslight Gatekeeper one final time. So, two things about Gamer RBG. First of all... Um it's, it's one thing, actually, but it's just going to be an extended one thing. He has been in more Masters Tours, I believe, than any other player ever. Wow. Because I think he only missed one of the original Masters Tours. Okay. And now he played all three last year, which most and people this, didn't one, do yeah. anymore. Like, people like Fury Hunter, people like Gabby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alutimo sort of dropped out the system to some degree. So Gamers played all three of those, plus this. So I believe he's now played more than anybody. And also a reminder that he came second in Grandmasters one time, so he has one match from Worlds. So when you're talking in terms of him celebrating why it means a lot to him, this is sort of a chance to get as close. He hasn't been to Worlds. He, he, he sort of should be at some point with all that behind him. He was in America's Grandmasters, though, let's, let's be clear. I mean, it's a free slot he didn't take. <laughs> Which way do you want to look at this? <laughs> That's a good point. No, but you know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't resist. Obviously, uh, Lorinda is a is a flag waving American, as we all know. So you have to take him down a peg or two every now and again. But yeah, I, I fully agree. I think Gamer RBG has been put in the work uh, quite some time. It's easy when you've got um, a high quality practice partner like Fled, just a bunk bed away, right? It's very easy to improve when you have that level of partner available. Um, but he's certainly put in the work. I think he, he liaises with a lot of other very, very strong players as well um, across multiple regions. Um, I think himself and, and Recfam have, have you know, shared, prepped, talked about, exchanged ideas about Hearthstone on various occasions as well, which will make that a very bittersweet result for him, I'm sure. But I think first and foremost, he will be over the moon that he is one step closer to uh, realizing the dream of going to the World Championships here. But there are several very, very strong players waiting and a whole bunch more ready to queue up tomorrow. And I think just based on uh, that outcome of Group B, 
Obviously, we can uh, look at Piadnica and uh, and Wiki that we saw already, but Molestar kind of impressed me. I called him out at the start of the day. I said, this yeah. lineup is a bit weird, but I think it's doing okay into this field. We're hearing some rumblings around that Molestar is a player that we might not have seen, but he's an absolute control god and he can make some stuff happening. He was playing some seriously Yala pilled Hearthstone today, which is about the greatest compliment I can give to a control player. Um, unflappable, uh, super, super greedy, but in a way that continues to make sense. Um, absolute focus, even in like 95% one games, making sure that you find that 100% line when you're in those positions. Everything that you need to do to play that style of deck and play it well, he is doing. So I really, really do think Molstar is, uh, is one to keep an eye on. Yeah, I don't know if you heard it earlier or if you uh, had to step away because you just finished casting, but um, I, I share your opinion. I've obviously seen the same things you've seen. Um, apparently when he was captain at UCLA in the collegiate stuff, yep. um, they always banned his warrior. They, right, just right, banned right. His yeah, yeah, yeah. they didn't yeah. care what the meta was. Most of us on Warrior, we're banning it. He's, uh, he, he, he's, he's laughing for later. Control Warrior, right? Is is pretty much the, the rumblings that I've had. They're just... Yeah. Um, even in situation... Like, you know where... So we've been through about a year's period now where Warrior's been really, really strong consistently. But there was about a year and a half before that where every patch Warrior cards were getting buffed and Control Warrior was still unplayable, right? Um, and I believe throughout that period... Uh, Mozart was still just grinding Control Warrior on ladder and getting incredibly high finishes where literally like no one else in like the top 200 was even touching yeah. Control Warrior um, which is very you know Freeze Mage genius adjacent from for, from way back in the day it gives me that same kind of vibe so yeah really really looking forward to what he can do going forward yeah and we will get to see him a lot more um, but we do have some other players entering the fray tomorrow, which I'm looking forward to. I think we'll be able to show you those shortly. Um, but perhaps we can't. We'll have to wait a moment. <laughs> uh, we do. We, we have plenty more to go. Pick I mean, one of those, Sotl. <laughs> I, I know, like, I just want to talk about the power of this field in general, right? Because hyping up tomorrow a couple of times, I've just kind of thrown out the names Fury Hunter, Habu Gabu, Bunny Hopper, right? Those are the yeah. three that I've been saying, you know, put those names up in lights. If you're a fan of other of those players, you're going to want to come back tomorrow and check these out, right? That's not even mentioning the likes of Insane, Dimitri Kazov, who is a former America's Grandmaster, Hemlock as well. Like, this field is so absurdly stacked. I think you've got four to five players in this tournament who at some point in time have been the consensus best player in the world. Yes. That like that's... recent time as well. Yeah. Yeah, like within the last like four years. Like that's yeah. that's outrageous. That's an outrageous field of Hearthstone players to have. Um, and just enough of your mole stars and your kimchi slaps and your tobikas, right, that we can learn about on the way, which is something that we're really, really interested in doing as well. So I think it is a really, really strong field for entertainment purposes, for high quality Hearthstone purposes, for, you know, interesting lineups and different matchup interactions. Like, I'm so excited to watch this tournament develop. Yeah, like Habu, I can't remember the stats that were the records, but he was just setting record tournament after tournament for a while. Then he had a 1-3 and three that meant something, and then everything else was 7-1, 8-1. Oh, he needs to go... Did he miss a Masters Tour and still get enough points to qualify that season or something? Like, he just didn't turn up, and then he had to go 8-1 and one and did it. Something like that. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think he turned, He just missed a tournament or went 1-3 and because he had work or school or something, and it just put him in a position where he had to go 8-1, and one, so he just turned up and did it. Fury Hunter... Somehow wasn't the world champion two years ago. Um, he just <laughs> won two Masters Tour, uh, missed multiple different levels of qualification by a total like a small amount. Took last year off with real life. Uh, has come back this year to finish the story maybe. And yeah, Bunny Hopper, former world champion, only one world champion since him. And again, there's there's that other lineup players behind them with insane in particular somebody who's streaming regularly and getting better and better i think yep but uh sounds like we are going to be blessed with the presence of a certain gamer rvg who is here to give us a word or two about their victory over Recbam. gamer how how you doing um we saw your we saw your pop off at the end so we obviously know it felt good but just talk us through those last final moments what was going through your head yeah it just feels great to uh get a win because the last couple MTs last year didn't really pan out the way I wanted to so uh, 
happy to uh, be back in the top eight. So just uh, excited, excited to uh, see what I can do in the top eight. So uh, I want to talk to so you. Oh, go ahead. Are you go ahead, happy no, with the lineup you've got? Do you think you've got the lineup to go all the way with this? You've got to test it out today. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with the lineup. I uh, when I ended up submitting it, I was content with what I brought, and uh, uh, I think they're they're decks that suit me. So I think I I can pile with them really well, and I I think I did that today. So if I continue that in the top eight, I think uh, this this lineup can do it. Sticking with lineups just for a second, I've heard a rumor that you were on Priest initially when you submitted, and that was changed to Warlock. Is that is that true? And if so, like, can you talk about what made that decision? Yeah, that that actually is true. I changed with uh, like 20, 30 minutes ago, and I mm. just decided to change to Warlock because I think it fits a bit better with like I think Priest is a very good deck, but it, for my specific lineup. It fit better with my my band strategy and uh, what I'm trying to beat, so that's why I decided to switch. Okay, well, I think um, producer saying we're going to have to let you go now, but thank you so much and good luck to our oh, Sunday. You get a day to watch everybody else uh, tomorrow, so good luck with that on Sunday. Good to see you on the final day as well. Uh, long may it continue. But yeah, we have to say goodbye. So, back to Sotol. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, it's interesting stuff for sure. Um, it's always great to hear from the players. You, they can uh, they can wrap things up in their own words. We can only speculate. They can uh, they can actually talk with authority on why they did mm -hmm. things and what they were thinking, which is why it's always good to dip in when we can. Um, but yeah, great great to hear from him. And I think uh, think a very very strong performance. Like Neil was saying. Sunday we'll see Gamer RBG enter the fray, but we've just been talking about some of the players that we are we're going to be seeing tomorrow. Um, honestly, like if, if some of you are turning up now and going, what on earth is happening? Why why is there a Masters Tour on on Friday? You've just got a whole bonus day of Hearthstone if you were watching Friday. And now if you want to tune in tomorrow and just imagine that a tournament's starting with the likes of Fury Hunter and Bunny Hopper and Habu Gabu and Insane and Dimitri Karzov just kicking off from scratch, you're still going to get a full st serving of Masters Tour Hearthstone and then we can jump back into the finals on Sunday. So make sure you are here. There we go. Just to confirm that one more time. Day one, well, you're too late for that, unlucky. Uh, go watch the VODs. And by watching those VODs, you'll probably get yourself just about onto day two, which is tomorrow. <laughs> day three is that top eight single elimination. And two players will go to the World Championships. So we're going to find out who they are. But for me and from Sotl for tonight, I think it is time to say goodbye. Have a good one. See you same time tomorrow.